Romaine Calm, and Isabella Proctor Cozy Paranormal Mystery. Book 3. Written by Lisa Bouchard. Chapter 1. Usually, people train their pets, not the other way around. I pulled the heavy wooden door to the Portsmouth apothecary closed. The doorbells chimed as I locked up my business. I rested my hand on one of the warm glass panes and quickly refreshed the protection wards. Done with my evening ritual, I took a deep breath of late summer air and headed for home because I had a date. Okay, not a date. An appointment. With my cat. My talking black cat. I wasn't a woman whose life revolved around her pet, so let me explain. Jameson, the cat in question, was my familiar, and he was serious about his responsibility to train me. A couple months ago, I took possession of a beautiful emerald amulet when my neighbor was murdered. Jameson came with the amulet, along with some weighty obligations. When I accepted the amulet, I became the newest member of the sorority of Brigid. The sorority was a group of witches who practiced real witchcraft, not the stuff you see on TV. Their goals were to keep witchcraft a secret, protect witches, and prevent witches from abusing their power. To hear Jameson tell it, the sorority should have been all I thought about, and my foolish notions about having to pay my rent or buy food shouldn't concern me. Yeah, well, I really enjoyed having a roof over my head, and when I threatened to toss him outside during a rainstorm, he decided I might have a point after all. At any rate, I was on my way home for more training. He begrudgingly said I was okay with a lot of the larger and simpler spells, so we were working on precision with smaller spells. When I asked about the focus I'd chosen in my last investiture, potions, he laughed. Everything changes once you join the sorority, he said. What changed for you? I asked. I'm not a member. Oh, I said, feeling stupid. Is it a humans-only group? No. Both the sorority and fraternity are for witches and their familiars. But when I was a kitten, they were split along traditional lines. The sorority of Bridget was strictly for women, and the fraternity of free witches only allowed men. Then why aren't you the familiar for someone in the fraternity? Because I'm not evil, he said patiently, as though he were explaining to a small child. The jury was out on that. Some of the spells he had me casting were so difficult, I felt like my brain would explode. I went to my family with my concerns, but they were no help. I wasn't sure any of them ever had a familiar. Aunt Lily said I needed to follow his training. She was certain he knew what was best for me. He was, after all, over 200 years old and had trained at least three other witches before me. Aunt Nadia thought I could get to him through his stomach. You know, the best way to a man's heart. Maybe that applied to cats too. My mother didn't know what I ought to do. She had a more realistic view of my relationship with Jameson because she heard more of my complaints than my aunt's. She'd started coming to visit me once a week at the apothecary. She never brought up the previously sore subject of my moving home, so the visits were relaxing. If I'd known all it took for her to stop haranguing me about moving home was to get a familiar, I'd have gone looking for one a long time ago. She thought I was stuck with Jameson unless I wanted to give up the amulet. I'd considered the idea and dismissed it. I didn't want to miss out on the power it gave me and the ability to help people in addition to my work at the apothecary. I didn't think the amulet liked the idea of being passed on to someone else either. Over the past month, I felt like I was becoming more in tune with Jameson. I strode down the sidewalk on my way home for a quick dinner and night of training. We'd been working on my fine control, so he had me do the most excruciatingly difficult things, like moving one piece of ice in a glass while holding all the others still. Or making only one of the fronds on my palm tree move. He even had me strengthen my personal wards into what felt like a hard shield over me. I understood why witches preferred to train in areas they're naturally good at. 
I was okay with spell work, but the level he had me working at was exhausting. At least I slept well at night. I walked into my apartment. I'm home, I called out. Jameson was waiting for me, sitting on the kitchen countertop. I tried to instill in him the idea that cats don't sit on the food preparation or eating surfaces. He didn't care. Good. I'm hungry, and you've got a lot of training to do tonight. I rolled my eyes. Same thing we do every night, Pinky. He cocked his head, clearly not understanding my 90s cartoon reference. I thought he'd get it, because at least he was alive then. I was a long way from being able to take over the world. And even if I did, what would I do with it? Start by opening the can of salmon cat food without using your hands. I frowned at him. No dinner for me first? Not tonight, you're late, he said. Right. Okay, then. I considered the cans of Purina Pro Plan he preferred. They had a ring pull to open them, but when he said no hands, he meant no hands at all, no holding the can in one hand and using a fork handle to pop the top open. Another thing he insisted on was subtle magic. It was no good trying to keep magic a secret if I was obvious every time I tried to use it. He had a point there, but I wished he had let me start off with big gestures and then move into smaller ones. Big gestures made the magic easier to use, at least for me. I pointed my index finger and flicked it from right to left to open the cat food cabinet. One more gesture had the can floating onto the counter. I considered how to open it without my hands. There were a couple ways I could do it, but which was best? I could force the can to stay on the counter as I levitated a fork and used the handle to open it. I could try the metal shearing spell to cut the top of the can off, or I could try to make the can explode and hope I was fast enough to catch the food and direct it into the bowl. I wasn't feeling up to cleaning off the walls if I didn't catch the exploding cat food, and using a fork didn't seem impressive, so I went for the metal shearing spell. I started the can slowly spinning, then I focused my mind on creating a sharp point just above the inside edge of the can. I lowered the sharp point, and thin curls of metal started peeling away from the lid. It was working! I pushed the point down and felt more resistance. I increased the can's rotation speed, and within two seconds, the top of the can was cut off. At this point, he would let me take the lid off and dump the food into his bowl, but I was so pleased with myself that I decided to show off. I levitated the lid to the recycling, then slowly lowered the can to his empty bowl. I appended it, gave the bottom a sharp magical tap, and smiled as the food fell out into his bowl. Success! The can levitated to the sink to be rinsed, and I was done. I beamed at my cat. Moderately acceptable. Now, what are you going to eat? Moderately acceptable? Are you kidding me? Did you see what I did there? I held the can down and made it spin and used a sharp blade of air, of air, to cut the lid off. I did great. Jameson didn't have many facial expressions, but he was a master of using his tone to get his feelings across. I can only hope your standards will rise as you get better at your spellcasting. For now, I'll say you were well within the bounds of acceptable. I turned my back on him and opened the fridge. My spells usually rated marginally acceptable or I suppose that will work too, so I probably should have taken his words as a compliment. I'd had teachers who believed they shouldn't praise students until they were perfect, and although I didn't thrive that way, I could work with it. My fridge was mostly empty. I worked a lot and ate dinner at Proctor House at least one night a week, where Aunt Nadia forced leftovers on me. She loved me, and this was one of the ways she showed me. Maybe tomorrow night I'd head over and see what they were having. But for tonight, dinner would have to be frozen pizza. Chapter 2 I opened the heavy glass door to the crispy biscuit and scanned the mostly occupied tables, searching for my friend Mina. 
The biscuit was busy, like it was every Saturday morning, and it took a minute for me to look through all the tables I could see from the door. I hadn't seen Mina since she left for college a year before I graduated from high school. I didn't have many friends then, and I hardly had time to make new ones, so I took care to keep the ones I had. Isabella, over here. I heard her call. I turned to her voice and saw her waving her arms to get my attention. She was wearing a fuchsia tank top that contrasted with her long lime green hair. How had I not seen her immediately? Mina had never been a shrinking violet, and as she stood up and met me in the aisle to pull me into a tight hug, I knew nothing had changed. I've missed you so much, she yelled in my ear. I squeezed her back and broke the hug before she had the chance to do lasting damage to my hearing. She grabbed my hand and dragged me to our booth. I sat across from her and stared at her for a moment. She had a worried expression, but it broke when she smiled. You look amazing. Tell me everything. Well, I inherited a business, and it's taking everything I've got to run it. I'm perpetually frazzled. Really? What kind of business? It's an apothecary. I spent about a year as an apprentice before it became mine. I stopped talking as thoughts of finding Trina's murdered body flooded my mind. Mina touched my hand. Hey, are you okay? I looked up at her. Yeah, sorry. It's just that I inherited the apothecary after my mentor was murdered. She frowned. That's horrible. I'm sorry to hear that. Instinctively, my hand went to the amulet I hadn't taken off since I'd gotten it back from Chief Dobbins. Oh, nice necklace, Mina said. I'd gotten tired of explaining the good things that had come to me lately were mine because someone had died, the apothecary, the amulet, and Jameson. It was starting to feel ghoulish. Thanks. It was a gift from a friend. Enough about me. How about you? What was your major again? Mina laughed. Equine therapy. I furrowed my brow. Like being a physical therapist for animals? She straightened the sugar packets in their small container. No, like using horses to help people's mental and physical health. That sounds like you, always helping other people. And fun, if you like nature and being outdoors all the time. Mina had never been big on the outdoors, but people could change. I do. Horses are majestic animals, and they seem to know the patients are vulnerable and act accordingly. She took a sip of water and continued. Unfortunately, there are no facilities hiring in a 500-mile radius. 500? I asked. Yeah. I've sent my resume to each of them, then did follow-up calls when no one got back to me. Wow. You'd think at least one of them would have called back. She gave me a wry smile. Yeah, you'd think. I know Bethany at the Fancy Tart is hiring. Would you be interested in working there? I asked. She was about to answer me when Emma, who was walking past U.S., yelped. Emma was in the process of a slow-motion fall. She tried to regain her balance, overcorrected, and was going to fall into us. Without thinking, I wiggled a finger and made the air behind her solid. She bumped into the air and was able to right herself, spilling only a bit of juice on her tray. She turned around and held her hand out, looking for whatever solid thing she'd bumped into, but I'd already released the spell. That was close, Mina said. What was? Emma, she almost fell with a tray full of drinks. Oh, didn't notice, I lied. What? It's not like she'd believe me if I told her what really happened. Emma delivered her drinks and came to take our order. Mina! It's been so long since I've seen you. How are you? I'm great, thanks. 
From the kitchen, we heard the cook calling Emma's order up. Sorry, I can't chat. Can I take your order? I didn't have to look at the menu. Can I get an omelet with spinach, onion, mushroom, and Swiss, with rye toast and a mug of coffee? Of course. And you, Mina? Waffles with strawberries and whipped cream and a glass of orange juice. As she was writing Mina's order, a young boy bumped into her. Kevin, be careful, his mother said. Kevin looked up at Emma and said, sorry, before he rushed off toward the bathrooms at the back of the restaurant. Emma gave us a quick smile, then dashed to the kitchen to pick up her order. Behind me, I heard the crash of plates falling to the floor. I turned around and saw a man in distress, banging the table. Detective Palmer, who was on the other side of the booth, jumped up and pulled the man to the floor. Palmer frantically patted down the wheezing man's pockets. Within seconds, the man's labored breaths grew softer and stopped. His chest stopped moving up and down too. Palmer scanned the crowd and stopped when he saw me. Isabella, call 911. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911. I'm calling for Detective Steve Palmer. There's a man in respiratory distress and, I looked back over at him, he looks like he's going into anaphylaxis. Does anyone have an EpiPen? Palmer shouted. Emma ran into the kitchen and then fought her way through the crowd of onlookers to bring him the restaurant's emergency auto-injector. Palmer jammed the orange end of the EpiPen onto the now motionless man's leg. We're sending help to your location, the operator said to me. He's not moving now, and I can't see him breathing. With the phone to my ear, I turned to Mina. Go wait outside for the ambulance and make sure they can get in. She nodded and walked off to the door. Palmer was on his knees, doing chest compressions and crying. I'd never seen him display much emotion unless it was anger in an interrogation room and I worried this was someone he cared about. Now that it appeared there may be a dead body on the floor of the restaurant, people were quickly paying and leaving. I swiped some napkins from a nearby table, went to Palmer and sat next to him, my leg touching his so he knew he wasn't alone. I stayed with him, silently, until Mina led the EMTs to us. Palmer never stopped trying to save the man's life. As soon as he saw their uniforms, something snapped back into place in Palmer's mind. He stood up, surrendered the EpiPen, and began to answer questions efficiently. The man on the floor was his cousin, Dan. The paramedic who was taking care of the patient looked to his partner and shook his head. Palmer went pale, and I steadied him. Take it easy there, big guy. I moved him to a seat and gently pressed his shoulder until he sat. Chief Dobbins strode in. He looked at the paramedics, who shook their heads. Thanks, you two can go, he said. He called for a coroner on his radio. I squeezed Palmer's shoulder and said, I'm going to leave you with the chief. I turned to the chief. Please call if I can help. I met Mina back at our table. I sat, exhausted and upset. Did you see what happened? No, I was paying attention to you. I didn't see anything. Our food hadn't arrived, but it didn't matter. I can't eat right now. I might as well go to the apothecary. She stood up. Me either. I paid for breakfast, you can leave the tip. I put a ten on the table, and we walked out. Friends of yours? Mina asked. Was he? Not exactly. The man doing CPR is the detective who caught my mentor's murderer. And then he caught the man who killed two of my other friends. I've never seen him cry, though. The other guy was his cousin. Mina looked worried. Exactly how many people do you know who have been killed? Chapter 3 At lunch, Emma came into the apothecary, looking distraught. Hey, 
What's wrong? I asked. I think I may have killed that man in the restaurant today. I held my arms open, and we hugged. She started crying, and I let her get it all out before I said anything. Why would you say that? We were slammed about an hour before you came in, and I can't remember if I washed down the table or not. Obviously I didn't, and that poor man died from his allergy. I didn't ask either of them if they had food allergies, and so I wasn't as careful as I could have been. One way or the other, it was my fault. I gave her another squeeze and released her. Okay, I get where you're coming from, but I promise you this isn't your fault. How can you say that? It was my table. Had he eaten anything? Not yet. I hadn't even had time to bring the coffee. Do you think you poisoned him with water? She looked a little confused. No, but what if the table had shellfish on it that I hadn't cleaned off? Did he lick the table? Or the bottom of his glass? She thought back. I doubt it. Exactly, this isn't your fault. In fact, you were the one who brought the EpiPen to Palmer. You did everything you could to save him. She wiped her eyes. I did, didn't I? Yes, sweetie, you did. I think you need to go home, have a good nap, and everything will seem better when you wake up. She pulled a tissue from her pocket and blew her nose. You're probably right. If you still feel bad, come back. I'll make you a mug of tea, and we can talk more. Emma gave me a weak smile. Thanks. At closing time, Palmer walked into the apothecary, looking worn out and upset. Hey, are you okay? I asked. He shook his head. Come with me. I led him into the office, and he took a chair gratefully. I sat behind the cherry desk I'd inherited with the business, leaned forward, and looked at him. I've found, during the nearly six months I've owned the apothecary, that sometimes people just wanted to talk. It didn't take any special magic to get them to open up. A little patience and silence would get almost anyone talking about what was bothering them. Talk to me. At first, he didn't say anything. This is where the patience came in. I tried to exude an aura of I have nowhere to go, and you're the most important person to me right now, and it hardly ever took more than a half a minute before people opened up to me. I was having breakfast with my cousin, Dan. I hadn't seen him for ages, and he called me out of the blue, saying we ought to catch up. I nodded. The less I said, the more he would get off his chest. By the looks of him, he needed to get it all out by talking to a friend who wouldn't interrogate him or think he was the natural choice for murder suspect. At first he seemed fine, but then he started sounding a little off, you know? I shook my head. He was saying strange things, talking about someone being after him and that he thought he needed protection. Then he said he needed special protection, because the guys after him could turn invisible. Palmer ran his hand through his hair. I almost laughed at him, thinking it was all a joke. He believed what he was saying, though. I tried to take him seriously. He wasn't the kind of guy to make stuff up. On the other hand, people don't turn invisible and I didn't know what to do, other than tell him to talk to a professional. That sounds like reasonable advice, I said. Unless his cousin was being threatened by witches. No amount of counseling would get him out of that kind of danger. When we were kids, there was no separating us. But as we got older, he didn't want to hang around with his younger cousin anymore. I didn't smoke or drink, so I wasn't fun or cool enough for him. If I'd made even a little more of an effort, if I'd been a halfway decent cousin and called him even once a year, he would have come to me sooner. He might have trusted me more than he did. He did trust you. He came to you for help when he needed it. 
It's not your fault this horrible accident happened. Yes, it is. His death is all my fault. I wasted too much time on CPR when I should have done a tracheotomy. I've never seen someone die from anaphylaxis so fast. I thought I had time. He closed his eyes and shuddered. It was never good to let people blame themselves for long. Steve, it wasn't your fault. He looked up. I'd never called him by his first name before. If I'd been more careful about the restaurant I picked, he might still be alive. I knew he had a shellfish allergy, but I insisted on taking him to a restaurant that sometimes served lobster. I'm not sure you can find a restaurant in Portsmouth that doesn't. What does the chief have to say? Palmer scoffed. After Detective Wheeler raked me over the coals, the chief told me to go home, be with my family, and take time off. I didn't know him well, but I was sure he didn't want to be sidelined like that. Palmer wanted to catch the killer and bring him to justice. And what are you actually going to do? I can't do anything. At least not officially. Can you believe Wheeler had me in interrogation for hours, trying to poke holes in my story? Yes, I absolutely could. If there was one thing I knew about the Portsmouth Police Department, it was that if you were the closest person to a murder victim, you were instantly their first, best suspect. How can I help? Palmer sat up straighter. There's nothing you can do. Whoever did this is dangerous and clever. I don't want civilians anywhere near this case. I don't even like Wheeler near it. How could I explain to her kid if she got hurt, or worse? Then why did you come here, if you don't want my help? I wanted to talk to a friend who wasn't on the force but had an idea of what I was going through. And I wanted to thank you. You sat with me this morning, and even though I couldn't say anything then, I appreciate it. It was, calming. I gave him a small smile. You're welcome. Can I get you anything from the shop? I've got a nice meditative candle that will help relieve stress. All you do is light it and meditate for about ten minutes. He pursed his lips. I don't know how to meditate. That's no big deal. It's really easy, I can show you. Wait here, and I'll get the candle. I turned my sign to closed and locked the door. I picked up one of the trauma candles and lit it with a match, just in case Palmer was looking. It was lightly scented with vetiver and sandalwood to calm and release the emotional effects of trauma. I set the candle on my desk and sat next to Palmer. All you do is look at the candle and try to empty your mind of thought. It's very hard to do, so every time you find yourself thinking about anything, you focus on the candle and empty your mind again. Don't worry about how many times you have to start over, that's all part of the practice. Ready? He nodded. We sat in silence together, watching the candle burn. Palmer fidgeted, sighed, and cracked his knuckles. After about two minutes, I said, that's good for now. You can do this again before bed and then a few times a day until the candle is used up. You'll get better if you practice every day. The candle would burn for eight consecutive hours, so it could easily take him a month to burn the candle down. I blew out the candle and handed it to him. On the house. He took the candle. Thanks again. I had another thought. You're probably going to have difficulty falling or staying asleep over the next few weeks. I took a tin of chamomile tea off the shelf. This will help you relax. If you don't enjoy the flavor, you can add a piece of candy ginger to the cup before you pour the boiling water in it. I don't like the idea of needing help to sleep, he said. I absolutely agree with you. This is just chamomile, and it won't have any lasting effects on you. I promise. No grogginess, no dependency? None at all. 
And how about my next random drug test? You won't have any problems. But you can ask your doctor first, if you want. He may try to give you a prescription for something stronger, but I'd start with the tea. Chapter 4 Once Palmer left, I took a few minutes to restock my shelves. I had made a set of eight-hour candles to burn next to Trina's photo, and I wanted to wait until today's candle burned itself out. I don't know what to do to help Palmer, I said. Talking to Trina as though she was still here helped me process my thoughts. Today's chat didn't give me any insight. Once I saw the puff of smoke signaling the candle flame was out, I left the shop for the short walk home. I enjoyed not having a car. Walking everywhere helped keep the damage from my love of eclairs to a minimum and helped keep me in touch with the natural progression of the seasons. As I walked down the sidewalk to my apartment, I saw Thea and Delia's red Kia parked in the lot. Had they already heard about the crispy biscuit incident? I was grateful it was just them and not the whole family who had come to see me. How did I know it wasn't the whole family? If they all wanted to talk to me, I would have been summoned to Proctor House. It's not quite as bad as it sounds, my apartment is a bit small for seven people to sit in one room and talk. Besides, I didn't have nearly the amount of good food Aunt Nadia kept in her kitchen. I checked my mail, pulled out the few envelopes addressed to Abby, and marked them to be forwarded to her parents' house. I was still having to do that, months after she moved out, and the sting was finally starting to lessen. I missed her, missed having someone else in my apartment. Sure, I had Jameson to keep me company, but sometimes he was more like a cruel boss than companion. And I definitely wouldn't call him a friend. My cousins were standing at my door, waiting for me. You could have just gone in, I said. Delia shook her head. We don't have the code to your alarm. Forget the alarm, I'm more worried about your cat, Thea said. Honestly, I never set the alarm anymore. My wards were strong enough to keep intruders out. Jameson? Nah, he's fine. But just to be sure, I'll tell him to always let you two in. I opened my door and said, Hi honey, I'm home. Jameson hated being called honey. Or cutie pie. Or Mr. Snuggle Wuggums. And I have the scratches to prove it. He never hurt me, but I got the feeling I was the one being trained in our relationship. His usual hiss at being called honey came from what I now thought of as his room. It had been Abby's bedroom, but when she moved out, Jameson didn't hesitate to claim the space as his own. What did a cat need their own space for? Honestly, I was afraid to ask. Cat familiars were definitely not like regular cats, and my life seemed to go much more smoothly when I did as he asked. Yeah, I was definitely being trained by my cat. Jameson came padding out of his room and looked my cousins up and down. It took a lot of energy for him to speak to witches other than me, so most times he didn't even bother. Hello, Jameson. I've brought you some tuna, Delia said. I rolled my eyes. Grandma and the aunts were deferential to Jameson, and it looked like their behavior had rubbed off on my cousins. Jameson dipped his head in acknowledgement, then looked at Thea. She reached into her backpack and retrieved a cat toy that looked like a small rumbo with holes. She turned it on, and a feather popped out of one of the holes. When she set it down, it began to move around on the floor, the feather popping in and out of different holes. I could feel Jameson resisting the urge to pounce on the toy and catch the feather. He wouldn't act so undignified until after they left. No catnip, Thea told him. I didn't know whether he enjoyed catnip, only that he refused to have it in the house. That was fine with me, I didn't need a doped-out cat trying to teach me advanced amulet magic. Delia took her package of tuna into the kitchen and added some to his empty food bowl. While she was there, she rinsed out and refilled his water bowl. 
I flopped down on the couch, tired after long days of work and difficult magic practice every night. What brings you two here? They sat on either side of me. Have you heard about Detective Palmer? Delia asked. Before I could answer, Thea chimed in. He was at the crispy biscuit and the guy he was eating breakfast with just up and died. I sighed. I know. I was at the crispy biscuit having breakfast with Mina when it happened. Mina? Mina Cartwright? When did she get back in town? Delia asked. I'm not sure, but she's back home and looking for work, I said. That reminded me, I needed to call Bethany and put in a good word for Mina. Wait a minute. You were there? You saw the whole thing, and you didn't call us? Thea asked. I stood up and started pacing the floor. I didn't call anyone. I was kind of shaken up, so I just went to work. You still look a little upset now, Delia said. I am. I'm going to make tea. Do you want some? I asked. You look like you could use some brandy in yours, Thea said. I shook my head. Jameson and I have been practicing every night, and I need to keep a clear mind. I put the kettle on and pulled out three cinnamon orange tea bags. I didn't feel like pulling together ingredients for a special tea right now. So, what happened? Delia asked. I wasn't facing him, so I didn't see everything. I heard a crash of a plate, turned around and saw the man, Palmer's cousin Dan. He was flushed, and Palmer dragged him to the floor. Palmer yelled for an EpiPen because his cousin had a shellfish allergy. Emma brought him the restaurants, but it was too late. How horrible! Delia said. I called for an ambulance, and Palmer did chest compressions. He was crying the whole time. I didn't know what to do, so I sat with him, just so he wouldn't be alone, you know? I felt like I was going to start tearing up again, so I busied myself pulling cookies out of the cabinet. And then you went to work? Thea asked. I nodded. It's not like I can call in sick and have someone else take my shift, I said. I'm telling you, you need an assistant. Just hire some non-magical person to help around the shop and take over for a few half-days, Delia said. I'm not ready to pay someone to work for me yet. I'd at least have to get a roommate before I could afford it. At first, I'd held out on looking for a new roommate, hoping Abby would move back. Then she told me her move was permanent, but after two months, why hadn't she forwarded her mail? Maybe part of her wanted to come back, and even though her bedroom had been reoccupied, part of me wasn't ready to give up on her. So, did you see who did it? Delia asked. What kind of turn had our lives taken that she assumed he was murdered? I shook my head. I wasn't facing that way, and Mina said she wasn't paying attention to them. We were busy catching up. You don't think Palmer did it? Do you? Thea asked. I poured water into our mugs. Come get your tea. And of course I don't think Palmer did it. I brought my tea and the snickerdoodles back to the couch and sat between my cousins. Honestly, it looked like an accident. You don't really believe that, do you? Healthy young guy drops dead in the middle of a restaurant doesn't seem accidental to me. Thea said. How is Palmer doing? Delia asked. He came to see me just before I left work. He was a mess. He spent the better part of his day being interrogated, and he's got no idea who did it. He's not allowed anywhere near the investigation, not even unofficially. Thea took a cookie. We're going to investigate for him, right? I sighed. He doesn't want me to. He specifically told me to stay out of the investigation. 
He always says that, and you never do. He can't expect you'll start paying attention to what he says now, can he? Thea said. I don't know. It seemed important to him. He was such a mess, I had to teach him to meditate and give him a trauma candle to bring home with him. You had to teach him to meditate? I thought everyone learned in kindergarten, Delia said. I chuckled. Apparently not, and I'm sure they don't teach meditation at the police academy. He lasted two fidgety minutes before he started cracking his knuckles. We're really not going to find out who killed his cousin? Thea asked. Not this time. Jameson has me up half the night, practicing until I'm beyond rundown, so that I'll be able to cast the spells he's teaching me no matter what. And I don't think I can use the amulet for things other than sorority business. Oh, I hadn't thought of that, Delia said. I'll get in touch with Palmer tomorrow and see how he's doing. But for now, it's just business as usual for us, I said. For as much as Thea complained the last time we worked to find a murderer, she looked disappointed now. Oh. I guess I thought you'd want to help your friend. He doesn't exactly like our help, and he's even worried about Detective Wheeler investigating, I said. He's that worried? Delia asked. I nodded. To my surprise, they decided not to stay. You probably have work to do with Jameson, right? Delia asked. My heart sank. I did. After they left, Jameson jumped up on my lap. Sometimes he really was just like a cat and wanted to be petted. What's on the docket for tonight? I asked. You know, you can use your amulet for anything you like. Really? Even if I'm looking at what seems to be a non-magical crime? Not even a crime, but a horrible accident? Yes. Using the amulet in such a low-stakes situation like this will be good practice. Great. More practice. I doubt Palmer would say this is low stakes. Probably not. Where should we start with tonight's lesson? I asked. He jumped off my lap and walked to the door. Tonight we're going for a walk. You're going to use your senses to find faint traces of magic as we go downtown. You could have saved me the walk and come to work with me, I said. There's not nearly enough sun in your office for my afternoon nap. A cat has priorities, you know. Chapter 5 as I expected, Jameson kept me out very late the night before. Not for the first time since he'd come to live with me, I thought I needed to make the opposite of a sleeping potion. The problem was, stimulants were tricky to work with for even the most experienced potion witches. I was far from experienced and decided, once again, that coffee was going to have to be enough for me. I picked up the cool iced coffee cup from the fancy tart and swirled it around. The ice rattled as drops of condensation slid off the cup and onto the paper towel I set down to spare the cherry desktop. I took a sip, I loved a simple iced mocha, and I had the bag that held my éclair. The éclair was for after lunch, I reminded myself, and it wasn't even ten in the morning yet. The office phone rang. Portsmouth Apothecary, how may I help you? Hi, ah, uh, is this Isabella? Who else would it be? Yes, it is. Oh, good. Hi. It's Kate, Kate Stanton. She stopped talking, and I wondered if I was going to have to drag every sentence out of her. What's up? I was wondering, if you weren't busy tonight, if maybe we could get together? I need some advice, and you were the first person I thought of. Advice? From me? Sure, I guess. Why don't you stop by the apothecary at six? I can do that. I was thinking we could go out for a drink. Is that okay with you? A drink? What on earth was going on here? 
I don't drink much, but sure, we can go somewhere. Great. I'll see you then. We hung up, and I tried to imagine what kind of advice Kate needed from me that would require a drink. She certainly wasn't coming to me for relationship advice, and I didn't know anything about her career. Health advice? Potions advice? Not likely, she'd probably just come when the shop was open for that. It sounded like she wanted to talk about something personal. I shook my head. I wouldn't know until she got here tonight. Kate walked into the apothecary at five to six. Sorry, I'm early. I can just look around until you're ready to go. She wasn't in her uniform, which made sense, because we were going out for a drink. But as I looked at her, dressed in jeans and a retro Beatles t-shirt, I wondered if she was even old enough to drink. I'd already counted the cash and tidied up, so I was ready. Just give me a few minutes to lock everything up and we can head out. I went out back, checked the greenhouse, and locked it. I locked the back door and my office on my way toward the front of the shop. Trina's candle was almost out, so rather than waiting for it to go out like I usually did, I set it and its holder in the large, empty sink in the prep room. I turned the sign to say closed. Ready when you are. She smiled nervously and walked out of the shop. I felt bad for her. She was obviously nervous, so I thought it would be best to just get whatever she wanted to say out in the open. Kate, is something wrong? You've never asked to come see me, you usually just stop by. I'm worried about Palmer, and I thought you might be too. I am. Seeing your cousin die right in front of you must be difficult. He stopped by last night to talk. I taught him how to meditate and gave him a candle to focus on. I thought he smelled different today, she said. Kind of like sandalwood and vetiver? I asked. He must have been burning that candle for a long time last night. You could smell it on him? The scent in that candle is very faint. I hadn't considered someone would burn it for more than an hour at a time. He must have been meditating all night. She laughed. I doubt it. He was like a caged animal today, pacing back and forth in the squad room. The chief finally told him to take the day off so the rest of us could get some work done. Is that why you're worried about him? I asked. No. Detective Wheeler is sure he killed his cousin, and she's determined to prove it. I stopped walking. What? There was no one else who could have done it. The waitress had never met him, neither had the cook. Wheeler can't find anyone with a motive to kill the victim. But did Palmer have one? We started walking again. I can't imagine he would. Can you? I thought for a minute. Everything I knew about Palmer said no, he'd never kill someone unless it was self-defense. We're here, Kate announced. We were at the GOAT. I'd never been here, but had heard good things about the restaurant. Have you been here before? She opened the door for me. Yes. They have this one drink that is amazing. It's not healthy, but it's so good. We sat at the teak bar. I'd been too busy since I turned 21 to spend any time in a bar, except for that one time I got roofied. Since then, bars didn't hold much allure for me. This one, though, was much nicer than the lips. Everything was clean, the brass was shiny, and I could see only one tattoo on the bartender's forearm. I put my hand down on the bar and picked it back up again. Not sticky. Are you okay? Kate asked. I tried to shake my mind out of its suddenly weird mood. Yes, I'm fine. I was just remembering the last time I was at a bar. With Trina's nephew, James. Kate's eyes widened. I'm sorry. I didn't even think of that. 
Do you want to get out of here? I smiled what I hope was a reassuring smile. No. I can't spend the rest of my life avoiding bars, and who better to go to one with than a friend in the police force? She looked at me skeptically. If you're sure. Definitely, besides, I want to try this amazing drink. You don't even want to know what it is? I shook my head. Anything that makes you smile like that I think I ought to try at least once. She called the bartender over. Two virgin drunken fraps. The bartender rolled his eyes but turned to make our drinks. Drunken frappe? Virgin? I asked. She blushed. Yeah, I'm only twenty. But you don't need liquor for this to be over the top. The bar only had a few businessmen in it, drinking beer at a table together. I looked back at the bartender and was confused. Is that a can of frosting? I asked. Kate smiled. It sure is. It goes on the outside of the glass to hold the crushed sugar cone. By the way, you're not diabetic, are you? The bartender brought our drinks to us. Here you are, ladies. I wanted to thank him, but I was too astonished. It's best if you eat the choco taco first, then drink the frappe, Kate said. I blew out my breath and delicately picked up my taco. I guess this is dinner too. Kate took a bite of hers and nodded. While she ate, I briefly touched my amulet and checked for drugs in my drink. It warmed, indicating the drink was safe. The only way this drink was going to harm me was to peg my blood sugar at maximum. So, about Palmer. My answer is no. There is no way he would kill someone, not unless he had to. Breakfast is rarely a life-and-death situation, and he'd have had to come prepared with what, shellfish extract? Kate looked suspicious. How did you know what killed him? Palmer said his cousin had a shellfish allergy, and at the time, he thought food contamination was the problem. Okay. Just checking. It was shellfish, but the level was much higher than an improperly washed dish would have. Have you spoken to any of the restaurant staff? I asked. Kate took a sip of her drink. No. I'm persona non grata on this investigation. Wheeler made a point to stop by my desk and tell me personally. She thinks I'm too close to Palmer and the case might strain my loyalties. I scoffed. As if. If you found out he did it, you'd be so angry that he wouldn't be safe with you. Why do you ask about the staff? Emma Ross was his waitress, and she thought it was her fault for not wiping down the table well enough. I was wondering if we could tell her it wasn't her fault. Afraid not. That kind of info needs to come from official sources, but I'm sure Wheeler will get around to telling her in the next day or two. Kate took a deep breath. But now that you mention we, I really think we should work together on this. I can use your help. I cocked an eyebrow at her. You know I'm just a glorified tea lady, right? I'm not a glorified tea lady, but she didn't know that, and I really wanted to know why she thought I'd be helpful. No, you're not. She took a long sip of her now-melting ice cream monstrosity. Some people are naturals. They can see through the lies and get to the truth. You mean me? That's what Palmer thinks. Wow. Palmer thought I was a natural investigator. It would have been nice to hear it from him, but I guess I'd take second hand. Okay. What's the plan? I was thinking we could start with the waitress, Emma Ross. You don't think? Nah, but other than Palmer, she was probably the person closest to the victim. Go easy on her. I'll call her and set it up. Kate turned from her drink. You'll what? She's a friend of mine. I'll call her. 
Man, do I know how to pick him. We can't meet at the restaurant, though. I don't want Wheeler seeing me anywhere but the station until this case is over. No problem. I'll set it up and get back to you. Chapter 6 The Piscataqua River flows past Prescott Park and the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard on its way to the Atlantic Ocean. I rested on a cool stone bench in the park, letting the breeze off the river blow my hair away from my face. Seagulls squawked as they rode the wind, looking for food. I waited in the morning sun for Emma and Kate to arrive. Thanks for coming, I said to Emma when she sat next to me. Emma's red hair shone in the sun. She was dressed for work, black pants and a white Oxford shirt. You're not going to be late for work, are you? No, my shift is over, and I didn't want to go home to change. I thought you said police were going to be here too. Kate's running late, but she'll be here any minute now. She's not part of the investigation, so don't tell anyone we talked. Okay? Emma's eyes widened. Am I going to get in trouble? Definitely not. Kate might. She works with Palmer and was told to stay away from the case. But wouldn't she be the first to see if something was wrong? That doesn't make sense. I smiled. Now you know why we're here. Detective Wheeler already came to talk to me, Emma said. Kate joined us on the bench, dressed in her uniform and her hair up in the regulation tight bun. She's running the case. If she's already talked to you, you probably won't see her again, Kate said. Okay. Fire away, Emma said. Kate pulled out her notebook. Did you notice anything different or out of place that day at the restaurant? Even before Detective Palmer came in? Emma shook her head. I've been replaying the morning in my mind, but nothing seemed off. I didn't see anyone in the kitchen who shouldn't have been either. How about the customers? Anyone catch your attention? Even something small could be important, I said. We were slammed that day. It was like all the tourists found us at the same time. So, lots of families, some of whom were starting to get worried about the time and making it to the beach before lunchtime, but honestly, no one seemed out of place. Okay. Good. You're doing great. Now, can you remember Detective Palmer and the man with him? Kate asked. Emma shivered. I don't think I'll ever forget the other man, or how he looked laying out on the floor. Kate reached out and squeezed Emma's hand. I've been at this for a while now, and I promise you it gets better. You may not forget, but the memories will fade, and you'll replace most of it with happier images. Just give it time. Emma smiled. Thanks. Detective Palmer looked the same, except not in a suit. He's a weird mixture of nice and gruff, and he wasn't any different yesterday, at least until her smile faded and she looked out over the river. Of course. And how about the other man? His name was Dan Palmer, he was the detective's cousin, Kate said. Emma thought for a minute. He was more intense, particularly for a Saturday morning. He was leaning forward, and although he wasn't talking loud, he seemed frantic. Like something was wrong, but he didn't want anyone in the restaurant to hear him. Kate nodded and wrote in her notebook. Who got to the restaurant first? The detective did, but he didn't get seated until a few minutes before Dan came in. Like I said, we were slammed. He waited on the bench until I called him. Did he ever move? I asked. Not that I noticed. Not even to use the restroom? Or step outside to use his phone? Kate asked. Emma bit her lip and closed her eyes. After a moment, she said, I'm sorry. I can't remember. And besides, I spent most of the time waiting on my tables, not seating new customers. 
she paused for a moment. Wait a minute, do you think he did it? I'm not sure, but I'm leaning toward no. I've worked with him for almost a year now, and he doesn't seem like a cold-hearted killer, Kate said. Emma looked at me. Absolutely not. Palmer's not a killer. I wouldn't be here if I thought he was. Emma breathed a sigh of relief. Good. I'd hate to think my radar was off. I was going to ask him out for a drink, but then, it wasn't the right time. Emma and Palmer? It could work. Yeah, I'd give it some time. Maybe the next time he's at the biscuit you'll know he's ready to date, I said. I'm not sure I'd ever go back if my cousin died right in front of me, Kate said. Fair point, I conceded. Okay, back to questions. Did anyone stop by to talk to Palmer before Dan got there, or both of them later? Emma's eyes brightened. Yes. Now that you mention it, a woman stopped to talk to Palmer, but she ignored his cousin. Any idea who it was? Kate asked. Juliana. I don't know her last name, but she's here every Saturday with her kids. I can ask around the other servers and see if they know her last name. That won't be necessary. If Detective Wheeler doesn't have her name, we can run credit card statements and get it. Emma nodded. She never pays cash, not even for tips. Isabella tells me you brought the EpiPen to Palmer. Is that correct? Yes. Where did you get it? We keep one in the kitchen. This is a tourist restaurant for most of the summer, and you'd be surprised how many people don't know they have a food allergy until they're on vacation and want to try something a little different. The owner insists we always have one on hand. Kate wrote more in her notebook. Is there anything else you think we ought to know? Nothing comes to mind. If anything does, I want you to call me. Do not look into anything yourself, I said. Oh, I was going to ask Manny, the cook, about the food that day, Emma said. Don't. Asking questions could put you in danger. Kate and I will handle it. Emma frowned. But Isabella, why you? You run an apothecary. You're not with the police, too, are you? I shook my head. No, but I guess you could consider me an informal consultant. Then why aren't you in danger from asking questions? She asked. I grinned and moved my arms in a stereotypical karate chop. I got moves, sister. My Krav Mega was so rusty I doubted it would be of any use. My magic, on the other hand, was razor sharp thanks to Jameson's intense training. Emma rolled her eyes. Whatever. I promise I'll call if I think of anything. Emma left the park, and we considered what she said. No real clues, but possibly some woman named Juliana. I can ask Palmer about her. Kate said. Do you think she'd poison his cousin, just in from out of town though? What motive would she have? Kate shook her head. I swear there's no telling sometimes. People kill and throw their own lives away for the stupidest reasons. What's next? I asked Kate. Next, I get back to my desk so I look like I'm being a good little officer and not investigating this case. You probably have things to do too. Not today, it's my day off. Nice. And you've got no plans? I shook my head. How about you and me, tonight? We can go talk to a friend of mine, the night corner. Sounds great. Do we need to bribe him with anything? Coffee? A Claire's? She laughed. He works with dead bodies in the middle of the night. A visit from two very living women is all the bribe he needs. Great. I don't know where the morgue is. 
I'll pick you up at your place at 10? It's a date. A very weird date, but okay. Chapter 7 I had the rest of the day to do whatever I wanted. Shopping, napping, tidying my apartment, the world was my oyster, and I decided to go hang out with my family. I walked through the wakening market square, waving to people I knew. I caught a faint smell of the ocean breeze and smiled. It looked like it was going to be a good beach day. At the fancy tart, I decided to go in. Abby was at the counter, and when she saw me, a flicker of sadness or distress ran across her face. She quickly hid it, though, under a smile and forced cheer in her voice. Hi, Isabella, how are you? I decided to ignore the emotions she didn't want me to see. I'm great. How about you? Not bad. Can I get you something? I looked up at the menu. Today's coffee was salted caramel latte. How about the special latte and an eclair? Omar walked out of the kitchen carrying a basket of freshly baked baguettes. Isabella! Hey, so good to see you. He turned to Abby. Bethany wants to see you in the kitchen. I'll stay out here. Abby looked at him, relief across her face, then rushed into the kitchen. Omar looked at the order Abby had rung up for me. I'll get right on that. He turned to the coffee machine and asked, How's the apothecary doing? I keep meaning to stop in and visit, but, you know. I definitely knew. Working on your feet through the morning rush was tiring. No problem. Stop by on a day off, and we'll catch up. He handed me my coffee and eclair. Anything else? I handed him a $10 bill. No more employee discount. Yeah. I wanted to talk to Bethany for a minute. A friend of mine applied for a job, and I wanted to give her an informal reference. Omar frowned for a moment. I'll go get her. No need, I can go out back. His frown returned. Not really. The kitchen is only for employees, he said, looking uncomfortable. I felt bad for him. He didn't like having to enforce the rules I'd forgotten. No problem. I'll wait until she can come out. He handed me my change, and I took my food to a window table. I watched people walk by for only a few minutes before Bethany took the chair in front of me. Business ownership seems to agree with you, she said. I was a little confused. What? You look good. Oh, thanks. I didn't speak for a moment. You wanted to see me? she asked. Right. Did my friend Mina come in for an interview recently? I wanted to tell you she'd be a good fit here. Bethany thought for a moment. The one with the bright green hair? I nodded. Yeah. She's always been a hard worker, and she's good with people. I hope the hair isn't a problem. I haven't decided who to hire yet, but I'll keep her in mind. As for her hair, I kind of liked it. Sometimes I think I'd have gone with a bright pink if we had these colors when I was much younger. You still could, you know. She laughed. Oh no. I'm too set in my ways now. It's all white hair all the time for me now. She stood up and I followed. Good to see you, Isabella. Thanks, you too. I left the cafe wondering if something was going on there that I didn't know about. Abby practically fled to the kitchen, and Omar's story about me not being allowed back there was definitely not something he would have done to any other former employee. Abby not wanting to talk to me hurt, but there wasn't anything I could do about that until she was ready to talk. I shrugged it off and took a sip of coffee. I had too many other things to think about today. I walked up the driveway to Proctor House and heard yelling from the open kitchen window. 
Of course I could hear Grandma, but who was the other woman? It wasn't any of the ants. I crept up to the window and peeked in, hoping no one would see me. It was Eunice. I ducked my head down so they couldn't see me. I'm just saying, I don't think she's ready for the responsibility. Amulets don't go to children, usually, Eunice said. Grandma defended me. She's young, but she's not a child. She and her cousins have had enough tragedy in their lives already. She's ready to carry it. So it was the tragedy in my life that made me ready for the amulet. Not my natural abilities or the fact that I'd already used it once to successfully catch a murderer. She hasn't had the usual indoctrination time. Beatrice was planning to spend another year getting her ready. A whole year. Do you really think she can just jump in now without time for practice? Eunice asked. My eyes widened. I was missing an entire year of training? And why is it training seemed to take up half my life, from the time I was very small, training was always important and took priority over just about everything else, including schoolwork sometimes. Isn't that what the cat is for? Grandma asked. Jameson is old. He should be training his own replacement, not using up the last of his energy on a young witch who, no fault of her own, doesn't know what she's doing. Wait a minute. Who said I don't know what I'm doing? I just opened a can of cat food without using my hands. Oh. It hit me. That wasn't a big deal, and Jameson still had me working on very small spells. In fact, most of the things he was training me on didn't even require the amulet. My stomach flipped. I was still just barely beginning, and there was a lot more to learn. And who else is going to train her? You? You know you're too old for the job, Grandma said. Eunice sighed. That's what I'm saying, Esther. The amulet needs to go back to the sorority. There's no way she'll be ready in time. Sounds like you've already made up your mind. Why are you even bothering to tell me? Because you can break it to her more gently than I can. You can explain that it's for the good of the sorority, Eunice said. Oh, I see. You want me to take the brunt of your decision? I don't give two cents for your sorority, and there's no way you're going to use me to soften the blow. I smiled. Eunice definitely didn't know Grandma well. If she did, she'd know Grandma was more of a rip-the-band-aid-off-fast type of woman. Why don't we ask her what she thinks? Isabella, you can stop listening at the window and come in now, Grandma said. Bats! I thought I'd been sneaky and they hadn't heard me. I walked into the kitchen. I was starting to feel angry. Planning my future without me? Trying not to, Grandma said. But she thinks you need to give up the amulet. The amulet did not agree. It grew heavy and warm against my skin. Can she do that? I asked. Eunice sighed. I can't take it from you, but you can voluntarily surrender it. That's what I wanted Esther to talk you into. I shook my head. No. And I don't think the amulet wants. Without warning, Eunice cast a spell on me and pinned me to the kitchen ceiling. She held her hand out, keeping me from falling to the floor. See, she said. Grandma's face went red. Set her down, gently, right now. I'd never heard this kind of anger come from Grandma before, and I was glad it was directed away from me. Eunice blanched. No. Not yet. Let's see if she can defend herself. Great. Now I was up here until I figured my own way down. My mother came rushing in. Did I hear one of the girls yelling? Grandma moved her eyes to me. My mother looked up and instantly threw a spell at me, keeping me stuck to the ceiling. Great. 
Now I was doubly stuck. Let her go, my mother said, staring straight at Eunice. Eunice sighed. The girl's not ready for the amulet. She didn't even see the spell coming. This just proves my point that she needs to surrender the amulet to the sorority and let us choose an older, more experienced witch to carry it. Maybe in thirty years she'll be ready, but she isn't now. Let her go, my mother repeated. I felt much safer, knowing my mother was also holding me up, so that if Eunice decided to drop me, I wouldn't land face first on the floor. But I needed to put an end to this. If I could get myself out of the spell, I could prove Eunice wrong. I felt around with my senses, trying to figure out her spell. I hadn't had much practice with this, particularly since I was a potion witch. Give me a combination of just about anything, and I could have told you what was in it, but teasing apart a spell? Definitely not my forte. I closed my eyes and felt around myself, trying at least to find the edges of the spell. First, I needed to distinguish the two spells holding me up. Eunice's spell was tight around me, like spandex, whereas my mother's was much looser, like a hammock keeping me from falling. I plucked at Eunice's spell with my mind. It stretched, but then snapped back. I thought over what Jameson had taught me lately and realized I knew exactly what to use. I formed the knife made of air I'd used to open Jameson's cat food can and traced around the edges of Eunice's spell. Thanks to Jameson's training, I didn't need to use more than the smallest flick of my finger. About a third of the way around my body, I could feel Eunice's grip giving way. I looked to her, and saw she was using all her concentration to try and keep the spell from tearing any more. I continued to cut at the edges of the spell. Halfway through, it gave way, and I fell two inches into my mother's spell. I cut through hers as well and levitated, finally setting myself down on the floor, feet first. I grinned at my triumph. Eunice scowled. Took you long enough. If you'd been under attack, you'd have been dead immediately. Just because you finally figured out what to do doesn't mean you're ready for anything. I wanted to deny what she said, but I couldn't. Sure, if anyone decided to go all Spider-Man on me again and plaster me to a ceiling, I'd know what to do, but what if the next attack was something totally different? What if I couldn't figure out what to do in time? What if I wasn't ready, and the amulet was stolen from me? My knees wobbled and I grabbed at a chair. Sit down, my mother said gently. I took a long sip of my coffee and tried to calm down. I hadn't liked that last thought at all. What if the amulet was stolen from me because I was too weak to protect it? My mother advanced on Eunice. You could have killed her. She could have fallen and broken her back, landing half on the table and half on the floor. Wow. I usually thought of my mother as kind of quiet, but there she was, fiercely advancing on a woman twice her age and magical strength as though she had nothing to lose. Grandma put a hand on her shoulder. But she didn't. We were both there, ready to catch Isabella if we needed to. She was never in any danger. Sure didn't feel that way to me. My mother pointed at the door. She escaped your spell. Now I think you should leave. She won't give up the amulet to the sorority. The amulet, and its former owner, chose her. You don't need to like it, but I suggest you make your peace with it, because that's the way it's going to be. Eunice slowly looked from grandma, to my mother, to me. It's going to end in tears. I just wanted to spare your family. After she left, my mother began to shake. I pulled the chair next to me away from the table. Sit. I'll make you tea, I said. I'll make the tea, Grandma said. She pulled a teacup out of the cabinet and poured whiskey into it. Here. Drink this. My mother drank half of it in one sip. So, it's a day-drinking kind of morning, I said. 
My mother pressed her hands on the table to stop them from trembling. I'm not sure. What was that? Grandma sat, no tea necessary. She's worried about the amulet. Is she a threat to Isabella? My mother asked. Grandma shook her head. No. She's devoted her life to the sorority and doesn't want to see it damaged by someone she thinks isn't ready for the responsibility. Grandma was right. I hadn't felt any threat, and her spell wasn't intended to harm me, just embarrass me. She didn't want to hurt me. I don't care what her intentions were. I don't want her anywhere near you, or the rest of the family, my mother said. I put my hand over hers. I'm fine. No harm was done. She's not going to start coming after me in dark alleys. My mother finished her tea and wiped her eyes. You're right, she isn't. I'll get to work on a ward that specifically keeps Eunice away. Michelle, Grandma said softly, you can't do that. Of course I can. That woman is dangerous. No, she's not. And what if Isabella needs her help? If you put wards on her, then Eunice won't be able to help. My mother frowned. But I have to do something. She's my daughter. Grandma smiled at her. Smiled. Just a little smile, but still, what was going on here? She's your grown daughter who, despite our best efforts, has decided to live alone and follow her own path. You know you have to allow her. She'll have to make her own mistakes, in a way you never had to. Looking at Isabella, I wonder if I should have made you and your cousins move out in your twenties. It might have been better for you. Whoa, hang on. Had Grandma just reversed her entire stance on our family living together for safety? Was it possible that I'd never have to hear another comment about moving home again? I gave my mother's hand a squeeze. I promise I'll be careful. And I'll start taking Jameson with me wherever I go. He doesn't let anything get past him. She squeezed my hand back. Promise you'll start using defensive spells every time you leave the house. It can't hurt to have a little bit of extra protection. I hated the way that made me feel. Do you think I need it every day? I mean, I doubt Eunice will come after me again, not now that I got out of her trap. We talked for a little while longer, trying to calm my mother down. Once she stopped shaking and had made herself some actual tea, I decided it was okay for me to leave. I used my senses to look for danger outside, but felt nothing. Okay, not nothing, because there was a woodpecker in the chestnut tree at the end of the driveway, but nothing immediately dangerous. The tree was old and was already being held up with heavy-duty cables. At some point its limbs would start to fall off, but not today. I'm going to go home now. I train with Jameson every night, but I promise I'll train harder now. Ask him to teach you how to use the amulet for defense. Maybe it can warn you. I kissed my mother on the top of her head. I will. I didn't let my mother and grandmother see how shaken I was by Eunice's accusations, but I needed to talk to Jameson about them. I used the time it took me to walk home to formulate some questions for him. Jameson, I'm home, I called as I entered my apartment. He padded out from his room. It's early. Why are you home now? I sat on the couch and sighed. Eunice stuck me to the ceiling as proof that I wasn't ready for the amulet or the sorority and then told my mother and grandmother that I should give it up. Jameson laughed. Maybe laughing at the woman who feeds you isn't your best plan, I warned. He stopped. I'm sorry. But of all the ways. But is she right? Am I ready? He jumped up on my lap. Of course you're not ready. You've only had the amulet for a couple months. We're still training. Did you get out of her trap? 
I nodded. I used the can opener spell. Jameson purred in approval. She made it sound like other, older witches who carried it were ready to use it right away. I stopped for a moment and bit my lip. And that I was already taking too long to train with it. Jameson let out a little hiss. Yes, you are new at all this. She was new once, too, and not very good. You got out of her spell, which is more than she did the first time another which challenged her. What happened? I asked, eager for the gossip. I wasn't there, but she got her amulet in her thirties. She was a housewife then, like most women after the war were. An older witch thought she wasn't ready and cast a spell on her. She needed to call and help to remove the spell. My eyes widened. Eunice practically crackled with power when she wanted to. What was the spell? Her skin turned green. She never told her husband she was a witch, so she only had until he came home to turn her skin back to the right color. She tried everything she could think of, but finally had to get help. Her aunt removed the spell and never let her forget she needed help. Since then, Eunice has challenged every young amulet holder she meets. So her challenge wasn't about me? She'd have done this to anyone who got the amulet. The fact you got out quickly shows me you're doing just fine. Chapter 8 I hauled myself off the couch to let Kate into my apartment. Wow, you look terrible, she said as she walked through the door. She hadn't even had time to really get a good look at me. Thanks. It's nice to see you too. She, on the other hand, looked like she'd stepped out of a magazine. When she wasn't wearing her uniform, her style was on point, and she let her long brown hair out of its restrictive bun. I looked at her more closely. She was wearing makeup too. Just eyeliner and lip gloss, but the effect turned her from serious police officer to young woman. You could go undercover with that look. No one would think you're a cop. She blushed. Thanks. I didn't mean to say you look bad, it's just that you look like you've had a hard day even though I knew it was your day off. Too many errands? She asked. I wished I could tell her about the rest of my day, but I didn't think she was ready to hear about an elderly woman pulling a Peter Parker and sticking me to the ceiling, or how I used to spell my cat taught me to get out. Family stuff, I said and then realized she'd probably be happy to have family issues. I felt like a jerk. Sorry. I don't mean to complain. Kate smiled at me. It's okay. I've gotten past most of the grief. I'm happy for my friends who can complain when their families bother them. Kate's parents had died in a home invasion when she was a child, and I tried to be more sensitive to her past. I'd just blown it, though, complaining about my family. You look like you need to get your mind off whatever happened. How about a dead body? That always puts life in perspective for me. I rolled my eyes. Let me get my shoes on. Kate's red Mini Cooper was waiting outside for us. She had black spots painted on it and called it her ladybug. Some might call it girly, but I wouldn't when she was in hearing distance. Where is the coroner? I asked. She stopped at a red light. He works out of the basement of the hospital. We pulled into the parking lot of the Portsmouth Regional Hospital. Kate led me to the emergency room doors, the only ones open this late at night. She flashed her badge and told the nurse where we were going. We took the elevator to the basement. Why is it that basements always have the creepy stuff in them? The elevator bell rang and slid open. On the ride down, I'd steel myself, ready to see bodies in the midst of their autopsies, but the door opened onto a pleasant waiting area. Six upholstered chairs lined the wall opposite the elevator, and to the left there was a receptionist's desk with phone and computer. I let out a sigh of relief. You okay? Kate asked. 
I'd seen more dead bodies than most women my age, but I doubted I'd ever get used to it. Yeah. I was expecting something a bit more gruesome. Nah. Anyone can get this far, and we can't have people stumbling around the dead bodies, possibly contaminating the evidence. Or worse, fainting when they realize they're not going to find the gift shop down here. So how do we get in? She pointed to a doorbell. We ring the bell, and Max comes out. We'll talk, and if we need to see the body, he'll take us out back. She chuckled. Did you think I was just going to spring a dead body on you? I nodded. I'm all for practical jokes, but that's too gruesome, even for me. Kate rang the bell, and it was just a moment until a very tall man in pristine scrubs came out to see us. He smiled when he saw Kate. Officer Stanton, I wasn't expecting you tonight. Spur of the moment field trip. I'd like you to meet my friend Isabella Proctor. I held out my hand. Nice to meet you. He shook my hand. Max Hathaway, City Coroner. He looked me over and furrowed his brow. Are you with the police? How to explain? Not officially. But I have consulted on several cases for Detective Palmer. Several might be a stretch, but I wanted to sound like I knew what I was doing. He looked to Kate. I see. What can I do for you tonight? Before Kate could ask him anything, he said, I can't take unauthorized people into the morgue. I'd get into a lot of trouble if anyone found out. Of course you can't, I soothed. We'd never want you to do anything you shouldn't. He relaxed a bit. We can go into my office, though. We followed him past the receptionist's desk, down a short hallway to a door labeled Dr. Max Hathaway. He opened the door and ushered us in. The office had the usual desk, visitors' chairs, and file cabinets, but it also had a treadmill, small television, and dorm-sized refrigerator. All he needed was a bed, and he'd never have to leave. Treadmill? I asked without thinking. Portsmouth isn't exactly the murder capital of the country, so I like to exercise when I get some downtime, he said. Have you had a chance to examine Dan Palmer? Kate asked. As I said, it's not the busiest of morgues, so yes. I've finished his examination. Can you tell us if anaphylaxis was the cause of death, and if so, what caused it? Yes, it was. It was a bad case too. He had nothing in his stomach but water that had been laced with tropomyosin. And that's a poison? Kate asked. No. It's the protein people who are allergic to shellfish usually react to. Someone dumped tropomyosin into his water and killed him with it. But for all intents and purposes, for Dan Palmer, it was a poison. Kate frowned. That's problematic. Eyewitnesses, including Isabella, say that no one went near his water once it got to the table. The choice of restaurant wasn't well known, and it doesn't appear that the staff knew the victim. Detective Wheeler had been busy today, if all the restaurant staff had already been eliminated. Are you sure? Could he have eaten anything earlier, or had someone tampered with any medication he might have taken? Puncture marks? Max shook his head. Sorry, no. The protein was in the water. He took a pen from his drawer and started to write a note. I'll ask Amanda to look for puncture marks. Something might show up once the body stops reacting to the tropomyosin. Amanda? I asked. She works days. She's better comforting the bereaved than I am. Is there anything else you can tell us about his death? Kate asked. Max sat back and thought for a minute. Not about the death, but I have some ideas about the killer. The killer must have known the victim to know what he was allergic to. 
the killer was angry with the victim too. This is a frightening way to die, and it takes a certain amount of callousness or anger to let someone suffer rather than using a faster method. Kate stood up. Max and I followed. Thanks, Max. I'm not officially on the case, so if you could maybe forget we were here? Max beamed at her. Forget what? I haven't seen anyone tonight. We left his office, but Max stayed behind. In the elevator, I said, Max likes you. Kate rolled her eyes. I know. He seems like a nice guy. Not creepy even with his job. You should ask him out. She frowned. He's a doctor, and I'm a rookie cop. What on earth would he find interesting about me? The elevator bell rang, and we stepped out into the emergency department. Has he seen your car? You're not like everyone else, Kate, and people like that. She blushed. Wow, she really was innocent for a cop unless he's not your type, then ignore me. I don't know what I'm saying. Kate looked at her phone. Want to see what Wheeler's found out today? Absolutely. But how? Wheeler's working with a friend of mine who may, from time to time, forget to lock up the case files. The night shift primarily stays out on patrol, so the station should be mostly empty, and Wheeler's definitely gone home to her kid by now. Kate and I entered the station through the back door. It was quiet and half the lights were off. Our footsteps echoed down the hallway until we reached the squad room. Kate pushed the door open and reached out for the lights. No one was at their desks. She took a file off a desk and continued onto hers. Her desk had nothing on it but her nameplate. Kind of bleak, isn't it? I asked. She unlocked her drawers and said, I keep everything in here. Most people think the rookie doesn't mind if they borrow their things. I mind. I can't keep hunting down my stapler, or worse yet, buying a new one every week. She opened the folder labeled Palmer, Dan and spread out the papers in order. We have to keep the pages in the right order, so don't move them around. This made me feel nervous. What if we got caught? I really didn't want her to get in trouble. Okay. But wouldn't it be better to just look at them in the folder? I like to see them all at once, it's easier to draw connections that way. We started looking through the case file. I read the list of suspects and found the woman who had spoken to Palmer. Juliana Gibbons. I took a picture of the page and moved on to the next one, the report on the glass of water. Max hadn't left anything out when we talked to him. No fingerprints other than the victims and the waitresses, no other substances in the glass than water and the tropomyosin. No poison on anything else on the table, or the table itself. Aha! Kate said. I turned to look at the page she was reading. It was the background check on Dan Palmer. What? I asked. He's not necessarily a good guy. Why do you say that? He's got no job, but still has money. Palmer doesn't look like he comes from money, and so I doubt his cousin does, either. And? Kate looked at me like I was stupid. He's got to get money from somewhere. If he doesn't have a job he can pay taxes on, then he's got an illegal one he can't claim. Realization hit me. Oh. I hadn't thought of that. I thought I was getting so much better at investigating and then I ran up against something that made me feel like I was way out of my depth. So he works with some very shady people and maybe one of them wanted him killed. We can look into that tomorrow, I suggested. No. That's something we let Wheeler and her team look into. No offense, but you're not the backup I want to take when going to interview the bad guys. I smiled. Understandable. But it wouldn't always be that way. 
I decided to focus more on getting my spells out fast, before anyone could counteract them. Then I'd be great to take into dangerous situations. We spent another ten minutes going over the file, and I took photos of every page. So what's the plan for tomorrow? Kate started putting the papers back in the file, in order. If I were Wheeler, I'd start with the most promising leads, so we'll take the least promising. Which one is that? I asked, honestly not having any idea. Juliana Gibbons. She was there, but she was making too much of a big deal of herself, flirting with Palmer, to also be murdering his cousin. Chapter 9 The great thing about not opening my shop until 10 in the morning was that Kate and I could get a little early morning snooping in. This morning we were going to sit outside Juliana Gibbons's house, just to see what we could. Kate picked me up, this time in an unmarked cruiser instead of her ladybug. I was a little sad to leave the patch of warm morning sun I was standing in for her air-conditioned car. Kate brought coffee and danishes from the fancy tart and handed me one of each when I got into the car. You're a lifesaver. Thanks, I said. It's the least I can do. You're putting in a lot of hours here, and it's not like I can put in an expense report for your time. That was true. If Palmer found out either of us were investigating, he'd be mad. But if Wheeler found out we were investigating when she specifically forbade it, Kate could lose her job. I did a little more looking into Mrs. Gibbons last night, and I found some interesting connections, Kate said. HRMM? I said with my mouth full of flaky, sweet Pano chocolate. Her father was like Palmer's cousin, not traditionally employed, and Palmer's father was the cop who finally arrested him. Juliana's father died in prison. I frowned. The case file said she was flirting with him in the restaurant. Why would she do that? No clue. There could be a million reasons, that's why we're spending as much time as we can watching her. Maybe we'll see something. She drove us to a neighborhood of small well-maintained houses and parked on the street. We're watching number 15. We were parked in front of number 12, with a good view of 15's front door and one-car garage. Kate took a sip of her coffee, pushed her seat back and got comfortable. Maybe her father was not a great guy, and she was better off with him in jail, I said. What? I'm trying to figure out why she was so friendly with Palmer. Maybe she was happy her dad was gone. Kate shook her head. Not likely. She was young, seven years old. Then what's your theory? I asked. Don't have one. I'm going to need a lot more evidence before I can build up a picture of her motivations. People can be complicated, and sometimes even they don't understand the reasons for their actions. While we're here, let's talk about the crispy biscuit that day. I took a sip of my coffee. Okay. When was the first time you noticed Juliana and her kids at breakfast? I closed my eyes and thought about that morning. I saw her take her kids to the bathroom about the time I was ordering my food, I said. Anything seem off to you? I shook my head. Not really. I mean, she was wearing a lot of makeup for a Saturday morning breakfast, but some people are like that. Did she seem annoyed with the kids, nervous? Anything like that? No. She was like pretty much every other mother who wanted her kids to wash up before they ate. I wouldn't have noticed her at all, except that one of the kids bumped into Emma. How long were they in the bathroom? No idea. I didn't see them come back. By then I was too busy catching up with Mina to pay attention. Okay. Did you see her talking to Palmer at all? No. I was facing the other way. You could ask Mina, though. She was facing the right way. Okay, anything else about Juliana? Once Dan was on the ground, she hustled her kids out of the restaurant fast, 
but that's understandable. No one wants their kids to see that kind of thing. Juliana's front door opened, and two kids ran out to the garage. The three of them opened the garage door and went inside. I scrunched down in my seat so that my head was barely higher than the dashboard. What are you doing? Kate asked. Trying not to be seen. She laughed at me. Yeah, because you don't look suspicious at all, crouch down like that. It's okay to sit up. Juliana drove past us, her two children in the back seat. She's probably bringing them to school. I had a flash of I don't know what. Courage? Idiocy? I want to look in her windows. Kate bit her lip. Not a good idea. I grinned. I've heard worse. I'll just take a quick peek and come right back. Two minutes. If you hear me honk, then you need to get out of there immediately, because a neighbor has called you in. Okay. Two minutes. I got out of the car and walked to her door, bold as anything. I knocked on the door, looking frustrated when she didn't answer. I knocked again before I made my way to the side of the house. The garage had the usual clutter, two small bicycles, some tools, and snow shovels. I looked through the windows as I walked toward the back of her house. I even knocked on a window and called her name, thinking that would allay suspicions of her neighbors. Of course I was supposed to be there, I knew her name. Her living room was small and tidy, with a love seat and oversized upholstered chair facing the old, non-flat-screen TV, a wooden chest that doubled as a coffee table, and an area rug. Moving on to the kitchen, I could tell this was where she spent more of her time with the kids. Dirty breakfast dishes were in the sink, and a basket of laundry was on the kitchen table, half-folded. I tried the door, and it was unlocked. Is it breaking and entering if the door is unlocked? I opened the door and started talking as though she was there. Didn't you hear me knocking? I asked the empty room. I had no idea if I was fooling the neighbors, but hey, a girl could try. I wiped my fingerprints off the outside handle and pushed the door closed with my foot. I made a mental note to start carrying latex gloves with me. I made another mental note to stop thinking like a criminal. My heart was pounding in my chest as I quickly walked to the side of the house I hadn't already seen through the windows. First, the bathroom. I pulled my sleeve over my right hand and opened the medicine cabinet. The medicine cabinet didn't have anything out of the ordinary in it. The mostly empty bottle of Tums told me she suffered from heartburn, but there was little else of interest. The next room was her bedroom. I opened her bedside drawer and found a pack of cigarettes. A library book, The Sunday Girl by Pip Drysdale, was next to the white table lamp. How long had I been in here? I felt like I needed to rush through the rest of the room. The top of her bureau had a wedding picture of her and, presumably, Mr. Gibbons, a half-burned scented candle, and a small gun cleaning kit. I didn't have time to go through her drawers, so I settled for opening her closet. Jackpot. A very disturbing jackpot. Taped to the inside of her closet door were several photos of Palmer, each with what looked like cigarette holes burned into his face. She had written his schedule for the last three months and had circled Saturday's breakfast at the Crispy Biscuit on each week. It hadn't been an accident she was there. At the top of the door was another photo of a middle-aged man with paper hearts surrounding it. Her father? I took my phone out to take pictures when it rang. The ringtone startled me, and I dropped the phone into the closet. I found it among Juliana's shoes. Hello? I whispered. Didn't you hear me honking? Kate said. Never mind. She just pulled up. Get out of there. Broomsticks. I hung up, took two fast photos of the inside of the door and closed it. Frantically, 
I looked around for somewhere to hide, but the room was too sparsely decorated. Under the bed? I could, but then I'd be stuck there until she went out again. What was I doing? I didn't need to panic. I called up the strongest invisibility spell I knew and cast it on myself. Now all I had to do was get to the back door before she came through the front. I left the bedroom and was about to hightail it into the kitchen when I couldn't remember if the bedroom door was closed or not when I got to it. I turned to look at it. Closed? Not closed? The front door opened, and I had to leave the door as it was. Juliana turned around to close the door. I slowly stepped toward the kitchen, paying attention to where I put my feet. I could get out of here safely if I just didn't make any noise. She walked past me into the kitchen and set a travel mug in the sink with the dirty dishes. I didn't move until she walked past me again to put her purse in her bedroom. As soon as she got to her door, I walked as fast as I could to the kitchen door. Hello, she called out. Bats! Had I made noise when I moved? I pressed myself against the side of the refrigerator and froze. I was so close to the door and freedom. Then another thought hit me. I hadn't silenced my phone. If Kate called me again, Juliana wouldn't need to see me to know where I was. I had to get out of there. While I held the phone it was invisible, but my hands were shaking so much I was afraid I'd drop it again and it would become visible. I tamped down my panic and tried to look at the situation calmly. I was a witch, I was invisible. If I was patient, I could get out of here safely. Juliana came back into the kitchen and started putting away clean dishes from the dishwasher. As she maneuvered a large platter into its storage spot on top of the refrigerator, she came within two inches of me. I bit my lip and held my breath. Next spell to learn had to be cloaking. She quickly loaded the dirty breakfast dishes into the dishwasher, then turned her back to me and finished folding the laundry on the table. Sweet Bridget, would she ever leave the kitchen? Finally, after each sock was painstakingly matched and folded, she took the laundry basket and walked out of the kitchen. I peered around the door and watched her walk into the one room I hadn't seen, her son's room. I covered the kitchen in three long strides, remembered to cover my hand with my sleeve so I didn't leave fingerprints, opened the door and left. I closed the door as quietly as I could. I sank down next to the steps and held still. She didn't come rushing out the door looking for me, so I stood up, still invisible, and hurried to the sidewalk. Chapter 10 I dropped my invisibility spell just as I turned the corner so I wouldn't appear to the people behind the house, but to people in front of the house, I would look like I'd just turned the corner. I looked toward Kate's car, then looked the other way to cross the street. My heart sank when I saw Palmer's Highlander about a block away. Busted. I crossed the street, hoping that if I pretended not to see him that he wouldn't notice me either. Yeah, that worked about as well as you might expect. I got into the car and scrunched down in my seat. Kate gave me a look. Palmer's car is about a block up the street. We should get out of here before he realizes what we're up to. Did Juliana see you? How did you get out of there? I was about to go knock on the door and see where you were. I'm fine. She's hiding things. Let's get out of here, I said. Kate turned her key in the ignition, but before she could put the car in drive, Palmer's car was parked nose to nose with hers. We were definitely busted. Kate and I shrunk back from the fierceness of Palmer's glare. He spoke slowly, deliberately holding back the anger we could see in his eyes. Follow me. We need to talk, he commanded. We followed him to a park with a duck pond three blocks away. I wanted to enjoy it, but I was too worried about what he was going to say to us. We got out of our cars and followed him to a bench. Sit. 
We sat, and he continued to stand in front of us. The two of you are not qualified for surveillance. He shifted his eyes to look only at me. And you are not qualified for any police work. I wanted to argue that I'd already proved myself on the Thompson case, and that I'd saved Abby from her kidnapper, and that I'd found Trina's killer, but that wasn't going to help. And you, he said, looking at Kate, should know better than to do surveillance without any backup. Kate's eyes flicked to me. Palmer exhaled. No, she doesn't count as backup. He continued to glare at us until finally he said, well, don't you have anything to say for yourselves? I couldn't help myself. Where's your backup? My what? Palmer asked. Your backup. You said Kate shouldn't surveil without backup. You were doing exactly the same thing she was, but you had no backup. Did you? Wow. I didn't know his face could get so red. When you've been at the job for more than 20 seconds, you will be able to use some judgment about who is a threat and who you need to investigate just to be thorough. Obviously, Juliana Gibbons isn't a real threat. I wanted to tell him that if she wasn't a threat, then we weren't in any danger, but instead I pulled out my phone. I wouldn't be so sure about that. He took my phone and said, where did you get these? Juliana Gibbons's house. This is the inside of her bedroom closet door. You were in her house? I nodded. She left her back door unlocked when she brought her kids to school. And where were you? He asked Kate. In the car, watching out for Isabella, she said. He stared at the photo of himself with burned out eyes. I don't understand. Let me see, Kate said. She took the phone from Palmer. Is that you with the burned out eyes? Yes, he said, the anger gone from his voice. Kate sat up straighter. Juliana's the daughter of George Spade, a guy your father put away, who then died in jail. Looks like she's got it in for you. George Spade? How do you know more about him than I do? Kate flashed him a brief smile. I'm a good investigator, and I take care of my partner. He sat on the bench next to Kate. It was nice to have him no longer towering over us. What if she meant to kill me instead of Dan? He asked. I hadn't had time to consider that yet. What if Dan was killed by accident? Bold of her to try it in a crowded restaurant, with people noticing how much she had been flirting with you, Kate said. I don't understand the flirting. Why do that? She obviously hates you, I said. To get me alone to kill me? Then why put a very specific poison in your water? Kate asked. Are you allergic to shellfish? I asked. No. But how would she know that? Not that many people are, so it would be a weird way to try and kill you if she didn't even know if it would work, Kate said. I ran my fingers through my hair. None of this was making any sense. I think we're looking at two different things here. Let's look at what we know. First, Juliana hates Palmer. That much is pretty clear. Second, someone killed Palmer's cousin with a very specific poison that wouldn't have affected Palmer. I think we've got one crime and the beginnings of a second one. Palmer frowned. I think you're right. So we don't know any more than we did yesterday about who killed Dan, and we've accidentally stumbled on someone who hates me. That's not a crime, and in her case, I can see why she's angry at my family. A chilling thought struck me. Okay, so she's angry at your family. Maybe she's decided to take revenge on the whole Palmer clan, saving you for last. Do you have many other family members? Kate asked. I've got my mother, my aunt and uncle, and my grandfather. Do any of them live around here? I asked. No. 
I moved away from them and never looked back. That seemed heartbreakingly sad. For all the aggravation my family gives me, I didn't know how I'd live without being able to see them whenever I wanted to. Still, I should let them know what's going on, he said. Won't Wheeler keep them in the loop? If you tell them and then they tell Wheeler they already knew, Sheil, I didn't know what she'd do, but it wouldn't be good. We still have other suspects to consider too. What about the stuff Dan wanted to talk to you about? You mean the nameless, faceless group of people he was working for that he couldn't tell me anything about? He rubbed his face with his hands. Yeah, that'll be a breeze to investigate. I hate to say it, boss, but I think we need to take a look at your cousin's hotel room. There's no we about it. You need to get to the station before anyone sees you haven't come in yet. Isabella needs to get to the apothecary and keep out of police business. I'll see what I can find in the hotel. Anger flared across my chest. Wait a minute here. Without me, and Kate, you wouldn't know a thing about Juliana. You'd have sat in front of her house while she put away laundry and cleaned her kitchen. She could be coming after you any minute now, and you'd have never known. I think I deserve a little respect for these pictures. These pictures? You mean the ones we can't use in court? The ones that could give me cause to arrest you? You wouldn't dare, Kate said. He blew out a sigh. Not this time. But her luck is going to run out some time, and I won't be able to shield her. Shield me? How had locking me up and holding when he thought I'd killed my neighbor shielded me? I decided not to ask. He was already mad enough at us. So you're going to the hotel? Alone? I asked. He scowled at me. If I said no, would you drop it? I looked at my watch. It was later than I thought, and I needed to get to the apothecary. For now, but only because I need to get to work. But I wasn't going to let him investigate alone without at least a little protection. I touched my amulet and mentally asked Bridget to keep my friends safe until we'd found Dan's killer. Kate stood up. I'll take you and then I'll head into the station. I stood up, but Palmer blocked our way to the car. Listen. I know you want to help. I appreciate that you know I didn't kill my cousin, really, I do. But you have to take a step back and let Wheeler do her job. There's no way the evidence will point to me, and in the end she'll see that. In the meantime, I don't want either of you stumbling over the real killer. That was nice and all, but sometime soon he was going to have to start taking Kate and me seriously as investigators. Promise you'll stick to your own work today. Kate nodded, looking a little sheepish. I'll be at the apothecary until six. No promises for after, though. Chapter 11 Even though I said I wouldn't leave the apartment without Jameson, I didn't have time to pick him up before I went to work. The stakeout didn't count, at least in my mind, because I was with Kate and wasn't expecting any magical problems. What's the worst that could happen in the middle of the day? I unlocked the front door and surveyed my shop. I still had a little shiver of happiness whenever I thought about it being mine. I breathed in the scent of potion ingredients and scented candles, then walked in. I selected a white taper and placed it in the candle holder next to Trina's photo. I rummaged around the drawer under the cash register for matches and lit the candle. It was a bad habit to use magic where customers could see me, and I needed to be more disciplined. Good morning, Trina. I could really use your advice today, I wish you were here. I know, talking to someone who wasn't here was probably not the sanest thing to do, but it made me feel good. After I started brewing the tea of the day, orange blossom and pink peppercorn, I grabbed my feather duster and began to work my way around the shop. When I got to the front door, I turned the sign to the open side and carried on with dusting. 
Ten minutes later, the sun went behind a cloud, and a new customer came into the shop. He was an older man, maybe in his seventies. He stooped forward, and his dark gray suit fell forward, loose on his thin frame. As he walked toward me, I felt a sick, oily magic exuding from him. Perhaps he'd been cursed? His yellowing complexion was definitely not healthy, and I immediately thought through the different potions I had that could help him with jaundice. Good morning. I'm Isabella. How can I help you? He took a slow look around the apothecary and grimaced. I am Harold Wolf. It's far too cheerful in here. I like the look of Hester's shop better. At least there you know you're dealing with someone who knows what she's doing. My eyes widened. I knew he was talking about Hester Johnson and her shop in Sewell. If he knew Hester, he was a witch. I forced a smile on my lips and said, I've been to Hester's, and while she's certainly a great potion maker, we've got a different aesthetic style. Also, I think the dry bat wings hanging from her shelves would drive most of my customers away. He scoffed. Your customers. Silly old people with minor complaints. They have no idea what you can do, do they? I was starting to get worried. Of course not. Did you want something specific today? I need hex oil. I had the impression saying no to him could be dangerous. Hex oil? I don't have any. The room went three shades darker. Then make me some. I. I don't know how, I stammered. He sighed. I was afraid I was going to have to teach you how. Bilberry, valerian, nettles, cayenne, tobacco ashes, and graveyard dirt. We didn't have graveyard dirt in the shop. There was nothing I'd be willing to make that would require it. I took a few steps backward, toward the cash register. I don't have all those ingredients. He took a pouch out of his jacket pocket and threw it at me. Instinctively, I caught it. Graveyard dirt from the grave of H. H. Holmes. That should be good enough for you. I dropped the pouch. Where were my customers? I usually had at least a few people in the shop by now. I shook my head. He took a step toward me. I wanted to rush into the office and lock him out, but my feet were rooted to the floor magically rooted to the floor. How had he cast a spell on me, and I hadn't felt it? This is exactly what Eunice said could happen to me. Let me go. He laughed, his yellow teeth barely visible in the dim light. Only good girls get released from my spell. He raised his hand and then slowly lowered it. I felt my knees bending as I involuntarily bent down toward the pouch of dirt. I wanted to resist, but couldn't. When my hand touched the ground, he made it reach forward until it touched the pouch. You see that I can do anything I want to you. Anything. So you need to reconsider. I felt my resolve crack, and I was about to say yes, I would make the hex oil for him when Trina's candle flared and distracted him. His control over me slipped and I slammed my mental wards down hard. I grabbed my amulet and stood up. For the last time, no. Now get out of my shop. He didn't move as he tried to regain control over me. My mental wards were enhanced with power from the bishop amulet, and I could feel his spell sliding over the protection they gave me. There was no way for him to cast a spell on me now. Outside, bolts of lightning streaked across the sky that had been sunny before he opened my door. One bolt slammed onto the road in front of my shop, and I was momentarily blinded by its brightness. I blinked, and he was standing very close to me. I'll be back, and there won't be anything you can do to resist me then. He snapped his fingers and vanished. The light outside and in my shop returned to normal daylight. I didn't move. Had he used an invisibility spell, 
or had he teleported himself away? I took two steps backward, then two more, then turned and ran into the office. I slammed the door closed and locked it. Not that locking the door would do much good if he could pop in and out of any space. With shaking hands, I lifted the receiver, then let it drop. There was no one I could call. If word got out about this, Eunice would use it as an excuse to take the amulet from me. I needed the amulet, without it, I never would have been able to resist him. I had to handle this on my own. I lowered myself into the chair, but didn't allow myself to relax. I couldn't be sure he was gone yet. A few minutes later, I heard the door chimes. Isabella? Doll, are you here? Mrs. Newcomb called out. Her voice broke me out of my thoughts. I had to get back out to my customers, if only to make sure they weren't harmed by Harold Wolf. I unlocked the door, plastered a smile on my face, and walked out. Good morning. How are you? I asked. She gave me a funny look and grabbed me in a big hug. I was so worried about you. Did you see the lightning? You almost got hit by it. I looked past her shoulder and saw a smoking hole in the road. Part of me thought the lightning wasn't real, but it appeared he could call down lightning. My heart sank. He was much stronger than I thought he was, and if he was coming back, I'd need a plan. I pulled myself away from Mrs. Newcomb. I thought I heard something, but I was so busy in the office I didn't come out to investigate. A police cruiser screeched to a stop outside. Officer Papatonis jumped out, opened his trunk, and began putting traffic cones on the road to guide cars away from the hole. Oh, good. They'll take care of it now, Mrs. Newcomb said. She looked back at me. You don't look so hot, sugar. What's wrong? That could have been the shop, I said. Wolf could have hit my shop if he'd wanted to. He could hit it any time he felt like it. Mrs. Newcomb poured a mug of tea and handed it to me. Drink this, you'll feel better. Numbly, I took the tea and drank. By the time I was half done with the mug, I was coming back to myself. I shook my head to clear my focus. Thank you for checking on me. I was on my way here anyway. But you know, it was the weirdest thing. I wanted to pick up more lavender bubble bath, but somehow I turned around and was halfway home again before I realized I didn't get it. I think my age is catching up with me. So I turned around to come back, and that's when I saw the lightning. It was all over the sky, but only one bolt hit the ground, right outside. If there was one thing I knew about Mrs. Newcomb, it was that age was not catching up with her. She was sharp as a tack and didn't forget why she was out for errands. Had Wolf kept all my customers from even walking down the street? Had he kept everyone from walking down the street? I tried to think back. Had I seen any cars on the road while we were talking? I couldn't remember. Not a problem. I pulled a bottle off the shelf for her. Can I get you anything else? Not today. But promise me you'll take it easy. I still don't like how pale you are. I rang up her order. I promise. You have a good day, now. She left, and I went out to see Papa Tony's. Officer, nice to see you again. He looked up from the cones he was rearranging. Miss Proctor? Yes. This is my business. Any idea what happened out here? I should probably ask you that. What did you see? It's not like I could tell him a bad man threw a lightning bolt on the road just before he vanished. Not much. It got really dark and then there was a bunch of lightning, then it got light again. Maybe just a freak summer storm? Papa Tony's nodded. Could be, but usually you can follow the path of a storm. 
This one appeared here, then seemed to vanish. Did anyone else see what happened? That's the thing. Kate's been taking statements, and so far, she says she can't find anyone who saw what happened. No one was outside, and the shop owners were either in their back room or office, or somehow saw nothing. Wolf had controlled the whole street. He'd taken control of everyone on and around a street for several blocks at least, and somehow, with the help of my amulet and Trina's candle, I was able to fend him off. I plastered on the best fake smile I was capable of. I wish I could help, but I didn't see anything either. I've got to get back inside. I rushed into the apothecary before he could see me trembling. I was no match for Wolf. Chapter 12 I spent the day walking on eggshells, jumping at every noise. About an hour after I talked to Papatoni's, I finally collected myself and started to strategize. Making a hex oil for anyone was out of the question, and as I was leafing through the file cabinet that held many of the apothecary's formulations, I realized Trina had already formulated the kind of potion I needed. Just before she died, she was also being pressured to make potions, possibly by Wolf. She had come up with a series of potions that would do more harm than good to the user. Those were very dangerous, so I kept her notes on them in the safe. I pulled out the folder and flipped through them, looking for one that would at least have the outward appearance of hex oil. I chose the anti-hex potion, which drove evil away from the recipient and toward the user. I figured if Wolf had someone who could determine whether the potion was a fraud, it would be easier to make it themselves. I was probably safe with the substitution. In the prep room, I relaxed as I started the process of making the potion. I ground up the black peppercorns and added them to the almond oil I was gently warming on a hot plate. I added iron filings, milkweed, and squid ink. The process soothed me, and I would have called it a good afternoon if I hadn't been working to prevent evil. I much preferred to augment good. After the oil had warmed for an hour, I strained it and poured it into an ornate cut glass bottle. I took a moment to center myself and gather my will. I had to be careful with my intentions. Wishing harm on someone was dangerous. I poured all my focus into my desire for Wolf to be unable to do harm to others. Then I stoppered it and poured sealing wax over the cork. Success! Once I knew what I was going to do, I felt much more in control of the situation. I started the hay fever potion I knew my customers would need soon and then burned the ingredients the hex potion required, one by one, outside in the fresh air. Wolf hadn't taken the grave dirt with him, so I opened the pouch and dumped the dirt down the sewer. I burned the bag and buried the ashes along with the ashes of the rest of the ingredients behind the greenhouse. Finally, I dumped all the almond oil I had down the drain and ran hot water to wash it all away. I didn't like the waste of materials, but if he was somehow able to compel me to make the potion, this would be one more stumbling block for him. My sense of calm started to erode at 5.30. I expected him at any moment, and now that the evening traffic was picking up, I was jumping at every noise and car horn again. I made more tea and tried to meditate my way to inner peace. Inner peace was nowhere to be found, perhaps it was hiding from the evil witch who would be coming to my shop any minute now. I held on to my amulet for dear life and hoped Bridget would protect me. At quarter of six, I felt the same sick, greasy wave of magic roll over me. The shop darkened, and I braced for Wolf to appear. He walked through the door, with another man behind him, walking a subservient four steps behind. Although the other man was taller than Wolf, he seemed to be in his shadow. Once the door closed, the second man looked at me, and I gasped at the cruelty I saw in his eyes. Wolf had brought muscle with him. The man who could call down thunderbolts to my street thought he needed someone stronger or crueler than himself to make sure I behaved. I gulped as another wave of evil magic tried to grab hold of me. The amulet glowed and lit my hand up. Here for your potion? I asked, 
trying to sound nonchalant but utterly failing when my voice cracked. I flipped my eyes to the counter where I had placed the oil in an ostentatiously large glass bottle. I didn't dare take my eyes off the two men any more than I needed to. Wolf raised his hand and the bottle levitated to him. He peered at the oil, shook the bottle, but didn't open it. It looks a bit dark. Bats! Think, Isabella, think. I noticed that. It was fine until I added the dirt. Did you know the archaeologists who dug up Holmes's grave were worried about contracting tuberculosis? I suspect the contamination of the dirt is what darkened the oil. He didn't look like he believed me. He turned to his companion, but before he could issue any commands, I said, Why me? His lips tightened as he looked back at me. I guess no one liked to be interrupted. What? Why me? Why would you bother to come here for an oil that I am sure Hester has in her apothecary? Wouldn't it be a lot easier to get it from her than to waste your day intimidating me? That trick with the lightning bolt was pretty amazing, but I imagine it must have taken some effort. I shut up before I really stuck my foot in my mouth. I don't need the oil, he said. What? I didn't understand. Do you think the fraternity doesn't have its own potions witches? Honestly, girl, how naive are you? Then why bother? I felt a new magic emanating from Wolf's companion, dagger-like and trying to chip away at my defenses. He was making stabbing motions in the air and had a maniacal grin as he tried to find my weaknesses. I rubbed my thumb across the amulet and the motion of my fingers allowed some of its light to escape. Wolf's companion took a step back, but didn't stop attacking me. They had been here just a few minutes, and already I felt as though I was weakening. I needed to get them out of here before Mr. Stabby got in a lucky blow. I don't need your hex oil. All I need is a hold over you. Now that you've made me something, I own you. He'd probably be right if I'd made him the oil he wanted. We're at the beginning of a new age of witchcraft, an age where we no longer fear those without magic. Soon we'll be able to proudly proclaim who we are without fear. Witches who align themselves with the fraternity will be among those who reap the rewards. Those who don't, well, they'll be the first to be executed. Your friends and family are first on my list if you don't join us. Cracks were starting to form in my protection, and I could barely pay attention to what he was saying. Mr. Stabby giggled with delight as he continued to assault me. You've got what you came for, you can go now, I rasped. Oh no, we're not done with you yet, Wolf said menacingly. And then I heard the most beautiful sound. My door chimes. I looked to the door, and Palmer walked in. He looked confused and walked back out. Thank Bridget for that. I wouldn't be able to live with the guilt if he was hurt. Once outside, he turned around and entered the shop again. This time, there was no confusion on his face. We're closed, I said. As he walked further into the gloom of my shop, a faint glow became visible around him. Seriously, Palmer, come back tomorrow. He smiled at the two men, and Mr. Stabby brought his hands down, releasing his assault on me. You heard the lady. She's closed. I'm just here to drive her home. Wolf turned to Palmer. We weren't done with our business. Palmer's forehead broke out in a sheen of sweat. I lifted two fingers off my amulet, willing the light to bolster the protection spell I'd put on him at the duck pond. Wolf flinched as the light hit his back. The room darkened, and I heard the rumbling of thunder outside. I can do it again, and this time I won't spare the shop, he said menacingly. Look, you've got what you came for. Why don't you just go? Palmer's glow intensified. Do you protect all your pets? Wolf asked me. 
My cat doesn't need protection, I said, hoping Palmer wouldn't realize Wolf was talking about him. Palmer stepped forward and grabbed my hand. His glow encircled me, and for the first time, I felt the strength of the protection spell I'd laid on him. Time to go, the weather's changing, and we should get you home before it starts to rain. What in the world was he talking about? It didn't matter, and I followed him as he practically dragged me to the door. Gentlemen? Behind Wolf, Mr. Stabby dealt me one more wild blow, but it bounced off, instead of having to shore up my defenses in that area, I barely felt it. Fine. But we will return, whenever we need your services again. They walked out of the store, and the light returned to normal. Keys? Palmer asked. In the office. Without letting go of each other's hands, we walked into the office, got the keys and locked up the shop. As much as I enjoyed holding Palmer's hand, this wasn't the way I wanted it to be. Once we were seated in his car, he locked the doors and turned to me. What was that? I had a tough choice to make right now, and only a moment to decide what to do. I could tell Palmer the truth, but I knew he wasn't ready for it. Sure, he was a good guy, but the realities of my life could strain any relationship. I could lie, but he was good at seeing through me. Obfuscate it was, then. What do you mean? He looked exasperated. I mean what was going on in there? You could cut the tension with a knife when I walked in. Oh. I hadn't noticed. What was in the glass jar the old guy had? There was a question I could answer. It was an oil for changing luck. He squinted at me. I thought you didn't make things that tampered with luck. Usually I don't. This was a special case. Time to change the subject. Did you want something from the apothecary? We can go back in and get whatever you need. I don't need anything, he said. Then why did you stop in? I don't know. I was driving home and felt like I really needed to talk to you. Did you want to talk about the case? I asked. He laughed. Not tonight. Suddenly I'm feeling wiped out. I'm going to drop you off and head home for an early night. That sounded fine by me. He started the car and pulled out onto the road, avoiding the pothole created by the magically summoned lightning bolt. Are they coming back tomorrow? He asked. I'd closed my eyes and had almost drifted off to sleep. My battle with Mr. Stabby had drained me. Those two guys? I don't know. I hope not. I didn't like the looks of them. I think you should send them to another apothecary. If he only knew why they picked me. At my apartment, Palmer walked me to my door and took a quick look in every room. Make sure you keep the alarm on. I nodded. And call me if anything happens tonight. I don't trust those guys. I put my hand on his arm. It's okay. They don't know where I live. As he left my apartment, I heard thunder rumbling in the sky and thought they just might. Chapter 13 With no roommate, my apartment seemed large and empty. I didn't like it that Abby was gone, and Jameson wasn't quite the same. I mean, obviously, because he's a 200-year-old magical cat, but more because he wasn't so much fun. I wished he'd lighten up a bit, have some fun and lay off the constant training and sarcasm. He made me appreciate Grandma and what now seemed like her very relaxed training schedule. I was pouring myself a glass of iced rosehip tea and started to make toast for breakfast when Jameson hissed in the living room. Palmer? I asked. You don't need him. By the time I'm done with you, you'll be better at everything he does. Why do you hate him so much? You've heard of the witch trials? I frowned at him for asking a question he knew the answer to. 
Even non-witches knew all about them. The clergy and what would become the police were responsible for killing our kind. I hate them both. I hadn't realized he hated the clergy. Then again, my family didn't go to church, or synagogue, or mosque, or any other religious building. When you say our kind, do you mean familiars, or witches in general? He jumped up on the kitchen counter so he could look me in the eyes. Great, I had a lecture coming on, but maybe I could head it off at the pass. I know witches and familiars both use magic and are equally despised by people inclined to hate anything different. What I meant was, were familiars also persecuted? Only those who didn't run away fast enough. Oh. I imagined hunts for familiars, the whole town trying to capture a cat, or a mouse, or a rabbit, just for the crime of being owned by a witch. Sure, they were all so magical, but there was no way the rest of the town could know that. It was guilt by association. I didn't know that. I'm sorry. Palmer's knock on the door brought our conversation to a halt. I opened the door and pretended to be surprised to see him. Jameson, of course, had run into his room. I stepped aside and let Palmer into my apartment. He was dressed in a suit, so he was on his way to work. Good morning. Did we have plans? I asked. He looked a little sheepish. Not exactly. I wanted to check in and make sure those two guys didn't bother you last night. He was holding a bag from the fancy tart and a tray with two hot cups. Is one of those for me? I asked, pointing at the cups. I didn't know what you wanted, but Omar said not to worry, because he knew what you liked. This was good news. Omar did know and I expected there was either a bear claw or an eclair in my future. Do you want to join me? Let's sit at the table. I took two plates out of the kitchen cabinet. Once I joined him at the table, he handed me an eclair. The day was turning into a good one. I took a sip of my coffee to find it was a mocha latte. A very good day. Thank you. I appreciate you stopping by, and breakfast is an added bonus. He took a plain croissant out of the bag for himself. Interesting. Now I knew what I could bring him for breakfast some morning when I needed a favor. Did you have any trouble last night? He asked. My mouth was full, so I shook my head. Good. They worried me. You were worried? That doesn't seem like you. He set his croissant down. I know. And that made me more worried. I had a feeling, like I was out of my depth, and they could do whatever they wanted to me without even trying very hard. That must have been difficult for him. Palmer wasn't a guy with a lot of swagger, but he's calmly confident. He could walk into any room, any situation, and know he could handle whatever might happen. He definitely couldn't handle Wolf and Mr. Stabby, though. The only surprise to me was that he realized it on his own. I'd also like to drive you to work and give the apothecary a quick search to make sure you'll be safe. I smiled. I had planned to examine the shop thoroughly before I even entered the building. I couldn't trust those two even if they thought they had the right oil. I'm sure I'll be just fine. Honestly, you don't need to worry about me so much. Apothecaries attract their fair share of strange people, and it's not that hard to get rid of them. And, since it's so early, I thought maybe you'd like to come with me to take a look at Dan's hotel room. I picked up our dirty plates and put them in the kitchen. You didn't go yesterday? He shook his head. While he didn't say Kate and I were right for telling him he needed backup, he'd followed our advice anyway. I decided to take that small victory. Yeah, I'd love to. You can show me how a detective looks for evidence. He frowned. I'm not sure that's a good plan. If I do that, 
you'll think you're one step closer to being able to investigate anything you want. Palmer, Jameson, and I left the apartment building together. He's an outdoor cat? Palmer asked. I find he scratches the furniture less if I let him out for the day. Palmer pulled a messenger bag out of his trunk once we got to the hotel. I quirked an eyebrow at him, but all he said was, you'll see. I followed him into the lobby of the Portsmouth Hilton and to the bank of elevators. He looked like he knew where he was going, maybe he got the hotel room number from Kate. We rode the elevator to the fifth floor and got out. He looked both ways and then strode to room 538. Keep watch. Give a little cough if anyone comes down the hallway. Okay. But what's going on? I asked. He didn't answer. Instead, he reached into his bag and pulled out a long, flexible metal rod with a curve at one end and a length of paracord tied to the other. He knelt down in front of the door. Holding onto the curved end of the rod and the loose end of the cord, he slowly slid the other end of the rod under the door and pulled gently on the cord as he moved the rod across the width of the door to the door handle. Don't watch me, watch the hall, he whispered. I looked, but no one was coming. I heard a click, and the door opened. He stood up and we walked into his cousin's hotel room. Once the door was closed, I said, how did you do that? He smiled. You can learn anything on YouTube. You slide the rod under the door, get the cord over the handle, pull it, and it's like a person has opened the door from the inside. Clever. He flushed. Yeah, well, like I said, it's YouTube. Let's look around. He handed me a pair of nitro gloves. Put these on before you touch anything. The room was a standard hotel room that was probably the same throughout the country. One queen-size bed, a bureau with coffee maker, small table and chair, and full bathroom. This room was decorated in industrial beiges, best for hiding small stains. What are we looking for? Palmer drew the curtains closed and turned on a light. Anything particularly anything out of place. Nothing seemed out of place in the room. In fact, it looked like Wheeler and her team had taken everything out and housekeeping had already made the room ready for its next guest. I looked in the closet, but it was empty except for three hangers and a luggage stand. I pulled open the drawers of the bureau, but they were also empty. Do the drawers come out? Look for a message on the bottom or back of each one. I pulled each one out, but found nothing, not even tape residue indicating there had once been a message. Nothing. Palmer had lifted the mattress and checked under the bed. I've got nothing either. How about a message written on the mirror that we can only see when it's steamy? I asked. He smiled. Not a bad idea go check. I closed the bathroom door and turned the shower on its hottest setting. While I was waiting, I looked under the counter, picked up the trash barrel, and unrolled the toilet paper. No messages or clues as far as I could see. The mirror was steaming up well, but alas, there were no messages there either. If the cleaning staff were conscientious, it would have been cleaned off already. I took one last look at the bathroom and realized I hadn't checked the toilet. I lifted the cover off the water tank and peeked inside. Nothing but the floating blue ball and water. On the underside of the lid, however, I hit the jackpot. I rested the lid on the toilet seat and pulled off the plastic bag that had been taped to it. I turned the shower off and went to Palmer. I beamed at him. Look what I found. He was on his hands and knees, looking under the chair and table. He lifted his head up and banged it on the table. Shoot! That hurt. Palmer rubbed his head as he stood up and took the bag. Where was it? Taped to the underside of the toilet tank lid. 
He opened the envelope and removed the piece of paper. Color drained from his face. What does it say? He handed me the paper. Steve, I'm sorry I dragged you into my troubles. If you find this, I'm probably dead. Do your best to take care of Marcy and the kids for me. Don't investigate my death. Leave it alone, I don't want you to end up in the plot next to mine for a very long time. I handed the paper back to him. What are we going to do? I'm all for honoring people's last requests, but this seems wrong. He slid the note into his wallet. Very wrong. Let's go talk to the manager. Before we left, I opened my senses just a little to see if I could feel any magic in the room. To my horror, I felt the same oily magic I'd felt coming off Wolf. Bats! Palmer was not ready to tangle with him. Ah, uh, Palmer. Are you sure that's a good idea? I don't know. But I do know I can't take care of his family if I can't look them in the eyes and tell them we caught Dan's killer. I nodded. Let's go. I'm with you all the way. A small smile crept on his lips as he coiled up the door opening rod and stuffed it in his bag. Now that I knew what I was looking for, I could see the coil expanding to the edges of the bag, unrolling as much as it could. In the elevator, Palmer said, gloves, reminding me to take mine off. I jammed them into my pocket because I didn't know if I'd need them again any time soon. At the front desk, Palmer flashed his badge and asked for the manager. The receptionist showed us into the office of Claude Meeks, hotel manager. How can I help you, detective? Meeks asked. I've got some follow-up questions about the Palmer murder. Meeks looked at him for a moment. Any relation? he asked. Palmer lied. It's a common enough name. Never met him before in my life. If you and your associate would like to sit, I'd be happy to assist the police any way I can. Isabella Proctor, I said, holding my hand out to him. We shook and then sat. Did you notice anything about Mr. Palmer? When he checked in, the days he was here? Any visitors he had? Palmer asked. Meeks tapped a few keys on his keyboard. Let's see now, he checked in five days ago and reserved the room for a full week. We will, unfortunately, have to charge him for the entire week he reserved. It wasn't until today that the police released the room and, well, someone has to pay for the time the room was out of use. I stared at him, dumbfounded. Surely your corporation has more empathy for his family than that. He ignored my comment. Looking at his key card usage, it appears he went up to his room right after he checked in. He must have left some time in the evening, most likely to have dinner and then returned at 8.30 that night. He left the room Saturday morning before 9 and never returned. He didn't make any calls on the room phone, but he did charge his dinner in our restaurant to his room. I didn't think that helped us very much at all. Did you ever interact with him personally? Oh no. I never speak to the guests. I'm much too busy here, making sure everything is running smoothly. Do you have security cameras on his floor? Palmer asked. Meeks shook his head. Absolutely not. We find our patrons prefer more discretion. Palmer tried again, how about the lobby? Yes, we do have lobby cameras. Great. Can I see the footage? Meeks looked at him for a moment. Do you have a warrant? I felt defeated. I knew Palmer couldn't have a warrant, he wasn't supposed to be investigating. I believe Detective Wheeler has already showed you our warrant, Palmer said so smoothly I was amazed. He acted like this was the most normal thing in the world and that of course Meeks would want to help us if he could. Detective Wheeler, yes, I think she did. Fine, then. 
He picked up the phone on his desk and dialed a three-digit extension. Perry, come to my office. I've got police here who want to see some camera footage. He hung up the phone. Perry is our head of security. He'll help you find whatever you need. A moment later, a tall man entered the office. Detectives, if you'll follow me. Palmer and I followed Perry down the hall to an office with a wall of monitors showing what was happening from many angles in the lobby, the restaurant, and outside the building. Nice setup, Palmer said. It's not bad. Mostly overkill, though. Nothing exciting ever happens around here. From your lips to God's ears, Palmer said with a chuckle. Perry sat at one of the two desks. What date and time are you looking for? Not really sure. He checked in on Friday, so I'd like to see him in the lobby then. Perry queued up the appropriate time and played the lobby video from the desk angle. He seemed to be alone, although he looked over his shoulder several times during the short transaction. The receptionist was still talking when he grabbed his key from her and stormed off toward the elevators. She frowned for a brief moment before helping the next person in line. Nothing surprising there. Business traveler, one bag, impatient to get to his room. We see this a hundred times a day. Perry moved to stop the video. I'd like to see the next few people who check in, if you don't mind. You can speed the video up. I just want to see if I recognize anyone, Palmer said. Perry sped up the video, and we watched the next several people check in. Three men and four women who seemed to be traveling for business, one family with two small children, and a couple who looked like they were starting their honeymoon, if her veil was any proof. That's fine. How about closer to his room on the fifth floor? Nothing on the floors. Perry pulled up Dan's bill. How about the night he had dinner in the restaurant here? That would be great, I said. Perry queued up the video, and we watched for a few minutes from the perspective of the hostess looking into the bar before Dan walked into the restaurant, alone. He sat at the bar and ordered a shot of what looked like vodka. The bartender brought him a beer a minute later, which he nursed along for about five minutes. I think he was starting to stand up when the video became staticky and then turned to digital snow. What happened? I asked. Video malfunction. We get them once in a while. Let me pull up another angle. We watched Dan from the perspective of the bartender. He had a worried look, and I could see his hand shaking from this angle. He pounded his shot, ordered a beer, and again, when he started to stand up, the video went to snow. What the? Perry muttered. Let me run it to see how long it lasts. The snow lasted a half hour, and by the time the video came back, Dan wasn't at the bar. Any other angles in the restaurant? Palmer asked. One more, from the hall looking in. We watched Dan walk into the restaurant, but couldn't see him in the bar. Let's see if this one is corrupted too, Palmer said. We continued watching, and I caught a flash of a person in the hallway mirror before the tape was corrupted. Can you roll that back and go slow? I think I saw someone in the mirror. Perry did as I asked and stopped the video when Wolf and Mr. Stabby came into view on the mirror. Chapter 14 Palmer stood up abruptly. I think we've got all we need. I stood more slowly. Thanks for your help, Perry. Palmer reached for my arm and hustled me out of Perry's office, down the hallway to the lobby, and out to his car. Once we were both sitting, he glared at me. Talk. I didn't know what to say. I had no idea why Wolf and Mr. Stabby were in the hotel. Were they meeting with Dan? It seemed reasonable they were responsible for the video malfunction. I don't know, I said. Why were the men who were threatening you yesterday meeting with my cousin earlier this week? 
I looked out the window because I couldn't take his angry stare. What do you have to do with the death of my cousin? He asked through clenched teeth. That snapped my attention back to him. Nothing. I swear. A tear rolled down my cheek. I wanted to tell Palmer everything I knew, but I couldn't. I turned to look at him. Is there something you aren't telling me? He asked. I nodded. Does it have to do with your family? I nodded again. Does it have to do with anything illegal? This time I shook my head. No. We don't break the law. That's what the chief said. He handed me a napkin. I'm done thinking you've killed people, thinking you're on the wrong side of the law. But I need you to talk to me, explain what's happening, so I can protect you. I don't need protection, I said. He rubbed his face with his hands. Dan thought that too. At least until he came to see me, and by then it was too late. I needed to get out of his car and walk. I needed to be alone, so I could think about what was going on. I opened my door. I'm going to walk to work. I need to think before I get there. Palmer put a hand on my arm. Please don't. I turned back to him and saw he was worried for me. I can drive you and check out the shop. We don't have to talk, and I don't have to ask you questions. I closed my door. Okay. He pressed the ignition button, and a woman knocked on his window. I jumped at the loud noise, then laughed when I heard the mousy-haired woman speak to Palmer like she knew him. Steve, I thought it was you. Tell me you're investigating. Marcy? What are you doing here? Palmer asked. I'm still the mother of his children, and I need some answers. No one at the station seemed to know where you were, so I decided to start with the obvious and keep an eye out for you. I cleared my throat softly. This is my friend, Isabella Proctor. She's helping me. I'm sorry for your loss, I said. Marcy looked me over and smirked. Since when have murder investigations become dates? Marcy, she's helping me find Dan's killer. Maybe you should try to be nice to her. Fine, she huffed. Have you got any leads? That other detective wouldn't tell me anything. She can't talk about an ongoing case. Maybe if you were his next of kin, but you're not. And that's why I'm here talking to you. Did this Wheeler woman tell you anything? Marcy, I need to drop Isabella off. Why don't we have lunch, and I'll tell you everything I know. Marcy frowned. Meet me at the Crispy Biscuit at noon, and I can walk you through everything that happened that morning. Okay, but you're buying, Marcy said. Palmer nodded, then rolled up his window. Once Marcy stepped away from the car, he put it in gear and drove off. Sorry about that. She can be a little intense. I smiled. No kidding. Intense enough to kill him herself? Palmer thought for a moment. I don't think so. I really don't know why those two guys were seeing Dan whatever reason, it can't be the same as why they came to see me. Not unless Dan was secretly also an herbalist? Palmer laughed. Definitely not. Why would they see Dan and then go to you for the oil they wanted? I am not sure the two events are related. Dan was already dead by the time Wolf first came to see me. And does this oil really work to change people's luck? Palmer asked. I sighed. My explanation was probably going to strain his credulity. No. Not like that. It's complicated. You know how many people believe plants have healing properties? Yeah, like chewing on bark because it has the active ingredient of aspirin. Exactly. 
and billions of dollars have been spent researching rare tropical plants to find how they can help people. It's a huge industry. Anyway, the thing they wanted me to make would harm someone. And how is that not a poison? It's not a physical thing, it's more of a placebo effect. I don't get it. It's hard to explain, but if you think you're going to have bad luck, that's what you tend to see. It's a good thing we were at a stoplight, because Palmer burst out laughing. Why would you have to make anything? Wouldn't anything work as long as it had a label? And there it was. Palmer's inevitable dismissal of my work as a fraud. There's more to it than that, but since you're not an herbalist, it would take too long to explain. I don't know if it really works. I've never made the hex oil he wanted, or anything that would hurt people. Never? Of course not. What kind of person do you think I am? Palmer looked at me. I'm sorry. I don't know how your business works, or what you will and won't make. I certainly don't make things that harm others. But you gave them something last night. It wasn't the oil? I gave him a small smile. It wasn't hex oil. I made them something that looked similar, but I made it so they couldn't harm anyone and that the bad luck they wished on others would come to them instead. He chuckled. They're not going to like that. No, they aren't. I hope they don't figure it out until they leave town and then decide it's too much work to come back. Palmer pulled into a parking spot across the street from the apothecary. When they come back, you have to give them whatever they ask for. I can't do that. It goes against my, my what? I didn't take an oath to do no harm. It violated my personal ethics. My ethical code. I can't make things that will hurt others. Your ethical code won't do you any good if you're dead. These guys aren't fooling around, Isabella. I could tell by looking at them last night. You're right. They're not. What did Dan have, or what did he do, that they were interested in him? Palmer closed his eyes. I have no idea. I thought he had just screwed up on some business deal and finally angered the wrong people. But that doesn't fit with these guys and what they wanted from you. The old guy is Harold Wolf, and I don't know who the other guy is. I call him Mr. Stabby because he kept making stabbing motions at me before you walked in. Mr. Stabby? Listen, I can't control the nicknames my brain comes up with for people. Okay then, Mr. Stabby. Did they say they were coming back? They didn't mention a specific time they were coming back, but they alluded to the idea that I'd have to do whatever they wanted, now that I'd done one bad thing for them. Blackmail? Most likely. And when the person they try to hex. I can't believe I'm even saying this, isn't hexed. What will they do then? I grimaced. They'll definitely come back. We've got to find them before that happens. I did not like the way this sounded. But we don't have any reason to believe they killed Dan. It could just be a coincidence they were in the dining room at the same time. We've definitely got better suspects than them. He frowned. We do, but I bet none of them pan out. My gut tells me it was those two. I looked at my watch. I need to open the apothecary. Okay. Stay close behind me. We crossed the street, and as I unlocked the door, Palmer reached down and pulled a gun out of his ankle holster. Convenient, I commented. Let me go in first. I followed him into the shop, opening my senses to determine if anyone was here. I couldn't feel anyone, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I could still feel the residuals of last night's magic, but I could clear the air with the appropriate candle. Palmer checked the shop, then the greenhouse and then we walked down the alley back to the front door, where Jameson was waiting for us. It looks okay. 
I want you to keep your phone on you at all times and call me if you even think you see Wolf and Stabby. Wolf and Stabby. They sounded like a comedy duo. I promise. I don't want anything to do with them. But like I said, I don't think they'll be back today. I can get Kate to come spend the day here. Don't. That poor woman is going to think she's my permanent bodyguard. I promise I can take care of myself. Krav Mega, remember? How could I forget? You promised to spar with me one day. He left the apothecary, but I noticed he didn't drive off for at least a half an hour. I lit Trina's candle and wished for what seemed like the millionth time that she was there with me. Any time I had no customers, I tried to find Wolf and Stabby on the internet. I didn't expect to have any luck, but it was the only thing I could do to continue investigating. For grins, I looked up Hester's potion shop and, to my surprise, I found it. She listed it as a mail-order-only business and ran it through a post office box in Meredith. Did anyone in Sewell know she was selling to non-witches? I looked through her inventory and decided it was okay. She wasn't listing anything for sale that a person couldn't get in any of a million other places. It was the special order section where she encouraged customers to describe what they needed that worried me. I had no way to know what she'd sell. I resolved to speak to Grandma about this. I called Thea and Delia and asked them to bring lunch. Sure, what do you want? Delia asked. I thought for a moment. Chicken tikka. We'll be there in an hour, she said. True to their word, in an hour my cousins burst through the door of the apothecary with a large brown bag full of Indian food. My stomach growled, it had been a long time since I'd eaten my éclair, and honestly, it wasn't enough to get me through the stressful morning I had. You don't look so great, Delia said after we'd all dished out our lunches. I'm not. I had trouble with a couple guys yesterday. Did you tell Palmer? I'm sure he'd take care of it for you, Delia asked. He actually walked in on some of it and got me out of trouble last night. Like, serious trouble? Delia asked. For goddess sake, Delia. Just let her tell the story, Thea said. This guy Harold Wolf came in and wanted me to make hex oil. He brought me grave dirt from H. H. Holmes's grave. When neither of them seemed to realize who I was talking about, I said, first serial killer in the U.S., raised in New Hampshire. I told him I wouldn't but he was scary. The sky got really dark, and I swear he called a lightning bolt down and made it hit the road out front. Delia's mouth made an O, oh, but she said nothing. Of course, I didn't make hex oil. I made an anti-hex potion instead. It was a recipe from Trina's files, and it's designed to turn back on the user. She created a series of these kinds of potions just before she died. Anyway, Wolf came back just before I closed, and he brought a friend. All the friend did was psychically attack me, and if it wasn't for the amulet, I'd be dead, or worse. It was Thea's turn to look amazed. He might have one, except Palmer walked in. I put a protection spell on him yesterday, and it kept him from being affected by the spell Wolf had put on the area to keep people away. The minute he touched me, it was like his protection was added to mine. At that point, the other guy, who I call Stabby, realized it was no good, and they left with the oil I made. This is too dangerous. You've got to tell the ants, Thea said. I took a bite of chicken and pondered. Could I handle them on my own? I didn't do a good job the night before, and if Palmer hadn't come in, I wasn't sure I'd have made it out of the shop unharmed but calling in the ants? There had to be something else I could do first. Not yet. If I can get more practice in with my amulet, I think I'll be okay. Jameson mewed from his perch in the prep room. Besides, Jameson will help me. 
Thea looked skeptical. I know he's a familiar and all, but is he really strong enough to protect you from someone who has mastered the elements? I wasn't sure about that. Jameson, however, wasn't about to have his good name besmirched. Look outside, he called. We looked out the office window and saw a five-foot-tall tornado form in front of the greenhouse. I had no idea he could do something like that, but I wasn't about to let my cousins know I was as amazed as they were. Does that answer your question? I have got to get me a familiar, Delia whispered. Unfortunately for her, the process of getting a familiar didn't work that way. The animal chose the witch, and, from what I'd learned as a kid, they only chose exceptionally gifted witches. I still couldn't figure out why Jameson had picked me. Sure, I was a lot stronger with the amulet, but I still felt like a normal witch. The tornado dissipated, and Jameson padded into my office. I'll protect her from Wolf and Stabby. You two make sure you don't tip off the ants about what's going on. He walked back out, tail swishing high in the air. I knew he'd be napping for at least an hour, because talking to any witch but me was draining for him. Thea and Delia watched him go, but at least they'd finally gotten most of their reverence for him out of their systems. I didn't think it was good for his already massive ego for them to continue to fawn over him. Chapter 15 The next morning, Jameson woke me with a headbutt. He could talk, he could use his paws to gently shake me awake, but no, I guess he needed to indulge his inner catness and wake me up in the most annoying way possible. Quit it. I mumbled. He banged his forehead on mine again. Okay already, what do you want? I opened my eyes to see his nose an inch from mine. This had better be important. He backed up and sat on my full bladder. I picked him up and set him next to my legs. Kate's outside, he said. Give me a minute. I threw the blankets aside and made my way to the bathroom. What was Kate doing here so early? My seven o'clock alarm hadn't even gone off yet. I washed my hands and face and opened the bathroom door to find Jameson waiting for me. Are you going to let her in? Give me a minute to get dressed. Did she knock? No. She's sitting in the hall, waiting for you to leave. Why in the world would she do that? More importantly, can my cat see through walls? How do you know what she's doing behind a wall that I assume you can't see through? You humans are so easy to figure out. I heard her pacing an hour ago, but she got tired of that and leaned against the wall. She got tired of leaning and slid down to sit on the floor. She hasn't moved since. Okay, I guess you can hear what's going on outside, but how do you know it's Kate? Did you know cats can roll their eyes? I didn't until just then. Not only am I a witch's familiar, I am descended from the great hunting cats of the African savanna. I can sniff out a person from a lot farther away than the hallway. Had I mentioned his ego? He had never let me down, and I'd never caught him saying he could do something that he couldn't. Until I did, I was stuck with his gigantic sense of self-worth. Fine. I'll get dressed and then let her in. I took my time getting dressed, trying to think of a reason I'd be in my hallway at seven in the morning. I'd just taken the trash out the previous evening, I checked my mail when I got home last night, and nothing was coming to mind. It's not like I could tell her my cat knew she was out there. Or could I? I opened the door and saw Kate, sitting with her eyes closed and the travel mug in her hand dangerously close to spilling. Kate? I whispered, hoping Jameson was taking notes on how to wake someone gently. She opened her eyes and jerked her mug upright. I held my hand out to help her up off the floor. I'm sorry, did I startle you? I must have dozed off. Sorry. I smiled. Come on in, I'll make you breakfast. You can cook? she asked. 
Why are you sleeping in my hallway? I didn't mean to fall asleep, but I couldn't help myself. Yes, but why my hallway? Oh, uh. I was supposed to be watching you and then make an excuse to drive you to work and make sure no one was waiting to ambush you. I told Palmer that wasn't necessary. How long have you been here? Kate looked at her watch. Four hours or so. I felt bad for her. It's not like she could tell Palmer no, she wouldn't try to protect me, not without disappointing him, anyway. I'll make a deal with you. The next time he sends you here, you let me know right away, and I'll let you in. You can at least nap on the couch. Kate laughed. I suppose I can do that. He didn't tell me it had to be a secret I was here, and even if he had, that secret's been blown now. My stomach growled. Come on in. I don't suppose you're hungry too, are you? Kate rinsed out her travel mug in the sink. I'd love some breakfast, and maybe more coffee? Coffee is in the freezer. You make a full pot, and I'll make breakfast. How does scrambled eggs and toast sound? Kate grinned at me, and my heart did a little leap. Maybe I'd finally gotten over the mistakes I'd made when we met, and she'd fully forgiven me. Sounds great. I set up the frying pan on the stove, cracked four eggs into a bowl, and beat them with a little water. I added salt, black pepper, and dill. We got to work making breakfast. Jameson, a notorious hater of police, even came into the kitchen. He must have been hungry enough to ignore the fact that Kate was there. I put food in his bowl and gave him fresh water. There you go, sweetie, I said, knowing he'd exact some sort of revenge for calling him anything but Jameson. Although I suppose he'd also take Sir, Your Grace, or My Lord equally as well. Best not to feed his ego, though. Kate finished setting up the coffee and turned to me. Can I help? I poured the eggs into the frying pan. You can put the bread in the toaster oven, then I think we just need to set the table. Kate pulled plates and silverware out of the cabinets. The eggs smell delicious. It's the dill. You'll love them. We sat at the dining table to eat, and I had a flash of Kate as my new roommate. I shook my head. That would never work. Since Abby had moved out, I felt more at ease in the apartment, not worrying about what she might run across, or what kind of clues she might piece together to realize I was a witch. I'd never stand a chance with Kate, she'd notice something, and it wouldn't be long before I had to tell her the truth. I took a bite of eggs to mask the sadness creeping across my face. As many friends as I seemed to have, as good as my relationships were with my customers, I was lonely. You were right, these are amazing. Kate said. I looked up and smiled at her. It wouldn't do to ignore what little bits of friendship I had. Thanks. The toast is, uh, toasty as well. We both laughed and my heart broke a bit more. Why did Palmer want you here? I asked after a big sip of coffee. He said there were some guys making trouble for you. He thought a police presence would be enough to keep them away. I frowned. But you're not even in uniform. Don't need a uniform, I've got my badge and gun. Besides, it's my day off, and I thought we could do a little more investigating before you had to open the apothecary. Excellent. I was thinking I'd like to go back to the crispy biscuit and try to remember anything else that happened. I thought if I was there, I might be able to remember more. Kate looked at her empty plate. We probably shouldn't have had breakfast here, then. I grinned. Second breakfast is always an option, even if we aren't hobbits. I looked at my watch. I've got to be at the shop in two hours, so we've got plenty of time for a little light detective work. Kate cleared the table while I grabbed my phone and keys. Ready? 
I asked. Absolutely. Jameson followed us out the door. Do you let your cat out for the day? Kate asked. If the weather is good, yes. I suspect he gets bored indoors all day, and I don't want him scratching everything up. You could always have him declawed, she suggested. Jameson hissed. It's almost like he knew what I said, Kate said with a laugh. I shook my head. His former owner didn't, so I'm not going to either. I was sure he'd never allow it, either. Once we got outside, Jameson ran off, chasing a chipmunk up a tree. The drive to the crispy biscuit took just a few minutes in Kate's car. Emma greeted us at the door. Hey, Isabella. Two for breakfast? Emma, do you remember Officer Stanton? Emma looked at Kate. Of course, we talked a few days ago. Kate nodded. Isabella wants to sit at the same booth and see if she can remember anything else from that morning. Is that possible? Emma looked to the dining room. You're in luck, that booth is empty. She picked up two menus and led us into the dining room. Once we sat and Emma took our drink orders, coffee for Kate and orange juice for me, Kate asked, can you join us for a few minutes? I'd like to hear your recollection of the day as well. Emma surveyed the dining room. Give me a few minutes to get your drinks and tell Liz I'm taking a break. I looked out at the room, trying to remember what I'd seen that morning with Mina. Okay, here's what happened. I walked in and saw Mina sitting here, where you are. She was facing Palmer. We talked and laughed. At one point Juliana walked past the table with her sons, who were running in the aisle. I closed my eyes to think more. That was before Dan died. I saw Emma almost fall over, and without really thinking, I used a tiny bit of magic to help her stay upright. She didn't need to spill an entire tray of drinks over herself on such a busy morning. Just before Dan started to have problems, I remember Emma almost fell. It was the most spectacular save I'd ever seen. I was sure she was going to drop her entire tray. I opened my eyes and saw Kate pursing her lips. Did anyone run into her or get in her way? She asked. No. There was no one near her. That didn't seem right. Emma had been working at the biscuit since she was old enough to have a job. She could easily handle a tray of drinks, even if there were people in her way. Had something happened I didn't see? And then what happened? Then I heard banging on a table behind me. I turned to look and saw Palmer sitting with his cousin, though I didn't know who it was then. Okay, hold that image. Was there anyone near them? The biscuit had been packed that morning. I hadn't noticed anyone who seemed out of place, though. All the tables in that section were full. By the time I turned around to see what the noise was, everyone else was staring at Dan. Once he got out of the booth, he was looking pretty bad, and people moved further away from him. Only Palmer got up and tried to help. Did you see anyone leaving? By the time it was clear Dan was in trouble, lots of people were leaving. Maybe Emma can help with the names of customers, but I was too focused on Palmer and Dan at that point. I looked behind me at the table Dan had died next to. Kate put her hand on mine. Hey, it's not your fault. There was nothing you could have done to save him, even if you were a doctor. I turned to her and blinked my tears back. She'd read my mind, and she was right. By the time I realized what was happening, I doubted anything less than the strongest possible magic could have brought Dan back. I know. I still feel helpless, you know. I heal people, and it's hard to stand by and watch someone die. It is, Kate said. I've had to do it on the job. Kate's phone rang, disrupting our bonding moment. Yeah, right. 
I'll be right in. She hung up her phone and said, Wheeler wants to talk to me. Not sure what about, but I doubt it will be good. Can you talk to Emma on your own and then report back? You want me to question a witness? She's your friend, you'll know if she's telling the truth or not. Besides, you're good at getting people to talk. Kate stood up, left a $5 bill on the table and strode out. I sat at the table alone and wondered if I would have been able to save Dan if I'd thought about using the amulet. It seemed to know what I wanted and helped me when I needed, but would it have then? I was filled with regret that I'd never know. Emma brought our drinks to the table and slid into the booth across from me. Officer Stanton had to leave? She got a call and left me to ask you questions. Did you notice anything strange with Palmer or his cousin that morning? Emma thought for a moment. No. They were having an intense discussion, but that happens sometimes. People go to restaurants to have difficult conversations to ensure the other party doesn't freak out. I nodded. Did anyone approach them? Other than that woman I told you about, and the restaurant staff? No. I didn't see anyone. Okay, now tell me about that weird fall you almost had. That's not like you. She laughed. I'd forgotten about that. Sometimes you just have an off day. That must have been what happened. Bear with me for a minute, okay? Did you hear or feel anything strange before you stumbled? She bit her lip. I didn't mention it to the police, because I was sure they'd never believe me, but I swear it felt like someone banged into my shoulder. Interesting. Banged into you how? Like when someone wants to get your attention in a high school hallway, they just bang their shoulder into yours and keep walking. Okay, so it felt like someone bumped into you as they were walking the other way? Emma nodded. Yes, but there wasn't anyone there. And just before I started falling, I felt like there was a wall behind me, holding me up. I don't know what was up with me, maybe it was a dizzy spell or something. Do you get dizzy spells? No. Not usually. That was the first one. Is there anything else you didn't tell the police? Seriously, anything, you know I don't judge. I know you don't. But there isn't anything else. I just had a weird turn for a second and then carried on as usual for the rest of the day. Emma, a voice called from the kitchen. She looked at her watch. Is there anything else? My break is up. No, we're all good here. Thanks. If you think of anything, give me a call. She stood up and left my bill on the table. Sure thing. I wasn't ready to leave yet. It sounded to me like she accidentally ran into someone who had cast an invisibility spell on themselves. I closed my eyes and opened my senses to the restaurant. I felt for the tiny trace of my spell that kept Emma from falling over. Once I found it, I expanded to find any other magical traces and found the tiniest thread of someone else using magic in the biscuit that day. Chapter 16 I grasped my amulet and focused on the faint trace. There were spots between Palmer's table and the door that were brighter, and I assumed that was where the witch crossed their path going back out of the restaurant. I followed the bright dots outside and started walking down the sidewalk. It's rude to ignore your familiar, I heard Jameson say. I turned around and looked down. Jameson was standing behind me. I had choices to make here. I didn't want to supply rumors for the gossip network, so I couldn't just walk and talk to my cat. I could pull out my cell phone and pretend I was talking to someone else, leaving Jameson to decide whether he wanted to sound like a meowing cat or speak just in my mind. Then again, I could practice speaking in his mind without yelling. That was definitely the better option. I didn't see you, sorry. He winced. 
You can think a little softer. I'm generally not far from wherever you are. You're not experienced enough to be let out on your own yet. Ha! At least my family thinks I am. Do they really? I frowned. He might have a good point there. I'm following a trail of very faint and seemingly ugly magic. Can you see it? Jameson said, I can see all the paths of magic left here. Which one are you talking about? Well. I could barely feel one, and he could see who knows how many. It's from Saturday, and it feels bad. I don't know how else to describe it because I can barely feel it, even with the amulet. I think I know which one you mean. Follow me and let me know if I veer off the trail you're following. We walked for twelve blocks, past Proctor House, before I looked at my watch. I needed to be to work in an hour. Do you have any idea where the trail ends? No. But not any time soon. Maybe we should go back and borrow the Kia. I don't know if you can follow the trail in a car, though. Jameson snorted aloud. Of course I can. We walked back to Proctor House and let ourselves into the kitchen. Aunt Nadia and my mother were cleaning up after breakfast, and Grandma was drinking tea at the table. Isabella, how nice to see you, my mother said as she hugged me. Hi, Mom. I need to borrow the Kia. She looked surprised. I'd never asked to borrow the car, even though after my highly irregular evening at the DMV, I was a licensed driver. Really? Yeah. Jameson and I are, too late, I realized I probably shouldn't blab about what we were doing. My mother's happy, cheerful smile was replaced with a scowl. You and Jameson are doing what, exactly? Aunt Nadia put away the bowl she was holding and began to poach a slice of salmon for Jameson. No one had even offered me a mug of tea. She and the cat are investigating. Do you even need to ask anymore? I can't believe Detective Palmer wants you to get involved with a murder, my mother said. Well, Mom, it's like this. He's not allowed to investigate, but he is. Kate's not allowed to investigate, but she is. I'm never allowed to investigate, but that hasn't stopped me yet. I know magic is involved here, and the two of them are completely unprepared for that. If I can keep an eye on them and the investigation, maybe I'll be there when they need me. I can't just sit back and watch my friends walk into a danger they don't even know exists. And that's commendable, Grandma said. While you're tasked with looking out for witches with the amulet, it's important not to let non-witches go by the wayside, particularly your friends. My mother shot her a look. That's not what you said when we were younger. Aunt Nadia set a plate of cooked salmon on the kitchen table in front of Jameson. Let it cool a bit first. I gave up and made myself a mug of tea. When you were younger, you didn't have an amulet. Things are different for Isabella now. The track of her life has taken a big swerve, and all we can do is ride along and support her mission. So if she says she and her familiar need a car, then all we need to do is ask if she needs gas money or someone to go with her, Grandma said. My mother sat at the table and put her head in her hands. I know. And you must have an idea how I feel, or you wouldn't have stressed how much I shouldn't accept an amulet when I was younger. Grandma put her hand on my mother's arm. I know, Michelle, it's hard. It's hard to watch your daughter grow up. It's hard to see her setting out on a path you wouldn't have chosen for her. My mother sniffled once and put her hands down. She took a deep breath and said, Thanks, Mom. She stood up and walked back to the sink to wash more dishes. But before she put her hands in the soapy water, I gave her a hug. I'll be absolutely as careful as I can be. And I've got Jameson, so you don't need to worry too much about my safety. He's pretty amazing, and I doubt he'd let anything happen to me. 
I'm not sure, my mother trailed off. Not sure about what? I asked. Never mind. It wasn't a good thought. I'm sure you're right and Jameson has learned his lesson about protecting his witch. It was getting late and we could be at this all day. I'm going to check with Thea and Delia about the car. I don't have a lot of time this morning. Before anyone could drag me back into a conversation, I hustled out the kitchen door to the dining room and up the stairs to the second floor bedrooms. Delia was in her room, finishing up her makeup. Hey, I have a favor to ask, I said. Good morning to you too. What do you need? I need the car. Jameson and I found a clue, but we've got to follow it around town. I've got to get to work in just over an hour, so I've got to get a move on. Thea joined us and said, sure. We don't need it today. One condition, Delia said. I get to come with you. I smiled. You got it. Assuming Jameson says it's okay. Delia's eyes lit up. You brought him? Did my mother make him the salmon she bought yesterday? I nodded. Yeah. He doesn't understand why my budget doesn't stretch to daily fresh fish for him. She's going to spoil him, and at some point, he'll leave me for her. Delia put down her mascara and took one last look at herself in the lighted mirror. Okay, I'm ready to go. Yeah, no problem. I'll just stay here. Thea said. Don't complain. You got to go to Sewell while I stayed behind to open the office. It's my turn now. The conversation in the kitchen had died by the time we returned. Jameson had finished his salmon as well. Time to go, I said. Jameson hopped down off his chair and went outside through the cat door. I promise we'll be careful, I reassured my mother. I've got Jameson and Delia with me. What could go wrong? Delia's spell work was still not good, so there was a chance something surprising could happen, but that was a chance we were going to have to take. Once we were outside, Delia said, you drive. You need the practice. I rolled my eyes. Do not. I'm a perfectly fine driver. Yeah, right. Tell me again about your driving exam? I was beginning to regret telling my cousins about the way Palmer had arranged for me to get my driver's license. He'd called in a favor from a buddy, and I guess my test was the time it took me to drive his car from my apartment to the DMV. Palmer was very exacting about how I drove. If he thinks I'm a good driver, that should be enough for anyone. We climbed into the car, and Jameson hopped up on Delia's lap. Go back the way we came, and I'll let you know where to turn, Jameson commanded. You got it, boss, I said. I pressed the ignition and put the car into drive. So far, so good, except that I had to back out of the driveway. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Delia smirk, but wisely, she didn't say anything. We drove down Market Street to Islington Street, and finally Jameson said, pull in here. I parked the car in the Biosolutions parking lot. Are you sure? The trail goes to the front door. I looked at Delia and Jameson. So what do we do? Did we come here to stop outside and just look, or did we come here to follow the trail wherever it led? Jameson asked. I've never had a pep talk that somehow also seemed to be disappointed in me as well. But you can't go in. Delia started pulling things out of her purse. He can hide in here. Finally, a reason to carry a purse. Smuggling my cat into buildings. I may have to buy one sometime soon. Delia gently put Jameson into her bag. Will you be able to lead us if I zip you in here? She asked. I don't use my eyes to follow the trail. I'll communicate with Isabella alone, we don't need anyone hearing me. 
I took a deep breath and blew it out. Time to fake boldness and see where it would get me. Did I have a plan? Nope. Did Delia have a plan? Not that she told me. We strode with all the bravado we could muster across the parking lot and into the building. Stop here, Jameson commanded as we reached the front reception area. The woman in front of us knows something. Okay. Can you give me any more to go on? I asked. Jameson had nothing to say. Sitting at the large curved reception desk was a tall blonde woman in her mid-thirties. She wore a white blouse and red glasses that matched her nail polish. Good morning. Can I help you? She asked. My resolve and bravado evaporated, and all I could think was that we were going to get caught. She'd call the police and Palmer would show up, ready to deliver his Don't Investigate Murders lecture to me again. Or even worse, Wheeler would come and then we'd be in big trouble. Uh, hi. Yes. I was wondering if, and I wasn't sure what to say after that. What my friend and I were wondering is if there are any jobs available here at BioSolutions. We've just graduated from college and are looking for work. You know how it is, Delia said. The trail turns back around at this desk, so she's the one, Jameson said. The woman looked us up and down. Neither of us was dressed for an interview. Not that I can recall, she said. We usually hire in May and December, when people graduate from college. When I say we graduated, I guess I meant we've almost graduated. We wanted to get a head start on the job search, Delia said. I rolled my eyes. Nothing to do but carry on with what she said. My area of interest is in allergies, particularly life-threatening ones. For example, did you hear about the guy who died over the weekend downtown? I have a friend who was there, and she said it looked like anaphylactic shock. I took a moment to look wistful. If I could be a part of the team that cured food allergies like that, I'd feel like I'd done something useful with my life. Her eyes squinted at me as she frowned. I'm sorry. As I said, we don't have any openings right now. If you'd like to leave your resumes, I can pass them on to HR. Resumes. I knew we forgot something. We'll be back this afternoon with them, Delia said. I grabbed her arm before she said anything else and pulled her toward the door. Once we were outside, we made a beeline for the Kia. Only after we'd gotten into the car did we start to laugh. I'm not sure anything was actually funny, but it was a good way to relieve our collective tension. If you could let me out of the bag, Jameson said. His haughty tone made me laugh even harder as I gestured to the bag, hoping Delia would realize what I wanted. She did, and she let him out. Jameson shuddered and shook his fur. Did you ever consider washing that bag? There's hair and dust inside it. I snorted with laughter and then decided I needed to get a hold of myself. If I stopped laughing, maybe Delia would too. After a couple deep breaths and a few thoughts of Palmer's cousin, I was done laughing. I've got nothing. She just seemed annoyed with us, which wouldn't have happened if Delia hadn't come up with such a stupid story, I said. Stupid story? Saying anything is better than standing there like an idiot. If I didn't jump in, that's what we would have wound up doing, Delia said. Children, stop squabbling, Jameson cautioned. I hated it when he thought I was acting like a child. Fine. Did you get anything? I asked him. Yes. She knows the murderer, and perhaps she helped in some small way. How do you know she's not the murderer herself? People think poison is a woman's method of murder. Jameson licked a paw, then wiped his face with it. We know better than that, don't we? We did. 
In the previous case, Brent Thompson had murdered his mother with a poison, then a few days later he choked a woman to death. The evil stopped with her. She can't possibly stay at the desk all day. If she were the culprit, she'd have left a trail to the ladies' room or the water fountain, or to her boss's office. The path of evil stopped right at her desk, but has left a taint on her. She knows the murderer, but isn't the killer herself. Okay, so now what do we do? I need to open the shop in a half an hour. And I've got a tour at noon, Delia said. I'll stay. You two go take care of your human responsibilities, and I'll get the ray all work done, Jameson said. I was just about to remind him how my human responsibilities kept him out of the rain when he commanded me to raise a cloaking spell. We'd practiced all week, so I had it up almost instantly, hiding the three of us and the entire Kia. She's coming out. Drive up to the door so we can listen to what she's saying. Wow. The cloaking spell would cloak an entire car engine's worth of noise? That was impressive. I started the car and drove up to the door. What are you doing? Delia asked frantically. We're cloaked, and Jameson says she's coming out. Delia's face fell. Oh. I see. Jameson hadn't asked her to cast the spell, and she was disappointed. I didn't blame her, but honestly, if she'd cast it, we might have looked and sounded like a drum and bugle corps. Hey, Delia. I'm sorry, I said. She rubbed her nose. It's okay. Don't worry about me. Grandma said it's just temporary, and someday we'll all laugh about it. She didn't look like she was going to laugh. If you two are done talking, maybe we can listen? The receptionist had exited the building and stood to the side of the door. She fished around in her purse and pulled out a pack of cigarettes, a lighter, and her cell phone. She lit the cigarette and started talking on her phone. Yeah, it's me. Just had a weird couple of girls come into the office. She paused for a moment to enjoy her cigarette, if that's even possible. Said they wanted jobs, but didn't bring resumes. The one with long black hair said she wanted to work on allergies. The person on the other end of the phone must have cut her off. I don't know. Tall, black hair, pretty. She didn't leave a name. The other one had red tips on her hair. It seemed like a prank to me, but you said to call if anything out of the ordinary happened. She blew out more smoke. Fine. Yeah, if they come back I'll keep them here and call you. She dropped the cigarette to the ground and stepped on it. Look, if she's really looking for information about you, you know I won't say anything. Till death do us part, babe. She put everything back in her purse and walked back inside. Jameson jumped out the window and followed her through the door. You can go now was his parting thought to me. He's going to take it from here, I said as I drove off. I parked between two large vans and released my cloaking spell on all but Jameson. I pulled out and started driving downtown. So, it's her husband? Delia asked. Maybe. It's hard to tell yet. Hopefully Jameson will have more to say later. Look, don't take the spell thing personally. Once I got the amulet, my focus was overridden, and Jameson's been drilling me on spellcasting every single day. All I really wanted was to make potions, but I guess I don't get what I want. I didn't know that, Delia said softly. She reached over and squeezed my arm. It looks like neither of us got what we wanted for now. Chapter 17 I made it to the shop just in time to open. After having Jameson with me for the last few days, the shop felt empty without him. I got to work with my opening routine, starting with lighting Trina's candle. Things are not great here right now, so I'd appreciate it if you'd watch over me today. 
I didn't know if she was watching over me, if it was even possible for her to watch over me, but asking for her help always made me feel calmer and like I had a friend in my corner. After a busy morning of helping customers, I found Jameson in the prep room. How did you get in here? He licked his paw before answering. Doors can't really keep me in or out. Good to know. This could come in handy someday. What happened with the receptionist? She drove to an apartment and talked to a man. Neither of them is happy that you found them. He seemed to think the fraternity would be very unhappy. It's time to call in Kate, isn't it? My door chimes rang and I jumped. I'd been jumpy all day, wondering if Wolf and Stabby were going to figure out their hex oil was dangerous for them. So far, there had been no sign of them. I plastered a smile on my face and walked out to the sales floor. Good afternoon, how can I help you? I asked the very tall man standing by the candles. He looked down at me. Are you alone in the shop? My personal wards had been up all day, and Jameson was here with me, so I didn't feel too vulnerable, but he was intimidating. Yes. But I'm expecting more customers soon. That won't be a problem, he said. He opened the door, and Wolf walked in. The tall man stood outside, blocking the entrance to my shop as Wolf shuffled toward me. He had a limp, and his face was covered with boils. The sick, greasy magic I had felt coming off him before barely registered with my senses now. I suppose you think you're funny, he said. I don't know what you mean. You did this to me. You cursed the hex oil. I can barely walk, and Horatio is incapacitated. Trina's bad potion worked. I looked out the window and saw cars driving by. It seemed like Wolf had lost some of his power, which is why he needed someone to guard the door. He couldn't keep the street clear with his magic. I'm sorry. I don't know anyone by that name. Wolf scowled at me. Horatio is the man who was here with me the last time we met. You mean the man who tried to kill me? Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. It's actually quite painful for him. Every time he sneezes, a bouquet of flowers comes into existence. The flowers make him sneeze, and more flowers appear. He's drained almost all his magical ability, and he risks not being able to recuperate from the spell. Oh, Trina! What have we done? How long does he have? I estimate four hours before he loses his power for magic altogether. He'll be just another powerless human. So he's not going to die? Of course not, you stupid girl. He'll suffer something much worse. Losing his power permanently? I asked. He took a step toward me. I probably should have felt more threatened, but it was hard to take him seriously when he didn't even have the magical energy to maintain a glamour. I held my hand out. Stop right there. To my surprise, he did. You don't know who you're dealing with. I came here as a courtesy, to allow you to fix your error. I thought for a minute. Did I even know how to reverse the effects of these spells? Trina certainly hadn't left any instructions. I honestly don't know if I could. Lightning began to crackle in the cloudless sky. I lost my bravado, he was obviously not a man on the brink of losing all his power. Keep it up, make him drain the last of his power too, Jameson said. And even if I did, why would I? We were given power to make the world a better place, and you're abusing yours. If you ask me, you should lose your abilities and spend the rest of your life as a weak, powerless man. Clouds rolled in and settled over Market Street. Outside, people were rushing into buildings to avoid the torrential downpour that seemed to come out of nowhere. You know what I can do, he threatened. Yeah, yeah. 
Without your buddy Horatio, you seem to be more bluster than anything else. I casually inspected my fingernails, acting like he was no threat at all. A loud boom of thunder shook my front window. I require an antidote, now. Sorry. I don't have one. Now, if that will be all, I've got work to do. I didn't quite dare to turn my back on him, but I did my best to ignore him while rearranging the candle display. I felt a small hit on my ward, but not enough to worry about. I looked up. Oh, you're still here? Really, the shop is for paying customers only. I'd rather not have to ask you to leave. I smirked and turned my back on him. Jameson, you've got me, right? Yes, I do. He's not strong enough to hurt you unless he tries to look out. I stepped to the side and turned to face Wolf. He had a large candle in his hand and he was bringing it down where my head had been just a second ago. I rolled my eyes at him. Honestly? That's all you've got? Don't try my patience. I pulled out my amulet. You know what I can do with this, right? Do you really think you can withstand my attack? He took a step back. Set my merchandise down gently and leave. Fury crossed his face as he dropped the candle to the floor. As the glass shattered, he called down a lightning bolt and broke my picture window. I'll be back and then we'll see how your empty threats fare. The tall man opened the door for Wolf and they both walked down the street. Things had really changed for him in the past 36 hours. Sure, he could still affect the weather, but he couldn't cast a cloaking spell, couldn't stop people from coming down the street, and his psychic attack seemed weak. I blew out a breath and surveyed the broken glass on my floor. No landlord to fix my window for me this time. I was on my own. I got the broom and dustpan from the closet and started sweeping. Tiny shards had flown throughout the shop, and I was going to have to wipe everything down to make sure my customers wouldn't get cut. There was a small circle on the floor around me that had no glass, and a small circle where Wolf had been standing. We would have been picking glass out of our hair and clothes for days if we hadn't had our wards up. Jameson padded into the hallway, but stayed away from the broken glass. Looks like the hex oil is working like you intended it to. He's certainly weaker than he was, but he's still frightening enough. He won't be for long. It looks like he's got another day of partial power like today and then he'll start to run out of magic as well, particularly if he keeps trying to use big spells to frighten you. Halfway through my cleaning, Palmer walked in. Jameson gave a quick hiss and returned to his spot in the prep room. What happened here? Palmer asked. Wolf was here, with a different guy, threatening me again. How did he break your window? Palmer asked. That was more weird weather. I think it was another lightning strike nearby. Palmer looked concerned. I don't want him near you again. If he threatened you, you can take out a restraining order. I don't think that'll be necessary. He's a bully, and if I keep showing him he can't push me around, sooner or later he's going to give up. That's not his only option. I swept the last of the glass into the dustpan. I promise, he'll stop bothering me soon. Palmer brought the trash bin to me. Does he know you made him the wrong thing? I dumped the glass into the bin. Yes. It appears that Stabby has run into some bad luck. Have you called someone about the window yet? No. I need to get some plywood and board it up. I'll call someone tomorrow, because it's getting late. Palmer looked at his watch. Hmm, it's later than I thought. I'll board up the window for the night and then I want to bring you to Proctor House. I don't like the idea of you alone tonight, not with this new threat. Did I want to go to Proctor House? Yeah, I did. 
I could see Wolf coming to my apartment in desperation, trying to force me to do something before he ran out of power. Okay. Palmer did a double take. Just like that? No arguments, no cajoling? I shook my head. I'm not going to lie, he's got me a little shaken up. Besides, there's next to nothing in my fridge, and Aunt Nadia will send me home tomorrow with enough leftovers to feed a small army. Okay, I'll be back with plywood, and once it's up, we'll head out. I smiled at him. Thanks. I appreciate it. He returned in twenty minutes with plywood, an electric screwdriver, and screws. I'm going to need your help holding the plywood in place until I get it anchored down. We placed the wood over the window, and I held it in place as he screwed it in. That's good. I can take it from here. I finished wiping down the displays that had glass on them. Did you stop by for a reason? What do you mean? You didn't come here to fix my window, because you couldn't have known it was broken. Oh, yeah. I was checking to make sure you were okay. Did you think I wouldn't be? I don't know. I had a feeling I ought to stop by. I try not to ignore my feelings, they're usually onto something. I smiled. Your cop instincts at work, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. He put in the last screw. Okay, I'm done here. The glass company will take the plywood down for you in the morning. If you have space, you should keep it, in case you need to cover your window again. Hopefully I won't, I said, but the way my life was going, I knew I most likely would need it again. I looked in the prep room for Jameson, but he wasn't there. He was probably already at Proctor House, being fed delicacies by my aunts. If he was going to disappear like this, I was going to have to put in a cat door to explain how he kept getting in and out. Ready? Palmer asked. I took Trina's candle and put it in the sink. It looked like it had about ten minutes left to burn. You should probably blow that candle out, you know. It's not safe to leave it burning unattended. I frowned at him. Family tradition. We don't blow candles out unless we have to. It's going to go out in a few minutes, but if you're that concerned, we can wait until it does. I think we should. I didn't spend all this time boarding up your window to have the building burn down. Besides, there's something I wanted to talk to you about. I quirked an eyebrow at him. That night you made me dinner. Grilled cheese and tomato soup? That's hardly making you dinner. It's not the dinner I wanted to talk about, it was the time together. We had dinner months ago, and he was just bringing it up now? I guess he didn't hate the time with me as much as I had assumed. And? And I had a nice time. I rolled my eyes. A nice time is when you bring your grandma out for lunch. I really had to stop thinking there could be anything between us, because he obviously wasn't feeling it. Okay, good. That's all you have to say? Well, you're not giving me much to go on here. You say you had a nice time, but that's it. You probably have a nice time eating dinner with your mother too. That's beside the point, he said. I didn't have anything else to say, so I looked at Trina's candle. Still burning. But I had a nicer time with you. Did he just stink at dating? Was it possible he had no idea how much he was ruining what could be a moment between us? So I'm a better dinner companion than your mother. Noted. He ran his fingers through his hair. You don't make it easy for a guy, do you? Easy for what? I asked. He grabbed my hand in his. I want to ask you out on an actual dinner date once this mess with my cousin is over, but you don't seem interested. I thought that night maybe we had something, but now, you know what, never mind. 
forget I said anything. He dropped my hand. I thought we might have had a connection too, but when you take months to even mention the dinner again and don't call or text me, what am I supposed to think? I assumed you had a terrible time and weren't interested in me. So I just let it go. But we were laughing and talking, how could you think I didn't have fun? Because you didn't call. Listen, I know you've dated in the past, have you forgotten how it all works? He looked down at the floor. I met my wife when we were in middle school. I don't really have any dating experience outside of dating her. I looked at him, dumbfounded. No wonder he stunk so bad at this. Everything he learned about dating he learned in middle school. Okay, good to know. So, when you have dinner with a woman, even a low-rent soup and sandwich dinner, you call her and tell her you had fun. I mean, if you did. Then you talk a little bit, and you ask her out again. I wanted to, but it got so busy at work that by the time I remembered, weeks had gone by, and I thought I should talk to you in person instead. In person is always nice, but still, closer to the time of the previous date. Do you think that we could have dinner out, together, sometime? I smiled. I'd like that. But first, let's find the person who killed your cousin. Trina's candle sputtered out. I guess we can go now, Palmer said. He walked me into the house just as my entire family was sitting down to dinner. Jameson, I noticed, already had a half-eaten plate of tuna. There was no way I was going to be able to keep up with how much they spoiled him. Detective Palmer, we were just about to have dinner. Would you care to join us? Aunt Nadia asked. I thought the smell of her lasagna and garlic bread was too much temptation for any man to withstand, but he did. Thank you, Ms. Proctor, but I've got work to do tonight. I just wanted to make sure Isabella got home safely. Before anyone could chime in with any of hundreds of questions, I said, remain calm. I'm just dealing with a creepy customer, but I'm sure he'll be no problem in about another day or so. I wanted to sleep here as a precaution. Aunt Nadia rummaged in one of the cabinets for a plastic container. In that case, let me give you some for later. She scooped at least three servings of lasagna into the container and wrapped several pieces of garlic bread in tinfoil for him. Thank you, but this really isn't necessary, he said. Of course it is. You spend a great deal of time ferrying Isabella around and keeping her safe, this is the least I can do. And when you're done with the lasagna, bring the container back so we can fill it with that night's dinner. Palmer looked from Aunt Nadia, to me, to the rest of my family sitting at the table. Okay, let's not overwhelm the poor guy. I started to push him toward the kitchen door when his phone rang. I took the food from his hands, and he answered. Palmer. The color drained from his face. I'm on my way. Chapter 18. I put my hand on his arm. Kate's been in an accident. He rushed out the door, and I followed him. We climbed in his car, and it wasn't until he started it that he realized I was with him. You should stay here. I'll let you know how she is, once I find out. I shook my head. She's my friend, and this might be my fault. He put the car in reverse, and we left the driveway. How so? Wolf's threats weren't just for me. He threatened my family and friends. He turned his lights and siren on, and we drove through town. At least he wasn't stopping to have me get out. We got to the accident, and there were flashing lights from every conceivable emergency vehicle. I followed Palmer to the scene, but when we got to the crime tape, he stopped. Wait here. But I... I stopped speaking as I took in his glare. Kate was hurt, and he needed to take care of his partner. 
He spoke to a paramedic for a minute before kneeling down to talk to Kate, who was lying still on the ground. She lifted her hand, and my knees went weak. Before then, I didn't actually know if she'd survived the crash. Thank the goddess, I murmured under my breath. Paramedics wrapped her neck in a brace and slid a backboard underneath her. From there, it was a quick trip to the ambulance and then, presumably, the hospital. Once I knew she was okay, I expanded my attention to taking all the other police and fire personnel at the scene. Papa Tony stood guard at the crime scene tape about 20 yards from me, so I walked over to him. Do you know how this happened? I asked. Good evening. No, I don't. But junior patrol officers are usually the last to know. She looks like she's going to be okay, though. Lucky she sideswiped the building and didn't run straight into it. There would have been a different outcome for sure. How can you tell? See the scrape down the side of the building? That's how she slowed her car down before it hit the wall. She must have been going fast, fast enough for a head-on collision to do serious damage. I shuddered. What are you doing here? Papa Tony's asked me. Palmer was driving me home from work, and that's when he got the call. Papa Tony's nodded. If you don't mind me saying, you two make a good couple. I furrowed my brow at him. What? No, ah, uh, we're not a couple. I had someone threaten me in my shop, and he wanted to make sure I got home safely. He stood up a bit straighter. Sorry. It's just that he talks about you a lot, and I guess I thought. He talks about me a lot? At work? But is he saying nice things or complaining? Now that you mention it, he tends to say things like that woman will be the death of me. I smiled. That sounds about right. Life has been pretty topsy-turvy for me lately. I suspect he'd prefer a woman whose life was more settled. But would he? He asked me out to dinner, and did I even say yes to him? Maybe he liked a challenge. Palmer jogged up to us. We're going to the hospital. He didn't have to tell me twice. Once we were in his car, I asked about Kate. What's her condition? Concussion from the airbag, bruises, whiplash for sure. They're going to do scans for other damage. I put my hand on his arm. She's strong, and she'll be fine after she heals up. He took my hand in his and squeezed it. I know. It's the waiting that's difficult. He let go of my hand. This is the second time in a week you've been here to comfort me. I appreciate it. I didn't say anything. Both instances were coincidence. But I think it's not safe for you to be around me right now. Too many people are getting hurt, or worse. Once we see Kate, I'll take you to Proctor House and then I'll keep my distance. I wasn't sure that would work very well. I think you forget I've got my own troubles with Wolf. Maybe neither of us is safe to be around. Then again, this could have been an accident. What I tell you goes no further than this car. Her brake lines were cut. I nodded. Do you know how she was going so fast? Not yet. Someone could have overridden the programming in her car. The techs should know tomorrow. At the hospital, Palmer insisted on accompanying Kate through all her scans. I waited, watching people go in and out of the emergency waiting room. After two hours, he returned, but walked straight past me. Palmer? Wait up, I called after him. He stood under a streetlight outside, and I could see he was furious. Hey, what's wrong? Is she? They're bringing her to a room. They want her to stay overnight for observation. So, no surgeries, no setting bones in casts? 
No. Nothing like that. Then what's wrong? He looked like he wanted to punch someone. There is a limited number of people I care about on a personal basis, and she's one of them. I should have seen this coming, I should have protected her. But how could you have known this would happen? I asked. He continued as though he didn't hear my question. And you. You're being threatened in your own shop, and all I can do is stop by once in a while and drive you places so no one snatches you off the street. He flung himself onto a bench and put his head in his hands. I'm a failure, failure as a cop and failure as a man. Whoa, now, that certainly wasn't true. I sat next to him. Listen, this is probably the last thing you want to hear right now, but you're being an idiot. He turned his head to look at me. Who saved me from Wolf and Stabby? You. Who spends every day keeping Portsmouth safe, even when he's been told not to? You. Don't make me continue. You're a great detective and a really good friend. If you weren't, none of this would bother you. He frowned at me. So what do you say we go up and talk to Kate? Maybe she's got some ideas we can work on. He blew out a sigh. Okay. In the elevator to the fifth floor, he turned to me. What I said outside? I smiled at him. Our little secret. No one needs to know you lie to yourself like that. I turned to face the door, but he kept staring at me. At the nurse's station, Palmer put me on the approved visitors list for Kate's room. Thanks, I said. She's going to need a friend around who isn't a cop. Papa Tony's was guarding Kate's door. I felt bad for the guy, because this couldn't be a very interesting part of the job. Door duty again, I see. Yes, ma'am. I take the job seriously. Palmer clapped his shoulder. Good man. Miss Proctor is on the list. I wasn't ready for the amount of bruising on Kate's face, and I gasped when I saw her. That bad? she asked. Oh, Kate, was all I could say. You look terrible, but in a week or two you'll be back to normal. And I've seen much worse, Palmer said. She winced as she raised the head of her bed. Great, I'm not the worst ever. Your bedside manner really stinks. A nurse in pink scrubs bustled in with a cart. Hello, Kate. I'm Joyce and I'll be your nurse for the rest of the night. It's time to take your vitals. Palmer and I stepped back and let the nurse do her job. She wrote down Kate's blood pressure and temperature and checked her pupillary response. Are you having any pain? she asked. I'm achy all over and my head hurts. Any worse than an hour ago? Kate tried to shake her head and winced. No. You're going to feel the effects of the concussion for a few days, but everything else seems fine. If your pain gets worse, or if you notice any new, sharp pain, use your button to call a nurse. Thank you, Joyce, Palmer said. Once she left, Kate asked, can we turn some of these lights out? They're too bright. I turned off the light above her head, and Palmer turned the ceiling lights off. Too dark, he said. He turned the bathroom light on and left the door open a crack. Better? he asked. Much, Kate said. Palmer took the chair next to her bed. Has anyone asked you what happened yet? Dobbins asked me in the ambulance, but I don't know if I was much help. I was panicky, you know? He took her hand. Understandable. You know you're going to be fine, right? Doesn't feel like it, but yeah, I know. Are you up for a couple of questions? Then I'll leave you to rest. Kate looked panicked. I don't want to be here on my own. I'll stay with you, and Papa Tony's is at the door. 
no one will get past us. I wouldn't let anything happen to her. She smiled. Thanks. What do you want to know? Before Palmer could ask a question, a man with a clipboard and a file walked in and turned on the ceiling light. Ow, Kate whined. He held his hand out to Kate. Hello, I'm Dr. McGinnis. I work with the traumatic brain injury team here. Can you tell me your name? She shook his hand delicately and said, Officer Kate Stanton. McGinnis checked his chart. Good. Do you know why you're here? I was in a car accident and hit a wall, Kate said. Correct. He pulled out a small flashlight. I'm going to check your pupils for a second. He flashed the light into one eye, then the other. He nodded and said, any new or sharp pain I should know about? Nothing sharp, and I'm achy all over. To be expected. He turned to Palmer and said, visiting hours are over, so now that you've made sure your friend is okay, it's time for you to let her rest. Palmer stood up and even though he was only a couple inches taller than the doctor, he seemed to tower over him. We have reason to believe Officer Stanton is in continuing danger, so we're leaving Papatoni's at the door and Proctor here in the room. The doctor looked to me. She can't sleep for, he checked his chart, another four hours. Can you keep her awake? I nodded. Good. I'll get the nurse to bring you a cup of coffee. Palmer followed Dr. McGinnis out into the hallway, and I turned the light off again. Better? I asked. I'd be a lot better if they stopped burning my eyes out with the flashlight, Kate said. I know. Palmer returned and stood on the other side of Kate's bed. Doctor said you're going to have a complete recovery. All you need to do is rest and follow instructions. He stared at her and reiterated, follow instructions. I can't be here to watch you, I need to find the bastard who did this to you. How are you going to do that while you're on leave? Kate asked. Don't worry about that. Palmer gestured for me to follow him out into the hallway. I'll stay and make sure she's okay. Between me and Papatoni's, I think we have everything handled. He nodded, then turned and strode out to the elevators. Joyce came in with a paper cup of coffee for me. I didn't know how you like your coffee, so I brought a little bit of everything for you. She fished in her pocket and pulled out creamer, sugar packets, and at least three different kinds of fake sugar packets. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Can Kate get anything to eat? The nurse looked at the whiteboard on the wall with Kate's information on it. I'm not sure, let me check with the doctor. I turned to Kate, and her eyes looked like they were starting to close. Let's talk for a little bit. We've got four hours before you can sleep. I don't think I can make it that long. We'll do our best. Let's talk about the accident. I know Palmer wanted to ask if you remembered anything, but he left. Did you see anyone near your car? Or did you go anywhere different than usual today? Kate raised the head of her bed as high as it could go. No, I didn't see anyone, and I didn't go any place different. I was driving home from the grocery store when I lost control of the car. Okay then, that's where he should start looking. He'll probably find something on parking lot cameras, I said. Joyce walked back in with a cup of lime jello and a spoon. Doctor says you can have uncaffeinated liquids. So your choices are soda, water, jello, ice cream, or chicken broth. Jello is fine for now, and maybe a ginger ale? I'm feeling a little queasy. The nurse patted her arm. Yeah, that's to be expected with a concussion. I wanted to set up a quick protection ward in this room, but we were never alone long enough. I grasped my amulet, 
closed my eyes, and tried to feel my way through the hospital to see if Kate was in any immediate danger. The amulet didn't point anyone out to me, but I was interrupted by Kate. Hey, don't you fall asleep on me. If you go, I've got no chance at staying awake. I opened my eyes. Sorry about that. It was going to be a long night. Chapter 19 By the time four hours had passed and Kate could get some rest, we had about twenty visitors. Nurses kept coming in and out to check on her, Dr. McGinnis was in twice more, and a few of her friends stopped by just to check up. I didn't know why the nurses were concerned she'd fall asleep, she never had the chance. Dr. McGinnis came in, checked her pupils, and said, You're looking good, Kate. If you want, you can go home as long as you don't go home alone. Or, you can stay here until about noon tomorrow. Kate looked at me, and I nodded. She can stay with me until she's better. I'll have the nurses pull up your discharge papers then. You're free to eat whatever you want, but I suggest taking it easy, sticking mostly to fluids for the next 24 hours. You can sleep when you want, but I want you to call in if you have any sharp, sudden pains, or if your overall level of pain gets worse. I'll make sure of that, I said. Thanks. I appreciate your care, Kate said. Once he left the room, Kate slowly swung her feet out of the bed and sat up straight. Do you need any help? I asked. I need clothes. I'm pretty sure they cut mine off, and I'm not going home dressed in a johnny. I smiled. Let me check with the nurses. I went out to the nurse's station and found Joyce. She's going to go home tonight, but doesn't know where her clothing is. The nurse frowned. None came up with her from the ER, so you're going to have to find her something new. Maybe try the gift shop? I doubted it would be open this late at night. Do you have a spare pair of scrubs? We can return them tomorrow, it would be a lot faster if I didn't have to go out to her apartment first. Papa Tony's insisted he had to call Palmer to bring Kate to my apartment. Palmer was not taking any chances until he found the people responsible for her crash. By the time we got to my apartment, Kate was looking pale and had drifted off in Palmer's car. She woke up enough to walk, but Palmer kept an arm around her so she wouldn't fall. I tucked her into my bed and met Palmer in the living room. She said the last place she went to was the grocery store. Did you check the video surveillance there? I assumed that's where she was. There was spilled milk and broken eggs all over the inside of her car. That sounded terrible. By the time she was ready to drive again, it was going to smell horrible. Do you know if the car has been totaled? Palmer nodded. Yeah, it was pretty old to start with. She's going to need to buy a new one. At least that was one thing she didn't have to deal with, getting back into a car she had an accident in. I want the two of you to stay here today. Papa Tony's went home to get some sleep, so I've assigned someone else to keep an eye on the building. He looked ready to talk down my objections, but I was grateful. For as much as he thought Kate's accident was his fault, I knew it was mine. Wolf had threatened my friends and I hadn't taken him seriously. We can do that. My family will bring us anything we need, so just let the officer know we'll be expecting them. I woke up on the couch to knocking at the door. I looked through the peephole and saw Abby. What was she doing here? I opened the door and greeted her with a big smile. Nice to see you. How are you? She didn't look nearly as happy to see me. In fact, she didn't even meet my eyes. Hey, Isabella. I'm here to pick up some more of my stuff. I left it because I didn't think I would need it, but I do. I had no idea what stuff she was thinking of. Sure. What do you need? Abby walked into the kitchen and said, Most everything in here. 
I bought most of it, and I'm going to need it for my new apartment. New apartment? Is it going to be near here? She shook her head. No, I'm moving to Boston, and I'm going to earn a degree in biology at Northeastern. I can't afford to buy all the stuff over again, I'm sorry. I couldn't help but smile. I knew college was on Abby's list of things she wanted to do. Maybe she would be happier starting a new life in college. That's great, I'm happy for you. She started packing up the kitchen. I wasn't happy to be losing so much stuff, but I could take a trip to a thrift shop and replace everything relatively inexpensively. And if I couldn't, I could probably borrow anything I needed from Proctor House. Can I help? I asked. No, thanks. I think I'm just about done. She balanced each box and was able to carry all three at once. Are you sure? You don't want to drop these. Abby turned and glared at me. I said, I'm fine. I held my hands up. Okay. You don't have to yell at me for trying to help. Once you move, send me your address, and I'll come visit. Abby looked down at the floor. I can't. My parents said they'll only pay if I never talk to you again. My knees felt weak, and I sank to the couch. And that's okay with you? I was dumbfounded. Was she ready to throw our friendship away for money? Money her parents would probably give to her anyway? Kate walked out of my bedroom, running her fingers through her messy hair. Abby turned to Kate. Yes. Your life is too dangerous. I need to get out of here before I look like Kate. Kate's bruises had fully bloomed, and she looked horrible. Do you see what I mean? You're dangerous for your friends. She turned and left, not even bothering to say goodbye. Kate sat next to me. Bad timing, I'm sorry. I sighed. No, don't worry about it. She had her opinion before she saw you, nothing would have changed if you weren't here. Can I make you some breakfast? I was hoping for a cup of coffee. Let me see what Abby's left me in the kitchen, and I'll do my best. I opened the cabinets and was surprised to see she left me with almost nothing. I thought I'd bought some of the cookware, but I wasn't going to chase after her for a frying pan. She left me my favorite mug, my travel mug, one small pan, and one set of silverware. Great. Not much here. How do you feel about going out for breakfast? Kate grimaced. Not looking like this. Her black eye hadn't gotten any better overnight, and the bruise on her cheek took up almost the whole side of her face. Yeah, I can see that. I'll call my family and they'll bring something over. You can do that? And they'll just drop whatever they're doing to take care of me? My heart ached for her. I knew she'd lost her parents when she was younger. Even though she'd been raised by family, I guess they weren't the take care of each other no matter what kind of family. Absolutely. I picked up my phone and called Proctor House. Good morning, Isabella. Aunt Lily answered. Good morning, Aunt Lily. Do you remember Kate Stanton? Of course I do. She helped us capture Brent Thompson. Right. Well, she's okay now, but she was in a car accident last night. She spent the night at my apartment. Anyway, I was going to make breakfast, but Abby just stopped by to take everything from the kitchen because she's moving. And you want us to bring you some food? I'm sure poor Kate doesn't want to go out in her condition. We'll be there in half an hour. Thanks. I love you. I love you too, honey. Now go take care of your friend. I hung up and smiled. Breakfast will be here in half an hour. Kate gave a very slow stretch. Do you mind if I take a shower? 
Of course not. I looked at the wrinkled scrubs she'd slept in. Do you want to borrow some clean clothes? She grimaced. No, thanks. I'll just change when I get home. Okay. Towels are in the bathroom closet. Let me know if you can't find what you need. She closed the bathroom door and turned the water on. I thought I heard a sob through the door, but just one, so I didn't disturb her. Jameson came out of the bedroom and joined me in the kitchen. I did what I could for her last night, he said. What do you mean? I slept next to her so she'd stay asleep and heal as quickly as possible. I frowned. Did you use magic on her? She wouldn't like that. Jameson sneezed. Like she'd think a cat could perform magic. Does this mean your hatred of police is waning? I asked. No. But I'm not a complete jerk. I'm still moved to help people when they're hurting. I scratched between his ears. You're a better person than a lot of people out there, you know. I pulled out a can of cat food for him and opened it with a can opener. Abby stopped by and took almost all of the kitchen stuff. Be careful not to cut yourself on the edge of the can. When you finish the food, I'll refill the tin with water. I folded the blanket on the couch and tidied up while Kate showered. She left the bathroom wrapped in a towel, with a cloud of steam behind her. I feel a million times better already. She didn't look better, but I didn't mention that. There was a knock at the door. Must be breakfast. I looked out the peephole and was surprised to see my entire family in the hall, behind the officer who had stood guard duty outside all night. I opened the door. Good morning, officer. Morning, ma'am. Is everything all right in here? I nodded. You can let my family in, they've brought breakfast. As I looked behind him, I realized each of them had either a box or bag. This couldn't all be breakfast, could it? He stepped aside and let everyone in. What in the world do you all have? I asked. Aunt Lily said, I've got a set of clothes for Kate. I had to guess at her size, but it's better than whatever they sent her home in last night. Kate stepped forward and took the bag. Thank you, Ms. Proctor. This was very kind of you. Aunt Nadia was already in the kitchen with Thea and Delia. We've got food and a few extra things from our kitchen. Nadia was putting food on plates Delia was unpacking, and Thea was unpacking an entire box of cookware. That really wasn't necessary. I was going to hit a few thrift shops today and replace what I needed. My mother handed a shoebox to Kate. Some old family recipes, bruise faders, muscle rubs, and a bubble bath that will make you forget all your aches. Kate began to tear up. You're all so kind. None of this was really necessary. Grandma, last to enter the apartment, handed us each a large travel mug. Coffee with plenty of cream and sugar. You had a tough night last night and need this to get going this morning. Kate wiped at her eyes before taking a mug. She looked overwhelmed. I could understand, my family could be like a force of nature sometimes. I'm just going to get dressed now, she said. I took the other mug and drank. It was delicious and just what I needed. Thank you, everyone. I wasn't expecting more than whatever was left over from breakfast this morning. My mother hugged me. It's rare that you ask for help from all of us, but we're here for you. Once she let me go, I looked into the kitchen. I think I've unpacked everything in the right cabinets, Thea said. I opened a few. It didn't matter where things were, but she had gotten them right. It's perfect, I said. On the dining table, there were two plates of food waiting for Kate and me. Scrambled eggs, crispy bacon, and wheat toast. 
Kate joined me at the table, and we started to eat, with my family slowly walking around in each room. I knew what they were doing, but Kate didn't. They were checking and reinforcing the wards in my apartment. Pretty soon it was going to be harder to break in here than Fort Knox. I put my fork down and looked at my family. I don't want to be rude, but I'd really like to eat without everyone watching me. I felt the stronger ward snap into place. No need to get snippy, young lady. We were just making sure you didn't need anything else before we left. Since you're fine, we'll go, Grandma said. Kate stood up and went to the door. She gave each member of my family a gentle hug before they left. Chapter 20 They all made their way to the door, and Grandma opened it only to see Palmer about to knock. Good morning, Detective Palmer. We were just leaving, but I'm sure Nadia has made enough breakfast that you can join the girls. Palmer looked past Grandma to see my crowded little apartment. Thank you. If you don't mind, we've got some business to discuss. My family stopped crowding the door and let Palmer walk in. I was surprised they left without either making a scene or demanding to stay and listen to what was happening. I stood up and assembled a breakfast plate of for him. Have a seat, we're not ready to go anywhere yet. Delicious. Your aunt made this? I nodded. She used to run a catering business, so everything she makes is delicious. How did you know I was here to drive you to work? Palmer asked. I smiled. You seem to have taken a new job as my chauffeur since you are out of work. Why else would you be here? I actually wanted to see how Kate was doing. Kate looked up from her plate and said, so much better after breakfast. I'm still really achy, though, and just want to crawl into my own bed and sleep for a week. Understandable, Palmer said. Papa Tony's is ready to sit outside your apartment for the day, just in case. Kate's face contorted as though she wanted to say that wasn't necessary, but then decided maybe it was. Yeah, okay. I wasn't sure how difficult it was for her to admit she needed help, but judging from the look on her face, it wasn't easy. Kate stood up. Let me get my stuff together, and I'll be ready to go. You should take the rest of the breakfast too. That way, you don't need to cook for yourself today. My family had cooked for an army, not just two women. We left the apartment, and I was surprised to see there was no officer standing guard. What happened to the guy out here? I sent him home. He could barely keep his eyes open, and I knew we'd be leaving together. Once we got into the car, Kate sat back with a sigh. First thing you should do is take two Motrin and then use the bubble bath. You'll be amazed at how much better you feel. Then I suggest a nap, some lunch, and a nice afternoon watching TV. Oh, and don't forget the bruise cream. You'll look a million times better tomorrow. Kate smiled from the front seat. Yes, doctor. Papa Tony's was waiting outside for us when we drove up. He blanched when he saw Kate's face. Holy smokes, he exclaimed. All good here? Palmer asked. Papa Tony's tore his eyes away from Kate. All quiet here. I got her landlord to let me into her apartment and it looks fine. I knew things could look perfectly fine on the outside and yet be completely wrong. So I held my amulet, closed my eyes, and scanned her apartment building. I went apartment by apartment, checking each person. I really should not do this very often, I'd lose my faith in humanity. There was a man on the third floor planning to evade his taxes, and a woman on the first floor calling her boyfriend now that her husband had gone to work, but no one thinking about Kate. Okay. I'll let you bring her in. I moved to the front seat and said, you didn't want to check yourself? That seems surprisingly trusting of you. You don't think we should go take a look ourselves? 
Palmer started his car. I've been watching the apartment all night. I know she'll be safe here. Papa Tony's is a good kid, and I don't want him to think I'm second-guessing his judgment. I pursed my lips. I had no idea how much personnel management was involved in day-to-day -day policing. You must be exhausted, I said. Not as much as you might think. I've been at this job a long time, and I'm used to pulling one- and two-day shifts. Sounds rough. I think I'll take running an apothecary. At least I get to sleep in my own apartment every night. He didn't say anything, so I continued. Who do you think killed your cousin? Palmer gripped the steering wheel tightly. I don't know, and it's incredibly frustrating to try and investigate on my own. You're not exactly on your own, you've got Kate and me. Kate was going to go see Dan's ex-wife today, but I guess I need to do it now. Come with me? I looked at my watch. 8.30. You got me for about an hour. That should be fine. I know her well enough to know if she's lying to me or not. He put the car in drive and pulled back out onto the street. It was a short drive to the hotel, and we found her in the lobby, checking out. Marcy, you're leaving so soon? She turned and was surprised to see us. No sense in staying here. My kids need their mother, and now that I'm sure you didn't kill him, there's nothing else I can do but wait for the police to find his murderer. I was surprised she spoke so frankly to him. Palmer put his hand on her elbow. Can we sit for a minute over here on the couches? She looked to me. Does she have to come with us? No. Not if you don't want her to. They walked to a couch in the center of the lobby, and I moved to a table by the front door. I was far enough away that I could not hear them, but close enough to Palmer that I could help if anything happened. Jameson hadn't taught me how my amulet could help me determine whether someone was lying. I figured I'd give it a try, anyway. I reached up and adjusted the chain, trying to look a little less conspicuous. Marcy was talking, and I picked up the amulet, looking at it as though it could tell me what to do next. I thought, is she telling the truth? But nothing happened. Usually the amulet would get warm if it was answering no to a question. I sat at the table and watched them until they were done speaking. They got up, and at the door, Marcy said, well, Steve, it's been nice to see you. At that moment, the amulet grew warm. I could tell from the look on her face that she was lying. At least I knew now how to tell when someone was lying. Palmer joined me at my table. I don't think she did it. Me neither. Her body language made it seem like she was lying. Calling it body language was as good as anything else. After witnessing Palmer's reactions during our conversation about potions, I certainly wasn't going to tell him how my necklace determined Marcy was truthful in their private conversation. I don't think she was actually happy to see you. He gave me a small smile. I can't imagine she'd be happy to see anyone right now. Even though they divorced, he was still the father of her children, and that counts for something. Let's get you to work. I followed him out to his car. So who do we have left for suspects? Anyone? I don't know. I don't have anyone, and with Kate out of commission, I don't have anyone who can sneak in and read files for me. So what will you do now? I asked. Palmer yawned. I'm going to drop you off at work and get some sleep. We didn't have time to hunt down Wolf or Stabby. Okay. Can we get together tonight to go over everything? Maybe between the two of us, or three, if Kate is feeling up to it, we can put together enough clues. Chapter 21 Palmer walked me into the shop and took a quick look around before he left me alone. Call if you need anything. The three of us need to stick together now. 
Aang nodded. I didn't like how worried he looked. Looking out for each other, though, seemed like a good plan. You too. I can close up in two seconds if you need me. Good to know. Stay safe, he said as he left. I took a good look around my shop. I loved it here, but it no longer felt like the sanctuary it once did. Now I felt like I had to be on my guard at all times. I felt something rub up against my leg, and I yelped. I looked down to see Jameson. You scared me half to death, I said. Sorry. I didn't realize you were quite so distressed today. Maybe you should take some time to relax. I'll be with you all day, and I promise you'll be safe. I bent down and picked him up. I know. And I appreciate you keeping me safe here, but what about Palmer and Kate? The one thing I never wanted was for my non-magic friends to get caught up in dangerous magic. Jameson jumped out of my arms and didn't have anything reassuring to say. Great. I guess they were on their own today. I lit Trina's candle and stared into it for a moment. Usually I said a few words to her about wishing she were here with me. Today, I was too upset to say anything. I unlocked the office and got the shop ready for customers. When I unlocked the door at 10, no one was waiting to come in. I looked up and down the street to make sure Wolf hadn't enchanted the area, but there were people going in and out of the other stores. Maybe it was the big piece of plywood blocking the broken window. I closed the door and went back to the office. I called the first glass shop that had a decent review score online, and they said they'd be in to look at the damage later in the afternoon. Without the window, the shop was dark. I lit more candles and set them around the room to alleviate the gloom. I double-checked the back door to make sure it was still locked. No one was loitering out back either. The tea of the day was chamomile with avocado leaf. I poured myself a mug and held it, letting it warm my hands. After almost an hour, the tea had gone cold, and I realized I'd done nothing but stare out the window, waiting for trouble to arrive. I had to get hold of myself. I took a sip of the cold tea and reviewed the customer formulary. Each regular customer had a page, along with a schedule of how often they required refills. I flipped through each page, making notes for which treatments I should make more of. The list was longer than it should be, I was in danger of falling behind. I took one more long look out the window, decided everything looked safe, and went into the prep room. Jameson, wake up, I said. He raised his head and yawned. What? Is there a problem? Not that I know of, but I'm on edge. I can't work if someone isn't standing guard. He stood up and stretched. I suppose it's a good idea to keep watch. I'll stay out front. Most people feel safe with a watchdog, but I knew without a doubt that I'd be safe with my magical watch cat. I got to work on my potions, first, starting the things that would take days to be ready, then going back to work on things based on when I thought my customers would come pick them up. At two o'clock, Mr. Schmidt came in. Is anybody here? He called. I wiped my hands on a paper towel and went out to help him. Mr. Schmidt, how are you? He looked like he was doing well, his hair was fully grown in and a wavy brown he hadn't seen for years. Your hair looks great, I gushed. He grinned. You think so? Absolutely. You don't look a day over forty. How can I help you today? I asked. I need more gunpowder tea, and I was thinking about a candle. I took the jar of gunpowder tea down from the herb wall and brought it to the counter. How much tea would you like? Eight ounces should be fine. I measured out the tea and asked, what kind of candle were you thinking about? I've got a date tomorrow night. I'm making Marcella Escobar dinner, and I wanted something that might help her fall in love with me. 
I smiled. I don't know her, but if you're making her dinner, then you've practically won the battle right there. I need all the help I can get, though. She's beautiful, and men are always asking her out. I understand. We don't make love potions or candles here, but I think I can help. I walked over to the candle display and chose two white tapers with rose petals in them. Light these on your fireplace mantle and then you want to take a few of these smaller floating candles, put them in a glass bowl with rose petals on your dining table. I don't want the rose candles on the table, he asked. I shook my head. No. You don't want more than a hint of scent on the table, or else it will interfere with your dinner. What are you making her? I'm not sure yet. I want to make something impressive, but simple enough that I can't ruin it. Wise. Have you considered something super easy like stuffed shells? You could make a salad to go with it, and if you get a nice bottle of wine, she'll be impressed. Are you sure that's impressive enough? Absolutely. The dinner is just one part of the whole night. If you relax and be yourself, I'm sure the date will go just fine. But don't forget dessert, something with chocolate, and you'll do great. Do you want me to wrap up these candles for you too? Yes. Thanks for your advice. I haven't had a woman in my house for a long time. I rang up his order. Twenty-two fifty. Just remember, she's there because she already likes you. He took the bag from me and started whistling on his way to the door. I closed my eyes and enjoyed the feeling of helping a customer. You're such a sap, Jameson said. I am not. Who cares if his date goes well or not? There's a killer in Portsmouth, and we haven't found him yet. And there's nothing I can do from here, either. I'm trying to cling to what I think of as my normal life. Normal life means chatting with customers, being encouraging, and just being nice to people. You don't get to do much of that when you're looking for a murderer. Jameson rolled his eyes. Think of it as a human thing, then. I need to talk to people and make them smile. I can't help it. The door chimes rang, and Kate came in. Her bruises were fading, and she wasn't walking like she was in pain. Oh no, you should be in bed, I said. I did what you said, and I feel great. I think it was the hot bath. That bubble bath was awesome. Does Papa Tony's know you're here? He drove me. He's out front, standing guard. I put the jar of gunpowder tea away. How did you ever talk him into that? I made some coffee, and we just started chatting. He understands how frustrating it is to be frozen out of an investigation. He hates guarding doors and knows he can do so much more. So, what did he tell you? They found a fingerprint on my brake line. They ran it, but it wasn't in the system. It also wasn't the fingerprint of anyone at my garage either. Interesting. So if we could find a suspect or two, we could figure out who cut your brake line. Kate sighed. Hopefully Wheeler will find something on the grocery store video. But even if she does, it's not like she'll tell me. I poured us each a mug of tea. She's still not sharing any information? Kate took the tea and shook her head. And I can't even go into the office. If the chief sees me in there, I am going to be in big trouble. He ordered me to take medical leave for two weeks. My cell phone rang. I looked at the screen. It's Palmer. Maybe he's found something important. I hit the green button on the phone, and before I could say anything, Palmer said, where are you right now? I'm at the apothecary, where I said I'd be all day. I could hear sirens in the background. Where are you? What's going on? I'm at your apartment. It's on fire. 
Chapter 22 On Fire? I'll be right there. I hung up my phone. My apartment is on fire. Let's go. Papa Tony's was surprised to see us rushing out of the building. What's wrong? We need to get to my apartment. It's on fire, I said. He looked like he wanted to argue with me, but Kate shot him a look, so he said, get in. I'll drive. At my apartment, I was relieved to see it wasn't quite as bad as I thought. The building was still standing, and with any luck, the damage could be repaired. The four of us sat in Palmer's cruiser, silently watching as my building continued to smolder. I held my amulet and asked Bridget for help. Not help for me, I didn't deserve it, but help for everyone else who lived in my building. Bad things happen all the time to people, but I was sure this specific bad thing was exactly and specifically my fault. I put my hand on my door handle. I need to go apologize. Apologize for what? Papa Tony's asked. He wasn't exactly up on everything that had been happening, and I wasn't sure I had the energy to explain it all. I looked at Kate, and she shook her head. She thinks every bad thing that happens in town is her fault somehow. It's not, Kate said. Why don't you see if you can help Wheeler, Palmer suggested. Papa Tony's perked up. I didn't think he liked just watching. You got it, boss. He left the cruiser and jogged up to Wheeler. But this is my fault. It's the same person that cut Kate's brake lines, I said. Kate turned to face me in the back seat. How could you possibly tell? They said they'd go after people I cared for if I didn't make what they wanted. I gave them something that looks like what they wanted, but wasn't. Kate's right, you have no idea who did this. But if it was the same people, we're closing in on them. I furrowed my brow. How can you say that? I'm counting at least three separate crimes, you don't do that in a short period of time without leaving behind substantial clues. We just need to find them. We saw Chief Dobbins walking toward us with a tablet. Palmer rolled his window down, and I could smell wood and plastic burning. I was ready for the chief to start yelling at us, because none of us should be at a crime scene. Listen, Wheeler's on the warpath. She swears she'll have everything she needs to arrest you, Palmer, by the end of the day. Before she does that, I need you to look at this video. The chief handed Palmer the tablet, and we all leaned forward to watch the video. I saw a gas can at the very edge of the screen lift up and pour gasoline on the siding of my apartment building. There was no hand on the can. I knew it, the use of magic meant it was definitely my fault. I'm not sure what I'm seeing here, it looks like the can is levitating, Palmer said. I looked at all the different camera angles, and this is the best one. I don't know how the perp rigged up the system to stay off the camera, but that doesn't really matter. We're looking for the can now. I bet dollars to donuts it was the same person that cut Kate's brake line. I had no idea how he came to that conclusion on his own. What makes you say that, Chief? Kate said. It looks to me like we've got someone going after young women in town. We've got to find this guy before he escalates to murder. Interesting concept. But does only two really make a pattern? The chief grimaced. You see this kind of thing in larger cities all the time. He's targeting successful women like you, a business owner, and Kate, a rising star in the department. I watched Kate stifle a smile. It was definitely not the time to revel in his compliment. A fireman called to the chief. Palmer handed the tablet back out the window and the chief walked off. My landlord, Mr. Subramanian, walked up to my window. I'm so sorry. It looks like the building won't be ready for at least three months. You are going to have to find somewhere else to live. I hope you'll come back when it's ready, 
but I would completely understand, especially for you, if you decided you wanted to live somewhere else. Live somewhere else? The thought hadn't occurred to me. Even though it was small and inexpensive, I loved my apartment. Abby and I had made so many memories there, just trying to figure out how to live on our own. What about you and Mrs. S? I asked. He smiled. We have somewhere to go. She won't like it, but it's time she let go of her anger and met her grandchild. I smiled. I had the occasion to follow him one night, checking up on an alibi, and saw him playing with his grandson while visiting with his son and daughter-in-law. He looked so happy there, and I hoped his wife would come to be happy there too. Mr. Subramanian tapped the car and said, you let me know what you decide, and then walked away. I guess I'm taking you back to Proctor House, Palmer said. That didn't sound like a good idea to me. Everywhere I went, someone seemed to get hurt. No. I think I'll stay in my office tonight. I need to be alone and think. What I was really hoping was that they would come after me. Jameson and I would have to set a trap for them. They had done more than enough damage, and we needed to take care of them, permanently. Palmer frowned at me. Not a good plan. I don't like you being alone. I have my cat with me, I said. If only he knew how much help Jameson really would be. You can stay with me, Kate said. Absolutely not. Poor Kate had suffered enough being my friend already. I shook my head, but didn't say anything. Fine. Be that way, Palmer said. He sounded more frustrated than I'd ever heard him before. A squad car with lights and sirens pulled up and parked diagonally behind Palmer's car. Wheeler and another officer I'd never met rushed out of the car to Palmer's door. Stephen Palmer, I'm placing you under arrest for the murder of your cousin, Daniel Palmer, Wheeler said. Wait, what? He didn't do it, I had proof he didn't. I didn't have proof I could give her. He was poisoned by an invisible man, and I haven't figured out his motive yet wouldn't hold any weight with, well, anyone. You have the right to an. Palmer opened the car door. Are you kidding me, Joel? Process of elimination. You could save us all a lot of time by confessing. Palmer looked back at Kate and me. Be safe. Isabella, use my car. I'll be out in a day or so. Not so fast, we need to search the car. Palmer got out of the car. Her apartment just burned down, and I think she's in danger. At least have someone drive her to her office. I'm going to have to pat them both down before they can leave, Wheeler said. Fine with me. I've got nothing to hide, I said. Kate and I both got out of the car. Wheeler patted us both down while the other detective read Palmer his rights. You two are free to go. Stanton, I don't want to see you for two weeks. You're on medical leave, and if I need to, I'll enforce it. Kate nodded. Papa Tony's! Wheeler called. Papa Tony's turned from the fireman he was talking to, saw Wheeler was the one who called him, and joined us. Stanton needs to go home, and Proctor needs to go to her office. He nodded and said, I'll take care of it. We followed him to another squad car. Once he pulled out of my parking lot, he let some of his anger slip. I can't believe what's going on today. It's like everyone is making the worst possible decisions. What do you mean? I asked. Wheeler's been out for Palmer since lunch. She left for the daycare, saying there had to be a reasonable explanation for someone else to have killed Palmer's cousin, but when she came back, she knew it had to be him. A total about face in just an hour. It sounds like something happened at the daycare. Did she say anything? No, nothing. 
I wondered if Wolf or Stabby had been there. Had they threatened her kid or had they just put that thought in her mind? Can we drive past the daycare? I asked. What for? Papa Tony's asked. I just want to check something out. Okay, but it's closed by now, and I can't get us inside. That's okay, I just need to look. Papa Tony's flicked his lights on and pulled a U-turn in the middle of the road. I was pretty sure the lights were for official, emergency use only, but he was young and trying to show off. But was he showing off for me or Kate? At the daycare, I opened my senses and felt that same oily, evil magic. When Wolf said he was going after my friends, he wasn't kidding. So far, he hadn't bothered my family. Then again, my family had a lot more ways to fight back than my non-magical friends did, Wolf seemed to be the kind of person who only picked on people who couldn't defend themselves. Does the daycare have cameras? I asked. Papa Tony sighed. Yes, they do. Is it possible to get an unofficial look at them? I've got a hunch. Hunch about what? Kate asked. I don't want to say, not until I see if it pans out. You're lucky I know a guy, Papa Tony said. He parked in the lot and made a call. Hey, Brad, it's Luke. I need to call in that favor. We could hear Brad talking, but couldn't understand what he was saying. No, honestly, it's nothing bad. I just need to take a look at the footage for Little Angel's Day Care for today, between noon and one. Unofficial. Brad's voice got louder until Papa Tony's interrupted him. If you can't, I understand. I know you're not all that important over there. That set Brad off, and in a moment Papa Tony said, Great. We'll be right over. Who was that? Kate asked. My buddy Brad. He didn't make it through the police academy, and he's got a chip on his shoulder. He's an okay guy, though, just easy to manipulate. We pulled into the lot of executive security services and saw a man pacing back and forth, smoking a cigarette. That's Brad. We pulled up to him, and Papa Tony's rolled his window down. They shook hands, and Brad said, We're even now, right? You bet. If this pans out, I might even owe you. Brad grinned, then walked off, crushing his cigarette but under his shoe. We drove off, and a block later, Papa Tony's handed me the flash drive Brad had passed to him. Got anything to read this with? he asked. At my office, I said. In my office, I plugged in the flash drive and played the one video it held. The camera was set up to watch people come in and out of the building, while also watching the children playing in the fenced-in playground. The timestamp started at 11.30, so I sped up the playback. We watched for about 10 minutes before I saw Wolf walk up to a man who had been watching the children. The man's face was pointed away from the camera, so I couldn't identify him. There was no way I was going to let anyone non-magical go after Wolf, so I didn't slow the playback down. We saw Wheeler go into the building, then leave 20 minutes later. After she left, the mystery man followed her, and for a moment, I could see his face. Hey, I know that guy, Papa Tony said. What guy? I asked. He pointed to the man who had followed Wheeler. He's the new bartender over at the Rusty Pigeon. The Rusty Pigeon? That sounded like a hideous place. I've never even heard of it. Nah, I'm sure you haven't, it's a cop bar, said Kate. What's his name? I asked. I don't know, Papa Tony said. What's he like? And why would he be following Wheeler? I asked. He didn't really strike me as the kind of guy who would want to be around the police, but you can't arrest a guy for giving off a bad vibe, Papa Tony said. It's a strong bad vibe. 
I wouldn't want to be in a room alone with him, Kate said. Maybe he's got a kid there too? But he probably knows Wheeler, so let's keep watching. We watched the rest of the video, but nothing else notable happened. I guess that was a bust. Thanks for trying, I said. You sure you're okay to stay here? Papa Tony's asked. I nodded. Yeah. Also, my family lives just a few blocks away, and one of them can pick me up later. He didn't look convinced. Drive me home first, and you can always come back to check on her later, Kate said. After they left, Jameson sauntered into my office. I thought they'd never leave. Did you see the fire at the apartment? I asked. Yes. What's our plan? I'm staying here tonight. There's no way I want to bring this kind of problem to Proctor House. Proctor House was one of the first houses built in Portsmouth, and I absolutely would not be responsible for its burning down. Your family isn't going to like that, he warned. I know. In fact, I can't believe they haven't called yet. They didn't call because they were outside, knocking on the door. I let my family in, all six of them, and before they could say anything, I held up my hands to get their attention. Yes, I know my apartment was on fire earlier. Everyone there got out safe. The renovations will take at least three months, during which time I'll need to find somewhere else to live. For now, that place will not be Proctor House. Its historic value is too important. I'll reconsider once the arsonist is caught. My mother separated herself from the others and stood next to me. I agree. But where are you staying tonight? Tonight I'll sleep here. I'll look for a new place tomorrow. My family had nothing to say. What's going on? Can we at least bring you an air mattress and some bedding? Grandma asked. I nodded. Yes, that would be nice. Thea and Delia went out to their car and brought bedding in. How did they know what I'd planned to do? Aunt Nadia started to unload the backpack she was carrying onto the counter next to the cash register. I've made you and Jameson some food to tide you over until tomorrow. Now I was even more suspicious. You're up to something, aren't you? I looked to Delia, who couldn't keep emotions off her face. Spill it. She looked to Aunt Nadia, then Aunt Lily, before she broke down. We were going to use you as bait. If you stayed here, we could guard you and catch whoever came after you tonight. I think I know who's behind all this. A guy named Wolf, another guy named Horatio, but he might be out of magic by now, a tall guy, and a guy who works at the Rusty Pigeon. You've got four different guys going after you? Delia asked. The bartender is the one who killed Palmer's cousin. I really want to know who he is. Got a picture? Delia and I can get his name, Thea said. I smiled. I can show him to you, I've got a video. Chapter 23 Did I get any sleep that night? Not really. Jameson, on the other hand, was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed by the time my family brought breakfast at 7.30 the next morning. Apparently Grandma got enough sleep too, because the first thing she said was, we need to take this fight to them. I'm not waiting around anymore for them to attack Isabella and hoping I can catch them before she gets hurt. My mother and Aunt Nadia were setting out breakfast, and I could hear my mother muttering, I don't know how much more of this I can take. We just need to finish this. I made a strong tea for us, and as Thea poured herself a mug, she said, Delia and I had a blast last night. You had fun at a cop bar? I asked. Delia grinned. No one wanted to answer our questions about that guy. He wasn't working last night either. We finally had to get them to play darts. Every game we won, they had to answer one question. 
You didn't, I said. We'd already bought several rounds, so they weren't as good as they thought they were. We just gave a few darts a nudge in our favor. Okay, so what did you learn? Not as much as I hoped, but his name is Jenkins, and he lives on the edge of town. Also, he's about to get fired from the bar because he's spending all his time trying to get information from the cops that are there. They just want to relax and not have to keep up their guard. Several of them have already complained to the owner. I assembled a burrito egg wrap and took a bite. I wanted to pull him out of his house and force him to confess. Aunt Lily threw away her paper plate. I say we get him before he's ready for us this morning. The general consensus of my family was we needed to go get him right away. Okay. I'm with you. Let me just write a note, because I'm closing the shop today. While I wrote my note, the rest of the family cleaned up. I taped the note to the door and then we went outside and climbed into Thea and Delia's car. We drove by his house a few hours ago, and lights were on already, Delia said. Thea parked three blocks away from the house and then Grandma cast a cloaking spell over the car and everyone in it. No sense giving them advance warning, she said. Jenkins lived on the border of Portsmouth and Newington, adjacent to an industrial park. The drab look of his neighborhood extended to his house, with its missing shingles and a mostly dead yard. When we got out of the car, I had the immediate sense that I wanted to leave. Does anyone else feel that? I can't get out of the car, Delia said. It's a protection spell, Jameson told us. We can move through it, but it won't be pleasant. I stood where I thought the front seat of the car was and reached out. I felt the open door. Delia, give me your hand. I felt her hand on mine and I pulled her out of the car. I felt a little better holding her hand. We should all hold hands, I said. Do you know how hard it is to get seven women to hold hands when they can't see each other? We finally managed the task after a few minutes, I was situated between Delia and Aunt Lily. Jameson, are you okay? Not great, he said faintly. Jump up on someone's shoulders then. That should help. A moment later I felt him land half on my shoulder and half on my head. He adjusted himself and then we were as ready as we could be to go. We walked down the empty street toward the Jenkins house. For the first block, I felt okay, but when we reached the second, I began to feel nauseated. Oh, Aunt Lily said as she raised our clasped hands to her mouth. I could feel her try not to throw up. Can anyone combat this? I asked. Yes, give me a minute, my mother said. I heard her chanting a spell under her breath, but it didn't help. Delia, put your hand on my arm, I said. Now that she wouldn't touch the amulet, I put my hand on it and asked Bridget for help. Better? I asked. Everyone else said no. There's got to be a boundary where this ends. We just need to push past it to get to the house, Aunt Nadia said. We began to walk forward again, and I tried to focus the protective help of Bridget on my family. Finally, feeling drained and sick, we stood in front of the house. There were twelve men standing in a line across the front yard, Wolf, Stabby, Jenkins, the tall guy who had been at the apothecary, and eight others I'd never seen before. Wolf snapped his fingers, and our cloaking spell vanished. I thought it was you, but I didn't think you'd bring so much backup. It doesn't matter, you're outnumbered here. Grandma lifted her head slowly. She looked horrible, but her voice was strong. You've got next to no power left. Still haven't figured out how to reverse the cursed oil? How did she know I gave him cursed oil? And your buddy there, the one in the back. He's completely tapped out. I'm surprised you've kept him around. He's not of any more use to the fraternity. Unless you're keeping him around as a scapegoat. 
Wow. Go, Grandma. The rest of your little group of friends don't have as much power as my granddaughter has in her little pinky. I'd bet on our seven against your twelve any day of the week. The tall guy drew his hand across his chest, then pushed it down. As he did, Grandma fell to the ground. Aunt Esther. Aunt Lily yelled. Delia went down next, then Aunt Lily. Retreat, Grandma whispered. Hide us, my mother yelled, and a dense fog sprung up between us and the men on the lawn. They sounded confused, and those of us still standing helped Grandma, Delia, and Aunt Lily up. We walked as fast as we could, not bothering with cloaking spells. The farther we went, the better we felt, until we reached the now visible car and helped each other in. Thea peeled out of the parking spot and raced out of the neighborhood. By the time we were at Proctor House, we were exhausted but no longer feeling ill. Everyone in the living room. I'm making tea and toast, I said. Aunt Nadia smiled at me gratefully. She didn't have the energy to cook anything right now. When I walked into the living room with a tray laden with tea and toast, my family looked almost normal. We need help, Grandma said. We need Eunice. Eunice. Great. Maybe this time she wouldn't stick me to the ceiling for fun. Chapter 24 I pulled out my phone to text Eunice and saw I already had a message from her. I am waiting for you to let me in at the kitchen door. What? I walked to the kitchen and opened the door. How did you know? She walked past me toward the living room. Every witch on the eastern seaboard felt you using your amulet for all it was worth this morning. We knew you hadn't died, so I just came over here to make sure everything was okay. She took a seat next to Grandma and looked us all over. On the outside you look fine, but on the inside, you got some issues. Who did this to you? A witch named Wolf and his fraternity buddies. He's protecting the witch who killed my friend Detective Palmer's cousin. Eunice laughed. That two-bit thug? He's been making petty little power plays for decades now. I'm amazed he's finally got someone to follow him. She picked up Grandma's mug and gave it a sniff. So what's it going to be, ladies? We going to sit here and drink tea? Or are we going to bring this creep down and get some justice? I was all for justice, but I felt like I could use a serious nap first. Delia yawned and settled back in her chair, closing her eyes. Eunice stood up and began to chant in Latin. Latin! The Proctor family can barely get it together enough to have spells occasionally rhyme in English, and here she was casting a spell in another language. She stopped speaking and clapped her hands eight times, one for each proctor and one for Jameson. At the last clap, we were all sitting up straighter, feeling more energetic and less likely to go back to sleep. Okay, ladies, let's go. Time's wasting, and I've got to weed my side garden this afternoon, Eunice said. There wasn't room to squeeze Eunice into the Kia, so she followed us in her vintage 70s VW Beetle. Once again, we stopped three blocks from the Jenkins house, but this time when we got out, we felt nothing. What was that spell? I asked Eunice. I call it light of fire, for getting your rear end in gear, she said. I peered at her. Did you cast it on yourself? She shook her head. Didn't need to. And do you feel anything now? I'm feeling annoyed by all these questions, girl. Get to the point. A couple hours ago we were hit with a wall of nausea we had to work our way through. It seems to be gone, and I didn't know if it was your spell or if the fraternity has left. Not my spell, Eunice confirmed. This time we should hold hands first, then I'll cast the cloaking spell, Grandma said. We formed a line, holding hands. Isabella and I will each take an end, Eunice said. We may need an extra hand to use our amulets. We walked the three blocks but felt no resistance. 
A crow squawked and we jumped, but nothing stopped us. As we stood in front of the house, Eunice clasped her amulet. There's no one home. I took hold of my amulet and looked for the oily magic wolf exuded. His magical ability was faint, and so was his trail. I tried to illuminate the trail, and it looked like a black, undulating line moving down the road. Eunice and Grandma said yes, but no one else could see it. Back to the cars, we need to catch up to them. Isabella, you drive with me and tell me where to go. Esther will navigate for the other car, Eunice commanded. I wasn't sure putting both amulet holders in one car was the best idea. I looked at Eunice, and she nodded. I hoped that meant she had a plan she didn't want to tell everyone else. We got into the cars, and Eunice and I drove off first. Thank the goddess you didn't make a fuss when I told you to get into my car. We need to talk. Turn left here, I said. She turned left. It's decision time. Do we lead your family to danger or do we take the fraternity on ourselves? We go together, you and I out front. They can stay behind us and help. Tactical support, I see, Eunice said. When had my life gone from selling teas and chatting with customers to considering tactical support? At least I had it when I needed it. We drove for half a mile before I lost the trail. Pull over. Eunice pulled over, and we all got out of our cars. I lost them, I said. Grandma scowled at me. That's because you missed the turn off three blocks back. No, she didn't. It turns right just up there, Eunice said. Don't be a fool, Eunice, Grandma said. Aunt Lily looked at the three of us. What are we talking about? My mother looked into her eyes. Are you feeling okay, Lily? Course I am. I just don't know why we're going for a drive in an industrial park first thing in the morning. This was bad. Thea and Delia turned and started walking away. Stop right there, girls, my mother commanded. We've got work to do, and I don't even remember agreeing to this drive, Thea said. My mother turned back to me and Eunice. I think we ran across a confusion spell. It's hit differently, but we need to reverse it immediately. Everyone together, right in front of me. We all responded to the command in her voice. She wasn't fooling around, and even though I didn't see much of a problem, the fact that she did was enough. I'm not sure I'd have trusted just anyone, but my mother is never wrong when she says something needs to be fixed. Spell, spell, spell be gone. Back to which you belong. Back to the caster, take your disaster, my mother intoned. I blinked and looked around. The trail we had been following was still moving straight down the road. You see it going straight? I asked Grandma. She nodded, and so did Eunice. Okay, let's get back to it. Dial your personal shields up to eleven and call Isabella if anything else starts to go wrong. We drove off, more tense than before, searching for a killer and possibly more traps. My phone rang when we passed the public library. Hey, I've got you on speaker, I said. My mother is asking to be dropped off here. Should we? We're probably never going to find who we're looking for, and they've probably left town. I think we should just go home now, Delia said. I heard my grandmother saying something, and Delia hit the speakerphone button. I'm about to have a mutiny over here. We need to pull over, Grandma said. Eunice sighed and pulled over into an empty lot. Are you sure they're worth bringing with us? Honestly, I had started feeling like it was wasted effort to keep following the trail. It would be easier to confront them if they ever came back to the store. Eunice looked at me. Shoot. It got you too. Once again, we got out of the car. 
This time Grandma and Eunice seemed less affected. You know the drill, ladies, everyone stand in front of us, Eunice said. She bent down and took a handful of dirt. Everyone do what I do. Only Grandma followed her in picking up some dirt. You heard her, pick up some dirt. We all bent down and grabbed a handful of dirt. Now repeat after me. Mother Earth, hear our plea. Soil and mud and earth and dirt, remove the curse that's caused me hurt. It was too much for me to remember. Why did magic seem so hard today? I'm going home to take a nap, I said. I turned to leave the lot, but Grandma grabbed my arm. Okay, let's do this together, shall we? You say what I say. Grandma picked up more dirt and repeated the curse-breaking chant one word at a time. I repeated what she said and felt the energy of Mother Earth flowing back into me. Wow, I said. Go help your cousins, Grandma said as she went to help Aunt Nadia break her curse. I walked Thea and Delia through the chant, one word at a time, and finally we were all back to normal. Honestly, I felt better than normal, as though Mother Earth had given me some extra energy to find the murderer. It was going to take a long time to catch up to them if we didn't hurry up, though. They could be halfway to Boston by now, and if they hit a major city, we might never find them. Eunice pulled me aside. We need to take one car. You're going to have to sit on the floor. We need to focus on protecting everyone while Thea drives, or we're going to lose our chance. I nodded. Everyone in the Kia. We need to get moving, Eunice commanded. We squeezed in and followed the trail. It didn't lead to the highway like I thought it would, but to a residential neighborhood. The trail led to the third house on the left, which had an ugly green fog around it. Were they trying to catch our attention? Do you see that? I asked. The fog? Yes, Aunt Nadia said. It was late morning on a beautiful late summer day, and I expected to see kids outside playing, but there wasn't a single person or pet outside. No birds flew over the neighborhood, and I couldn't even hear crickets chirping. Something was wrong here. Wonder who lives here? My mother asked. Palmer. That's his car in the driveway, I said. He must be next on their hit list of my friends. Okay, what's the plan? Eunice asked. The plan is we turn around, go home, and pretend we never saw any of this, my mother said. I couldn't believe she said that. Mother! Look, Isabella. I know he's your friend and all, but it's too risky. I'm not willing to lose my entire family to keep him out of jail. If we go home, everyone stays alive. She's got a point, Aunt Lily said. I took hold of my amulet. No, she doesn't. If no one wants to come with me, I'll go myself. I struggled to get up off the floor of the very crowded car. Thea tried to keep me from opening the door next to her, but I did and almost fell outside. Delia was mumbling under her breath as she exited the car. Fear is the mind killer was all I caught. Dune? I asked. You can make a spell out of anything, you know. I guess it never occurred to me to use movie quotes. It seemed so modern. Right, let's do this. I said as I grasped her hand. Eunice grasped Delia's other hand and the three of us crossed the street, repeating Delia's spell. Jameson rubbed against my leg, bolstering my courage. We beat back the fog, and I heard car doors closing behind us. I didn't dare look behind me, but after a moment, I felt a hand on my shoulder. We're all here now, Thea said. We stepped forward together, but stopped when the fraternity members left Palmer's house. The tall guy was walking around in circles. He must be the person who cast the confusion spell my mother defeated, and no one had bothered to try and remove it for him. 
Stabby was in the back of the crowd, crouched down. Wolf was out in front, even though he looked weary. How nice you made it through our little spells. You're too exhausted to fight us now, so you might as well turn around and go home. Projecting much? They looked wiped out. Jenkins was next to Wolf, holding a vial of clear liquid. Behind Wolf was a young witch, younger than me, trying to call up more fear. Puffs of green fog rose up around him, but vanished after they moved about two feet away. We took another step forward, onto Palmer's lawn. Once we were on Mother Earth again, I felt a jolt of energy. Mother Earth was watching over us. I kicked off my sandals and felt her power surge through me. Kick off your shoes, I said. My family slid their shoes off. We were strong enough to release hands and circle the fraternity. Wolf turned and looked at each one of us. I could feel the last of his magic waning as he frantically looked for a way out. Thunder crashed in the sky, and he vanished, leaving the rest of the fraternity to fend for themselves. Once they saw their leader had fled, most of them followed suit, leaving only Stabby and Jenkins behind. Stabby screamed to the sky, you said you wouldn't leave me. He had absolutely no magic left. Wolf had no use for him. We tightened up our circle and joined hands again. Jenkins tried to break through and run away, but couldn't. It was his mistake to try to aim his escape efforts at the spot between Eunice and Grandma. When he touched them, Eunice said, Confess. Jenkins bounced off the strength of their grip and fell to the ground. He shook his head and started to speak. I had to do it. He covered his mouth with his hands, but that didn't keep him from continuing. Dan was going to turn us all in. Wolf said I'd move up in the fraternity if I got rid of Dan, so I did. Now he's left me here. Dan wasn't a witch, was he? What did he have to do with the fraternity? Jenkins looked at me like I was an idiot. We don't use witches to kill people. Not unless we have to. Jenkins was the second which I knew to commit murder, the first being Brent Thompson. Not unless they're expendable, you mean. I am not expendable, he spat out. Eunice laughed. Look at you, son. You've been abandoned, you're trapped in this circle, and the police are coming any minute now. And they were, too. I could hear sirens in the distance. I called before I left the car, Eunice explained. And what about you? she asked Stabby. He held up his hands. I don't want any trouble. Her hex oil stole my power, and I'm helpless now. Just let me die. I had a moment of guilt. It had been my oil that completely used up his powers. Now he was a man with nothing. If I'd lost my magic, I'd probably want to die too. But I'd never use my magic to harm someone, so I would never have to face that consequence. My heart hardened as I remembered the glee in his eyes when he attacked me in the apothecary. The police will have a lot to say about your future, and I'll make sure they put you on suicide watch, I said. Three cars and a van pulled up to the house, and we were instantly surrounded by police yelling for us all to put our hands up. We did as they asked, and Wheeler stepped up to me. You. Didn't I question you in a different murder? She asked. Yes. You were the first detective at the murder of my mentor, Trina Bassett, before you had your baby. Congratulations, by the way. Wheeler frowned. I guess she was all business right now. And you were at the biscuit when Palmer's cousin died weren't you? This wasn't looking so good for me. I was. Anyone dead here? I shook my head. Not that I know of. An officer picked up the vial of poison, put it in an evidence bag, and brought it to Wheeler. She looked at it but said nothing. The label read tropomyosin. 
Behind Wheeler I could see officers handcuffing everyone on the lawn. If you could just be gentle with my grandma and her friend Eunice. Hey, Rodriguez. Put the old ladies in the back of a car, no cuffs, she yelled. Thank you. Now that the haze of fear had dissipated from Palmer's house, people were stepping out of the neighboring homes and watching us. Great, now I look like a criminal. This won't be good for business. I pointed to Jenkins. He's the one that poisoned Palmer's cousin. And how do you know that? Wheeler asked. He told me. And he was holding that vial when we got here. I'm sure if you talk to him, he'll confess. Wheeler snorted. You've been watching way too much TV. No one confesses these days. Turn around. I turned, knowing what was coming next. Isabella Proctor, you're under arrest for impeding a police investigation. She continued to read me my rights, but I wasn't paying attention. Everyone else I came with were also being arrested. There was no way she was going to be able to make this stick. When Palmer arrested me a few months ago, I was terrified that my mother would find out. Now that she was being arrested alongside me, I knew she wouldn't say anything about any future trouble I might get into. Jenkins and Stabby were loaded into another car, and the rest of us were put into the van. Wheeler had come prepared, arrest them all and then sort it out seemed to be her plan. On the drive to the police station, my mother gave us instructions. Lily, you speak to Ray. Everyone else, say nothing except that you want a lawyer. I'll call ours, and he'll represent us all. Save your calls in case we need to contact anyone else. Hold tight and we'll be out in a few hours. How are you so level-headed? I asked her. Aunt Nadia laughed. This isn't her first go-around with being arrested. What? Are you kidding me? What did you do? I asked. We can talk about that later, my mother said. Don't think we'll forget, Aunt Michelle, Delia said. We were escorted into central booking, where Aunt Lily insisted on her phone call. Three minutes later, Chief Dobbins strolled in, looking as calm as he could. Wheeler, could I see you in my office? he said. Just hold off on processing these women, he told the desk sergeant. Is it all right if my aunt sits? Aunt Nadia asked. The sergeant looked around. There weren't any chairs. Ah, uh, yeah. Follow me. We followed him to the conference room where I had erased Palmer's memory of the Proctor women using magic. I hated that I had to mess with his mind and hoped I'd never have to do it again. The door will be guarded, so no funny business, the sergeant warned. Just sit quietly, my mother cautioned. We'll be out of this soon. I leaned back in my chair and closed my eyes. It was getting close to lunchtime, and I was starving and utterly spent. I took two deep breaths and allowed myself to relax. The next thing I knew, the chief was in the doorway, clearing his throat. I opened my eyes and knew we were going to be okay. He looked sheepish as he began speaking. On behalf of the Portsmouth Police Department, I'd like to apologize to you all for the behavior of one of my detectives. You are all free to go, with my personal thank you for finding the murderer of Dan Palmer. I guess Wheeler was wrong, it didn't take Jenkins long to confess after all. Then again, Eunice's spell had compelled him to. My family began to file out, and Aunt Lily stopped and gave the chief a small kiss on the cheek. Thank you, Ray. Chapter 25 Thea and Delia insisted they'd help me get ready for my big date. That's exactly what they said, too. Big date. You'd think I'd never been out with a guy before. My last date was pretty horrible, but still, there wasn't any reason to make such a production out of choosing a dress. 
What was worse was that I had no clothes of my own to choose from. I hadn't been back to my apartment, and I wasn't even sure anything was salvageable from the smoke and water damage. This could be the most important date of your life, Thea said. Thea, serious, thoughtful, not pronto hyperbole Thea, was talking like we were going to ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after. I did a pirouette in the green floral dress I just pulled over my head. Honestly, if I can spend a few hours with him where he doesn't accuse me of a crime, that'll be good enough for me. Delia made a face. Ugh, not with your complexion. Take it off. Thea was looking through Delia's closet. She pulled out the one dress I was hoping no one would remember. It was a red and white floral mini dress with floaty tears that Abby had insisted I buy last summer. The tags were still attached because I'd thought about returning it, but instead I gave it to Delia. It was too much, spaghetti straps, flowers, a v-neck that was deeper than anything I usually wore. How about this? I dutifully pulled it on, hoping I'd inexplicably gained weight over the past year, and the dress would no longer fit. As it slid into place, I realized I had no such luck. It fit perfectly. Isabella, my mother called up the stairs. You have a visitor. A shot of adrenaline went through my system. How do I look? Perfect, Thea said. Let me just cut the tags off. If he has half a brain he'll fall in love with you the moment he sees you. I slipped on my white strappy sandals and headed downstairs. He's in the living room, Aunt Nadia whispered in the hallway. Before I turned the corner to the living room, I took a deep breath. What was the worst that could happen? He could arrest me, but that wasn't likely. We could decide we didn't like each other at all. I could spill wine all over him. I could. There you are, my mother said as she dragged me toward the waiting Palmer. I smacked her hand off my arm and smiled up at my date. My incredibly handsome date. Oh, goddess, did he look good. Blue checked Oxford shirt with the sleeves rolled up, navy chinos, Chelsea boots. I realized I was staring. Hi, I said, like an idiot. I'm usually much better at talking to people. Hi yourself, he said as he smiled at me. You look amazing. Thank you. You too. You too? Nothing like advertising the fact that I'd been on only a handful of dates in my entire life. Are you ready to go? He asked. Yes. Quickly, before everyone gets here and wants to ask a million questions. I let him out the front door and gave a little sigh of relief that my family had actually left us alone. I turned back to the house and saw Thea and Delia waving from my bedroom. Palmer offered me his arm as we walked down the steps to the front gate. What's the plan for tonight? I asked. The usual first date. Dinner and a show at Prescott Park. Sounds great. Lead on. We'd made it to the sidewalk, and so far, I hadn't tripped or embarrassed myself. How do you feel about walking? The park isn't too far, but I never know how women's shoes work. I laughed. You don't know how women's shoes work? Roughly the same as men's. I mean if they're okay to walk in or not. We can drive if you'd rather. It wasn't even a half mile away, and my shoes were fine to walk in. Let's walk. He smiled. I've just got to get dinner from my car. He jogged up the driveway to his car and pulled out a large picnic basket and blanket. He offered me his arm again, and we started to walk what's for dinner? I asked. Secret family recipe, was all he said. At the park, we chose a spot in front of the stage that was still shaded from the late day sun. He spread out the blanket and we sat. I spent more time staring at him, wondering how he got his hair to be so straight for work, 
but to curl for a date. I liked the curl. He cleared his throat. Lemonade or water? he asked. Lemonade, please. I wasn't sure what you liked, so I thought I couldn't go wrong with water. But then I thought what if you didn't like water, so I've got lemonade. He was speaking very quickly, was he as nervous as I was? Lemonade is fine. He reached into the basket, and I tried to peek inside, but he didn't let me. He pulled out two glasses and a large thermos. After he poured our drinks, he reached into the basket again and pulled out two halves of a strawberry and put one in each glass. Thank you, I said. I took a sip and was surprised. Fresh squeezed? He nodded. Are you ready for the first course? I set my glass down. Absolutely. I hadn't eaten lunch because I was busy fending off my cousin's attempts to spend hours on my hair and makeup. I was glad I went with a more natural look rather than the heavy makeup look Delia wanted. From the basket he withdrew two plates, two forks, and a covered bowl. Spinach, strawberry, and feta salad. That sounds delicious. He served me some and watched as I took a bite. Yup. Delicious. Did you make this yourself? He smiled. Yes. I had no idea you could cook. Now I'm embarrassed at what a big deal I made of making you tomato soup and grilled cheese. He laughed. You shouldn't be. I never told you, but it was nice to have someone make me dinner, not like in a restaurant, but making me dinner because they wanted to. I took another bite of salad and a sip of lemonade. Clearly I'm going to have to step up my game if I want to keep up with you. The stage lights went on, and we settled in to watch the comedy of errors. At some point he refilled my plate with a tomato and pesto tart and then a blueberry galette. I held my questions until intermission. Where did you get that tart? I made it this morning, he said. I stared at him, trying to see if he was lying. It doesn't suit my tough guy detective persona, but I stress bake. I grinned. Your secret is safe with me, as long as you cook for me once in a while. Gladly. The breeze shifted, and I shivered. I probably should have brought a sweater. He moved closer to me and put his arm around my shoulder. Lean on me a little and get comfortable. We watched the second half of the play like that and our initial nervousness seemed to have faded away. By the time the two Dromeos walked off the stage together at the end of Act 5, I was about as comfortable as I could be. I folded our blanket and Palmer packed up the last of our dinner. I've got a confession to make, he said. Isn't it usually the other way around? People confess to you? The night we met, when I saw you walking home late at night? I knew who you were. You did? Yes. I had your picture. And I was sure you'd killed Trina. I knew all I had to do was talk to you for a bit, and I could close the case. I didn't immediately respond. I wasn't happy he deceived me, but would I have done any different in his shoes? I didn't think so. As you now know, it's no fun having someone assume you're a criminal when you aren't. I hope your experience with Wheeler taught you that. He put the basket down and took a step toward me. Isabella. I know. That's why I had to tell you. And why I have to apologize for my behavior that night. And for the time you tried to arrest me? And for that time too. But to be fair, you looked really guilty that time. I hit him playfully with the blanket. You take that back. You know better. He pulled me toward him. Yes, I do. His warm brown eyes were staring into mine, and I felt like I could fall into his arms and never leave. And then a car alarm went off, making me jump and killing our moment. 
Palmer picked up the basket and put the blanket in it. Feet still good to walk home? Absolutely. We walked out of the park, hand in hand. I've never known a guy to be so considerate of my feet or shoes before. He turned away. Oh. My ex-wife trained me well, I guess. She's a small woman and always wore the highest heels she could find, no matter how they made her feet feel. I had to be careful about where I asked her to walk, because her vanity wouldn't let her wear comfortable shoes. I see. I looked up at him. He was at least a head taller than me, but I didn't mind so much, and I certainly wasn't going to change what I wore to be taller. I'm more of a sneaker and sandal kind of woman, so you don't have to worry about me. That's one of the things I like about you. You're easy. I beg your pardon? He looked confused for a moment. Oh, no. That's not what I meant. I meant you're easy to be around. You're easy to talk to. I giggled. I knew what you meant. We arrived at my front door faster than I'd wanted to. Thank you for a lovely evening and for the delicious food. I won't be able to cook for you again until I get back into my apartment, but I definitely will. And I'll get Aunt Nadia to teach me some fancy recipes. He smiled. I'm looking forward to that. He bent down and was about to kiss me when the door opened. Grandma stood in the open door wearing her oldest, rattiest bathrobe and her hair in curlers. She was a witch, if she wanted curly hair, she certainly didn't have to sleep in curlers. Palmer jumped back from me and looked at Grandma. Good evening, Mrs. Proctor. It's a late evening, Detective Palmer. Thank you for seeing my granddaughter home safely. Good night. I scowled at Grandma. She grabbed my hand, yanked me in the house and slammed the door shut. As if to make a point, she even locked the door with a loud clunk. What are you doing? I whispered. He was about to kiss me. I know. I was watching. You don't kiss on the first date. Sure, maybe when you were dating. She peeked out the window. He's driving off, so the moment is gone. Try not to giggle all night with your cousins, some of us need to get some sleep. She walked off, taking the curlers out of her hair, leaving me alone in the entryway. I kicked off my shoes and walked upstairs, thinking about a silencing spell. I had a lot to talk about with my cousins. The End This has been Romaine Calm. An Isabella Proctor Cozy Paranormal Mystery. Book 3 Copyright 2021 by Lisa Bouchard. Production copyright by Lisa Bouchard.